officers and all of such high quality that the team, you can see really from the program in front of you, it was very difficult to say no to people because the level of entries from all of you was so exceptionally high, dedicated to the tagline, serving citizens through better data visualization. And what about you, the audience? Where do you come from? Well, again, the statistics have shown that about two-thirds of you are from the public sector or working within the governmental organizations, and then one-third of you are from private sector or academia organizations. So welcome to you all, and hopefully there'll be great interplay between both public, private, academic uh, sections, and you'll meet new friends here today. What can you expect from today? Hopefully you'll learn about the latest trends, all sorts of new and novel ways to think about how to use enormous amounts of data, both open data and data sourced in other ways. Definitely visit the posters outside, talk to the people there in the exhibitions, and hopefully you leave this evening feeling not tired, but thoroughly inspired with new friends to boot. We actively encourage you to use Twitter, the hashtag, it, it will come up through, uh, here, here it is, just by magic, it's EU, EU DataViz, hashtag EU DataViz, so obviously phones on silent, but, but use Twitter or other social media as you will. If you downloaded the app for the event, that's also a fantastic resource, make the best use of the people, some people are just flying in this morning, if you want to organize a meeting whilst they're here, please do so, you can do so using that app which you can just download to your phone as well. The program for today, as you've probably noted, we're starting with all of the keynote plenary talks in here and we'll end in here as well. And later this morning, early afternoon, we'll have five parallel sessions going on in various rooms around this wonderful uh, conference hall. So we've got all sorts of various rooms and I can tell you because I've walked through all of them, they're all exceptionally comfortable to sit in. And interestingly enough, for me, this is the only room where everybody faces forward. The others are like gladiatorial rings where the speaker stands in the middle. So you have, you have fantastic rooms to enjoy through the course of the afternoon as well. It really is a great conference center to enjoy. Um, we'll have more just housekeeping rules a touch later when it comes to lunchtime, just because there's so many people here. We invite those upstairs to remain there for lunch and those downstairs to remain here for lunch just to due to capacity issues. We've also got a team, you can see a couple here at the side, who are going to visually record the whole day. And so at the end of the day, we're going to see their magical work. Uh, and it will be on display probably in this room at the end of the day. So through the course of all of the sessions, they're going to draw their magic visually representing what you are going to talk about through the course of the day. So let's get started. Please let me invite to the stage Rudolf Stromayer, the Director General of the Publications Office of the European Union. this opportunity, pioneering new ways for the society to utilize their data. As data flows in, a new kind of skill is rising up to bridge the gap between complex information and... It's not, it's not working? Now it is. Okay. okay. I apologize. <laughs> so to bridge the gap between complex information and the human insight and understanding needed to harness it. The visualization of data. This is true especially for the public sector, which holds and publishes for reuse huge amounts of data. Data visualization is not new. It's done since decades, but now we have incredibly powerful tools so that everyone can create data visualizations. 
We need to make full use of this development. But the main question is, how do we get there? It proved to be difficult to embrace data visualization in organizations because it bridges technology, communication, and design. The combination of different domains makes it so complex and demanding. Currently, data scientists will give you the raw material to be data-driven. Data visualization professionals will provide the vision of the data. They make critical information useful to those who need it most. Because not everybody understands data in its raw form or has the time or skills to dig into it. The very term data visualization sounds like an output like data in a visual form, when in fact the most defining aspect is actually a process and mindset. Data visualization doesn't just give insights into the data. It also provides ways for organizations to discuss the usage of data, its potential and validity. So first, we, as public administration, need to change our mindset towards data and data visualization. Everyone can benefit when the public sector changes its, its mindset because then citizens, companies, and journalists can make better reuse of the public data assets and understand policies better. Secondly, if the public sector would like to enable others to use the full potential of its data, then data needs to be available in a structured and clean format. It may look that data visualization happens after the, let's say, real world of creating, cleaning and analyzing the data sets is done. But in fact, it starts with a structured collection of data at the very beginning of the data life cycle. This is where the public sector needs to adapt its working procedures. Thirdly, it very quickly became clear that data visualization plays an essential role in political communication. In fact, it goes way beyond communication. It is a method to identify, analyze, and develop policies. Finally, I believe that thoughtful data visualization is not only a crucial tool to explore and explain vast amounts of data, but also an inward-looking tool for us to understand the value of existing data treasures inside the EU institutions and to make full use of it. The Publications Office of the European Union recognizes the enormous potential of data visualization today when publishing is shifting from one-size-fits-all documents to user-tailored experiences and applications. The Office has been at the forefront in publishing public sector information and open data and is now going a step further to publish data visualizations for the EU institutions, ranging from infographics, interactive websites, mobile apps to virtual reality. The European Commission is developing initiatives, best practices and tools, and invests in building data visualization capacities to enhance public services for the society. This is a long-term endeavor, and we would like to speed up this process not only in the e institutions, but in the European public service. And this is the reason why we organize the EU Database 2019 conference and have chosen the motto, serving citizens through better data visualization. We are counting on you, the experts in the field, to help us foster a culture in the public sector that embraces data visualization as a tool to create insights of the vast amount of data we, as public service, produce and hold. We are ready to learn and get inspired from you as the leading data visualization experts coming from all over the world 
and I hope that we can combine our efforts in serving EU citizens better. Therefore, I would like to thank all our partners and the ESA 2 program of the European Commission for helping to make this conference possible. I would also like to thank the government of Luxembourg, our host country, for putting data that high on their political agenda and using data for the positive transformation of society. I hope that our EU Data with 2019 conference will contribute to this transformation by being a platform for exchange of knowledge and ideas between experts and practitioners from the public sector, private sector and academia. So thank you very much for joining us and enjoy the day. Thank you so much, Mr. Stromeyer, and to follow on exactly what you said about the government, we warmly welcome Minister Mark Hansen here representing the government of Luxembourg, amongst many other roles, because the ministers in the government of Luxembourg always have at least five different hats on. He is the Minister Delegate for Digitalization for the government of the Grand Duchy of Luxembourg. And before his work in politics, he also had a vast career in startups and in journalism, so I'm quite sure you know a lot about data and how it should be visualized and spoken about. Mark Hansen. Dear Mr. Uh, Strohmeyer, dear guests, uh, first of all, uh, I want to welcome here in Luxembourg everyone. Luxembourg is a very beautiful country, and even if your program today is really packed, I invite you to come back and to discover Luxembourg. Uh, for another occasion. Uh, second uh, remark, as it was mentioned during the introduction, um, the members of the Luxembourgish governments have many hats and the government in Luxembourg is responsible for everything, but I'm not responsible for the bad weather. <laughs> so I apologize for that one, but I'm not in charge of uh, this topic. So Luxembourg is in fact proud to be a founding member of the European Union and from the outset a host of multiple European institutions, offices and agencies. So over the past 50 years, the excellent collaboration between the Publications Office and Luxembourg has contributed to consolidate the important position the office holds within the European Union's institutional architecture. I am confident that this constructive collaboration will persist for many more years. We are already off to a good start, given that the Publications Office will move soon into its new and modern premises, which are equipped with all the necessary facilities. During the past 50 years, the Publications Office successfully adapted to new technological developments. As a result, it not only allows the office to continue fulfilling its mandate, but also contributes to European democracy by bringing citizens closer to the relevant public actors, be it at European, national or subnational level. The theme of today's conference sums up two topics that are at the heart of the new Ministry for Digitalization's action, citizens and data. As a matter of fact, the ultimate goal of the Ministry in Luxembourg is to make life easier for our citizens by setting up a transversal and coordinated digital transformation policy. Apart from its political and economic stability and its geographic location in the heart of Europe, Luxembourg boasts many other trump cards. Our investments in a national infrastructure are indeed bearing fruit. We can take pride in a highly functional fiber optic network connected to major European capitals and we possess the highest per capita critical mass of data centers worldwide. Our international and multilingual workforce, our secure cloud services, our data centers offering tier one to tier four client certification and our data management specialists are other features of attractiveness. However, being digital and therefore dependent on ICD, ICT also creates significant challenges. 
One of them is the question of securing all the data that could become vulnerable in the case of, for instance, a cyber attack. Luxembourg is well aware of this challenge and uses all possible means to provide reliable security and advanced infrastructure to transform Luxembourg into a secure data hub. This commitment has led Luxembourg to take a front-running step as IT hub with the announcement of the first data embassy in Luxembourg. Estonia, instance, trusts Luxembourg as a secure data hub by storing its valuable, sensitive government information in our data centers. This data embassy might be the first of many more and is proof of our will to transform our country into an international and innovative digital hub. I am pleased to say that Luxembourg is well positioned to support the publications office to fully seize the opportunities of digitalization thanks to our open, inclusive and dynamic ecosystem that brings together private and public sectors. The presence of international well-known ICT players and startups, as well as public actors such as the University of Luxembourg, the European Commission's DG Digit and Connect, as well as the joint undertaking European High Performance Computing, creates a rich environment which stands ready to tackle the challenges of digitalization in order to fully benefit from its opportunities. In the future, Luxembourg endeavors to further consolidate our digital pole, which has become one of this country's poles of excellence beside the legal, financial or research poles. By continuously enhancing our ecosystem, this consolidation will add even more potential synergies in the areas of cybersecurity, artificial intelligence, cloud solutions, as well as high performance and quantum computing. According to the latest benchmark published by the European Data Portal, Luxembourg finds itself also among the cluster of states ranked as fast trackers in open data. The country ranks sixth among the EU 28 with a maturity level of 76% compared to the European average of 65%. The experts did not only highlight the quality, the functional aspects and the usage rates of the Luxembourg National Portal, but also the organizational and strategic arrangements put in place for open data at a national level. The benchmark highlights also the challenges that remain in improving the automatic collection and aggregation of decentralized data stores, as well as the currency and reliability of the available data. In order to reinforce its, its position in this field, as well as its data-driven economy, the Government Council adopted the National Interoperability Framework, NIF, last March, guiding public sector organisms and on how to attain a higher level of digital interoperability through the promotion of open data, open source software and open standards. This digital transformation into a modern and efficient administration also needs to place the user with his needs, expectations and requirements at the center of its concerns. That is why open innovation will be actively promoted by the Ministry for Digitalization. The government's endorsement of the NIF marks the starting point of the long-term implementation of interoperability across all government administrations. The expected benefits are efficiency and effectiveness gains, cost reductions and time gains in service development, superior service quality, notably via standardization, reuse and mutualization of services and more, transparency and openness for the end users but also for those in charge of service delivery. Providing more user-friendly, innovative and efficient e-government services is another main target for the new Ministry for Digitalization. In order to achieve this, we rely, we rely on three key principles, namely digital by default, once only and transparency. Building on these principles, the portal 
Guichet.lu is the single contact point for all interactions between the public, companies and administrations in Luxembourg. A secure e-space, myguichet.lu, offers secure online procedures and access to personal data, such as the national registry, residence certificate and much more so on. The once only principle, for instance, requires that the state has to ask its citizens and companies for their information only once and can reuse it thereafter on the condition, of course, that the citizens or company has explicitly consented to it. To achieve it, this goal, we must link our systems and, of course, guarantee absolute data security. Another crucial element is transparency. While we are making efforts to speed up administrative procedures, companies need to stay updated on the status of their procedure and when they should expect a response. This is not only a feature demanded by the citizens, but also vitally important for a company and we want to provide this level of transparency. Evidently, transparency and data interoperability are major challenges and the government recognized the potential of blockchain to, blockchain to solve these issues at a very early stage. Therefore, it was with great pleasure that I announced at the Infrachain Summit in March the inception of a public sector blockchain. This pioneering blockchain project will enable the government to experiment with and develop a range of new blockchain applications reserved for the public sector as well as novel applications involving public-private sector interactions. With this public sector blockchain, Luxembourg showed once again is its ability to recognize innovative solutions building on new technologies, which is a major key to a successful digital transition. We are already in a good position to make use of artificial intelligence through our efforts in e-government and multilingual content. This groundwork combined with AI will allow us to offer personalized digital services with universal accessibility and 24-7 availability. For example, the government IT center is already testing intelligent chatbots that can interact with users and guide them to find relevant information. AI is also used at the Agriculture Ministry to automatically identify from satellite images types of fields and crops to efficiently monitor farming subsidies compliance. In conjunction with this first AI experience, the government recently presented its strategic vision for the development of a human-centered AI in Luxembourg. This coordinated and collaborative vision integrates all of Luxembourg's economic sectors to improve the lives of all citizens. This also applies to the development of AI for digital government and we recently announced a program to kickstart the use and experimentation with AI technology across government agencies. The effective collection, management and exchange of government data also enables us to develop advanced data analytics and visualization services. I want to name here just a few initiatives that are leading examples. Today, our national geo portal and spatial data infrastructure enables the integration, visualization, and analysis of hundreds of geodata layers, ranging from mapping data over infrastructure and planning data through the environmental real-time data, among many more. We are also one of the first countries in the world who will have a complete high-resolution 3D map which will be online in the next months, offered as open data for anyone to create new 3D apps and visualizations. Our investments in open and interoperable data sets contribute also to other services like the recently launched multimodal mobility application by the Verkehrsverbund. Verkehrsverbund is a Luxembourgish word, the Verkehrsverbund being a public agency which aims to provide public transport passengers with a comfortable experience and to encourage active and sustainable mobility. So this app, available now, integrates and visualizes many data sets relevant to car, bike and public transport routing. The government's digital objectives are manifold and ambitious. 
our approach is wide ranging in the sense that it does not only cover strategic adoption, but it also includes the development of our citizens and companies' digital proficiency, the development of infrastructures and ecosystems, as well as setting up efficient policies to guarantee a sustainable and innovative development of Luxembourg. This said, I wish you a very fruitful, fruitful conference and hope to see you not only today in Luxembourg, Hope to see you again during the next days and years and also have a correct and fruitful collaboration in this very interesting field. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Minister Hansen, and also thank you very much to the Government of Luxembourg for hosting us in this conference centre today, and we're taking up quite a large proportion of it. Now, we're going to start with our keynote speeches from the DataViz experts. First up is Victoria Buck from the Technology Stiftung in Berlin. For all of the next talks, in fact, for the rest of the day, we're going to have the talk, and then we'll have time for questions and answers afterwards. If you could keep your your hand raised, then the, the, the people running around with the microphones will know where to find you and we'll do our best to have as many questions as time will allow. Victoria leads the Open Data Informationsstelle, a cooperation between the Technology Foundation in Berlin and the Berlin city government. Victoria says that she likes DataViz because it's a way to democratize data, making it accessible for those who aren't in a position to work with raw data. She wants to see more governments create their own data viz to make their policies, processes and services more transparent to citizens and to communicate them in a way that doesn't require excess jargon. Thank you, Victoria. Thank you so much. Um, so I'm here today, let's see if the clicker is working. Uh, I don't think quite. So I'm gonna rely on the computer instead. Um, but so, thank you very much for the invitation to be here. Good morning to everyone. My name is Victoria Buck. Um, I'm from the Technologie Stiftung Berlin, and I'm here to talk then today about the links between open data and data visualization, and how the two are intertwined and can be used to strengthen each other. As a little context first to who I am, where I'm coming from. So the, uh, or so I come from the ideation and prototyping lab at the Technology Foundation. We have sort of this broad goal and interest in exploring how can we use technologies, especially open technologies, to create a better experience living in the city for everyone. So to improve experiences for citizens, but also for the government. One of the main ways that we do this is through promoting open data in Berlin. So I, as mentioned, I'm part of the Open Data Informationsstelle, which effectively translates to Open Data Info Point. And through this initiative, we offer support to the Berlin City Administration with their open data publishing activities. And in our work through this effort, we uh, have found that data visualization is an extremely valuable tool for us in trying to promote more open data publishing and better communicate what the value and usage of open data really is. To that end, this was the question then that I came to this talk with today is, how can we use data visualization to help us advance open data publishing? And I've identified so three main areas where I think that data visualization plays an extremely important role in promoting more open data publishing. To start with, through using data visualization, we can enhance the accessibility of data for both citizens and for government employees. One of these classic issues that we found that we have with open data today is the fact that a lot of people simply aren't in a position to work with raw data. Data literacy is generally quite low among uh, populations, which is okay. It just means that not everybody can take a raw data set and immediately understand what's contained within this data? What is it telling me? What are the insights and conclusions that I can draw from it? And this data visualization is a way that we can help people get those insights, get that understanding out of that data without ever actually forcing them to have to work with the raw data and to get those conclusions themselves. So I wanted to bring here an example from a project that we did here uh, at the Technologie Stiftung. This is a visualization from my uh, co-worker, Sebastian Meyer, who's also here leading a workshop later. And so the context of this visualization is that 
Within the city of Berlin, the different government departments have a certain amount of money allocated to them each year, where they have the option to give that money out to individual projects in the form of one-time grants of money. The types of projects that are funded vary hugely because they just have this general goal. It has to have something to do with the interests of the city of Berlin, but that can obviously be very broadly defined. And so the amounts of money that are given out range from 100 euros so that a social organization can throw a Christmas party to hundreds of millions of euros so the public transit company in Berlin can work on building a new subway line, for example. And so the department that's responsible for this data came to us and asked us if we could create a visualization or really a data explorer tool based on this data to make it easier for citizens, but as well as the government employees themselves, to explore this data and understand what trends can we find within it, what does this data actually tell us. Because the existing workflow in this government department that had this data was when they themselves wanted some form of analysis or insight from the data, they would then send that off to the statistics department in Berlin with a request for the analysis that they wanted. Then that analysis would be sent back to them with the conclusions. And the reason for that was a lot of the government employees themselves weren't able to work with this raw data. So for example, what you see with this visualization, we have a, a bar chart where you can see in the uh, uh, darker colored bars, the amount of money being given out per year, and the lighter colored bars, the amount of projects being funded per year, and then on the right side, uh, a spatial visualization of these projects, so projects uh, according to the postal code that they're settled in, how much money or how many projects are being funded in each postal code, and the entire thing is responsive and interactive, so you can combine different years, and the uh, charts will update themselves automatically, and it's a way then to understand and where is this money actually going? How is this being used? I'll skip over these. These are just in case the video didn't work. Um, another aspect of this visualization is that it's also possible to see on the level of individual government departments, again, how much money is being uh, given out per year by this department through this grants program, as well as how many projects, uh, individual projects, are being funded. And then on the right side, there's additionally thematic areas through, uh, by which you can explore this data set. So if you're interested in knowing how many projects were funded in the area of education, for example, or anti-discrimination, again, you can explore this data through this visualization and get an understanding of what's actually in this data set. So through this tool that we developed, it's then possible for people to understand to do their own analyses, if essentially, without ever actually having to touch the raw data. And here we can see then that data visualization plays a crucial role in making this open data more accessible to a broader audience. So now everybody's in a position to use it and to understand what the data is saying. Another way that data visualization can help us in the realm of open data is that it can help us highlight the value that's in data portals that isn't always apparent to outsiders. The problem here is that open data portals in general can be a little overwhelming the first time you view, view one because there's potentially lots of data sets and lots of categories and it can be hard to understand what's actually in this data set, what's actually in this portal that's interesting to me. And another problem that we sometimes have with data portals is they're of course populated by government employees, the people that are actually producing this data, uh, but then government employees often have their own language and their own way that they understand their data data and the subjects that they work on, and that's not always intelligible to outsiders. They don't always use a vocabulary or a language to describe their data that would resonate with people that don't work in government. And so then data visualization can be a way for us to cut through that and make it clear, this is what this, what's inside this portal, this is the data you'll find here, this is what you can do with it. An example that I have on this uh, from our work is, this is actually a work in progress, so we still don't have a, a complete product, uh, but this is a screenshot from an open data portal in Berlin that has health data as well as like social welfare related data. Uh, you can see it's not the most aesthetically pleasing portal. Uh, it looks very early 2000s. Uh, and additionally, it's just kind of visually stark. Uh, when you look at it, you just see a lot of text, and if you could read the text, even if you 
could read German, you probably still would have no idea what's actually in this data set because the language that's being used to describe it is a very heavy, very government language that not everybody speaks. And so the government department that is responsible for this data approached us and asked, can you help us? We know we have a lot of interesting data here, but people don't seem to realize that they aren't using this data. We think that there's more that could be done here. And so we worked with them to create uh, a visualization project based on this data. So the topic is uh, welfare transfers for people who don't earn enough money to cover their own living costs. So in German, this is called Grundsicherung. And so we've done a website where we have a few different visualizations where you can see, for example, how the percentage of people receiving these social transfers varies across uh, different parts of the city. So you can see where the highest concentrations of people that are receiving these payments, which could then be used, for example, for governments to better decide where certain services maybe need to be targeted. So we see there's a higher percentage of people that uh, need these social payments. Maybe that's also an indication that we need more offices on the ground here, or more workers on the ground assisting these people. Uh, the website also includes an analysis of historical developments and the number of people receiving these welfare payments because this was also a concern expressed to us from the government department in question that a lot of people don't actually realize that the percentage of people in Berlin receiving these welfare payments is steadily increasing. And the this government department, they were concerned that this isn't something people are talking about. It's not something they're aware of. Uh, and again, that's partly because with the raw data itself, it's not immediately apparent what's actually happening behind the scenes. So through this project, we were able to uh, take data that we, is actually quite valuable, from which you can draw a lot of interesting conclusions, from which you can start a lot of important conversations in the city, and we visualized it to help kickstart that process. Also then with the goal of redirecting people back to this portal and saying, look through, there's more data like this, there's more ways to explore this data, this is just the first step. The last way that we found that data visualization can play an important role in promoting open data publishing is through helping uh, public sector officials better appreciate the value of open data publishing. The problem that we sometimes see is that for a lot of government officials, open data publishing can feel like a very invisible kind of thankless task. Because okay, you put your data available in a portal somewhere, and what happens to it? It's not like you get a notification every time someone clicks on it or every time someone uses your data for a project. So for a lot of government officials, there's sort of this disconnect of, okay, I did this, but to what end? Why did I do this? What happened after I put this data out there? So data visualization can be a way to uh, bridge that gap and to help make it clear to government officials, this is why you're doing this. This is the value of putting open data out there. We had a project at the Technologie Stiftung a few years ago that really highlighted this well. And in this situation, it was actually the case that a government department in Berlin purchased data on access to high-speed internet in Berlin, which is a huge topic in Berlin because our internet uh, is quite terrible. It sounds like things might be going better in Luxembourg. Um, and they purchased this data and asked the Technologie Stiftung if we would do some sort of visualization project on it. So at this time, the data was not open data. And so we did uh, some visualizations. For example, it was possible to see on the level of the different uh, boroughs in Berlin, how has the access to high-speed internet changed over over the years so that you could, for example, see that, okay, the access is improving, although you could also see uh, around s seven or eight years ago that access was much lower in the former east. Also included visualizations that made it possible to see on a more granular level how access to high-speed internet varies across the city, uh, so you can better identify the areas that where this needs to be significantly improved and also did some more creative visualizations that highlight, again, how this access varies according to different uh, facets or parameters that you could analyze. So for example, this first row uh, looks at how access to high-speed internet varies based on how central a location is. So the furthest left of this uh, first row uh, represents places that are more centrally located, the further right 
would be places that are less centrally located. So then you can see the slight downward trend that places that are less central have less access to high-speed internet. The middle uh, looks at how access varies according to if you're former east or former west. And the lower uh, row looks at access to high-speed internet based on just population of an area and what correlations there might be there. But the real point of this story is then after we did this initial analysis and showed what was interesting, what was valuable about this data, the government then took at their next opportunity uh, to renegotiate the license through which they had originally purchased this data. They took the opportunity to renegotiate it so then they could in the future publish this data as open data. And that was because they had seen the work that we had done with this visualization and they realized what the potential of making this data available is. If we were one organization that had one angle or one view on this data, think of what other organizations can do, other ways that people could approach this data, other potential for visualizing this data in a way that speaks to people and captures their imagination. And so this is a case where we saw the data visualization really was the key to helping government officials better understand the value and the potential of open data. To bring it all together, what we've experienced through our work with the Berlin city government when it comes to using data visualization as a tool for open data, we find that data visualization is critical to making open data accessible since not everybody is in a position to work with raw data. It's, cru it's crucial to highlighting the value of open data to possible users since not everybody is in a position to look at an open data portal and immediately understand what can I do with this? What's interesting here for me to work with? And then finally, data visualization, again, plays a really important role in helping public servants better appreciate the why from open data. What's the point of doing this? Data visualization can bridge those gaps and make it clear for everyone why we're doing open data in the first place. Thank you so much for your attention. Uh, and if we have time for questions, I'd be happy to take some. Thank you so much, Victoria. We, we are a little bit over time, but we started a bit late. Firstly, we would like to say goodbye to Minister Hansen. Thank you so much for coming this morning. Being a minister means you can never stop. <laughs> Um, but at least you got to see your talk, which is fantastic. <laughs> well, on that note, maybe I'll kick off. Uh, we, we have questions. Anybody got a question straight away for Victoria? Yes, we have a question just here. Um, whilst the microphone is getting to the lady with the red jacket, I'll just quickly ask you, Victoria, myself, um, do you find it hard to persuade governments to, to use these techniques that you produce? So we definitely have found that maybe sort of ex unsurprisingly, data visualization sort of speaks for itself in a way. Like as soon as you can show a government employee in Berlin concretely, here's an example of what we did with another data set. We could see ourselves doing something similar or even something completely different, but this gives you a starting point of how to conceive of it. It helps a lot um, because we otherwise do really find with open data in Berlin, there's a lot of hesitation. There's a lot of excuses or reasons that people can find that this is not a priority for me right now, but when you can tie it in with the visualization, it makes it very tangible, it makes it very concrete for them, and then they see even potentially that they can get something out of it uh, in the case where we can develop with them jointly a visualization that they could uh, show on their website that uh, has proven to be a very powerful tool of persuasion for us. Thank you. Is there a question? Can you hear me? I'm Valentina Kalk from the European Investment Bank. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, I have a question. Do you ever find yourself in a situation in which you uh, question the interest of the data sets that your clients want to visualize? Because that's one of our challenges. And uh, so I'm interested in seeing if you sometimes are you are able to steer them to presenting maybe other sets of data that might be more interesting for citizens or for policymakers. So you mean maybe that we can kind of push the government to publish data that they might not have otherwise wanted to or or that might they might not have thought about uh, as interesting for for a more general audience. 
Absolutely. Um, we, in the work that we do with open data in Berlin, we frequently first get a hint ourselves through a website or a report or something that there's data out there that exists, but we know it doesn't exist as open data. And so we actually do frequently proactively go to government departments and say, uh, we think you have this data and we think we could do something really cool or useful with it. Um, we absolutely uh, do that often. So on a really basic level, for example, I'm working right now on trying to get a data set published of locations of public toilets in Berlin, which maybe isn't as sexy as other things, but it is a very useful data set. Uh, and that's a case where it's not being published, but the use case is so clear. Uh, and, luck and since we've built up this repertoire of doing interesting projects with open data and also have connected with other people that use data, then it's easier for us to go to them and say, we think you should publish this data. We have some really clear examples of what could be done with this data, so it's clearer to you why you'd want to do this. Yeah, we absolutely play that game. And within the toilets, you could do subsets for female toilets, because there's always a, a, a double shortage of these. Uh, just yes. on, the, on the point of questions, if you could keep your hand raised, uh, there's a question in the central aisle here, then the, the two people with the microphones can come to you whilst a question is being answered. So we have one question, the gentleman with the glasses, if you, if you could kindly stand up, sir, then um, Beatrice will know where to go to. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, just while the microphone is getting to you, sir, uh, again, I mean, just expanding this from government, to perhaps journalism more, they also can deal with open data. Do you feel they have a responsibility to do so also? I wouldn't necessarily tell government or tell newspapers they have a responsibility to do something, but we've really seen in Germany as a whole, and especially in Berlin, newspapers are doing amazing work with data journalism and visualizations based on open data. And I think that's like sort of a new frontier for open data that's already being well explored, but I think that it can be even further explored and sort of better understood by newspapers that open data is a treasure trove for newspapers and it uh, provides a great opportunity for them to create visualizations and that have a lot of relevance for individuals because if the open data set is specific to your city and then you create a visualization about the city people live in that really connects with people and gives them a new way to view their environment and that works extremely well. And the final question due to time from this gentleman here. Yeah, hi, I'm Matthew Lowry working with the European Commission. Um, we've done quite a lot of audience research over the last 18 months about how policymakers, which is a very broad term, interact with scientific knowledge. And data visualizations is one of the trickier parts of this because, well, I noticed in your second visualization uh, that you didn't just present the visualization, you presented some context, some text around that. And it reminds me that in our audience research, Everybody was gung-ho for data visualizations, but quite a few people, when we got them face-to-face -face and doing ethnographic interviews and focus groups, would say, yeah, they're great, but I haven't got time to push the buttons and turn the dials. You've got to give me the five bullet points. And I was wondering, have you done any audience research to find out who actually does explore the data? You talked a lot about government officials. That's your main audience. How high level are these government officials who actually turn the dials and push the buttons and levers and explore your data? And, uh, and uh, you know, okay, do you have anything to talk about that, basically? Yeah, it's a good question. The, the question in general of who uses open data is kind of one of the biggest mysteries in a lot of open data uh, fields across the globe simply because it's not something that's well tracked. You can only then ask people, have you used open data before? And maybe they'll answer yes or no. Um, we definitely know that government officials themselves are big consumers, or at least big potential consumers of open data. And so when I say government officials there, I really mean at the level of like lower level employees that are actually doing like city planning uh, work or um, in the case of like this social data that are actually then crunching numbers or writing reports and things like that. They have a huge appetite uh, for this data and our experience because we, it happens to us so often in conversations with different departments. We happen to mention that we were talking to another department about another data set, and then this other department is, oh, can you get us that data? Like, we actually really need that for this other project. We didn't know that it existed, or I made five phone calls and they stonewalled me. Um, so we definitely find that there's a lot of appetite for data and open data among government officials, and of course, among citizens as well, but because our work is so primarily at the level of government officials, that's kind of where we have the most direct experience. And so we haven't done formal like ethnographic surveys or anything like that, but we can definitely say based on experience, uh, government officials are, especially at the lower levels, are avid consumers of this data. 
Victoria, thank you so much. And if you want to book a slot with Victoria through the day, you can do so using the app on your phones. Next to the stage, I'd like to invite Mark Wilkins, who is the head of the Knowledge Management Methodologies, Communities and Dissemination Unit at the European Commission's Joint Research Centre. It's one of those titles that takes a very long time to write down. You said that your mission is to put science and knowledge at the heart of EU policy making for the benefit of citizens. And you know that you're in a position to make change and impact, one that you're both privileged to have, and it's a very engaging role too. The stage is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Lisa. It's actually, it's very encouraging to see uh, this uh, huge interest here today in data visualization. The first time this conference is organized, because, uh, because as the science arm of the European Commission, we are actually very much convinced that visualization is a game changer, a real game changer, in passing across complex messages towards the policy makers. Yeah. Okay, so, um, so talking about complexity, a few weeks ago during the uh, Knowledge Week we organized in the European Commission, um, one expert actually um, said that um, knowledge management is primarily everything about managing complexity. So talking about complexity, uh, three years ago, the JRC established the uh, Knowledge Center on the Migration and Demography, uh, a commission on Knowledge Center, and actually became to realize very quickly, as many of us working at the Science to Policy Interface, that there are actually three types of complexity we have to manage in terms of knowledge management. The first one is the complexity of the political problem, the policy uh, problem, um, in this case uh, covering many different uh, perspectives, policy perspectives ranging from foreign neighborhood policy, border security, asylum, uh, immigration, and just name it. The second complexity is about the relationship between science and policy, which is not at all a linear relationship, but full of feedback based on data, public perception, uh, values, uh, disinformation, now a very important problem. And the third type of complexity is actually the oversupply of data, information and knowledge. So we are living in a world now where actually we don't lack data or knowledge, but actually we have too much uh, knowledge around. And the real challenge is actually to make sure we can make sense of all that uh, uh, knowledge and also to synthesize it properly based on uh, realistic and credible sources. So based on that, uh, on that experience and other experiences we have made with setting up knowledge centers, uh, we have been asked by the Commission services uh, to actually um, produce a set of um, additional knowledge management products, if I may say so, um, which cover various uh, topics. And uh, actually the idea was to um, synthesize facts and trends, future trends, to actually inform policy making and uh, to, um, to set these uh, different uh, topics on the agenda of future EU policymakers uh, in, in, in Europe. So actually, um, we had uh, many topics we had to cover, about a dozen, uh, with, one, uh, with one specific goal, which is actually uh, providing scientific evidence for better policies. And uh, the, uh, the, the broad perspectives we had actually covered ranges from very complex topics like um, blockchain, the future of blockchain, um, very, let's say, abstract topics like the future of artific artificial intelligence and its impact on society, or um, understanding uh, our political uh, nature, how policy making will uh, progress in the future, um, to uh, very data intensive, for instance, um, topics like the future of cities, um, etc. But all of them together, uh, coherent, let's say, perspective is to uh, make uh, sure that uh, the policymakers are informed with specific data and facts on these different uh, issues. Our audience, policy making and policymakers in particular are not the easiest, I can tell you. Um, you can see here what are the specific characteristics we had to, let's say, take into account. Uh, but I think the key one is actually to make sure that we uh, provided uh, distilled messages but also provide them confidence in credible sources for details if these details would be needed to further investigate. So let me uh, also explain you a, 
a little bit more about some of the design principles we have taken to actually uh, take up that challenge. First of all, um, we have designed a visual identity to make sure that we had a common branding, so that it would be easier actually to provide um, a message towards our, uh, let's say, uh, main audience, the policy making uh, process. So you see here, for instance, that we have uh, used uh, specific colors, um, specific colors for each type of uh, topic, and these colors then also used within the publications uh, based on the color palette, which is coherent with what has been chosen for each topic. Then, um, obviously, a visual co um, identity is coherent across all the topics, but we have designed it so that it's, uh, we could also provide flexibility in the visual identity based on the specific topics to be covered. For instance, playing with emotions. You see a, a picture there which uh, is, is actually almost now 100 years old or more. Um, on elusive images uh, which actually um, provide the idea that con cognitive uh, aspects are very important in certain areas and then specific vector images uh, specifying more uh, structural aspects, uh, Cartesian type of uh, approaches. And there you see, for instance, the changing nature of work based on emotions, the uh, understanding our political nature, very much um, specifically linked to behavioral sciences and cognitive sciences. And for instance, the report on China, uh, very much based on vector images which we have used during the, uh, the report. But obviously, uh, we want our readership not just to look at nice covers, but also we would like them to look at what's inside. Um, so for each of the uh, publications, we have made sure that each chapter has an executive summary and a specific image um, applied to it, which uh, characterizes that particular chapter in each of the reports. Here, the future of work, the uh, demographics, uh, the, the future of demographics, and blockchain uh, aspects uh, in the European Union. Also, for each chapter, we ensured that there was a key message, very important also downstream for our communication activities in collaboration with scientists to actually create these key messages for each specific chapter and also quotes which were specifically <coughs> mentioned explicitly in the, uh, in the different uh, chapters. Okay, um, textbooks on visualization are full of um, visualization components. There's not much new about that, but the innovative aspect we have tried to do is actually to personalize these different components <coughs> according to the specific type of visualization we wanted to implement with them, and then make sure that we started creating a standard library uh, in our organization for actually applying them across the board and also in future similar initiative knowledge management initiatives. For instance here, um, which is uh, an extract from the, the report on the future of uh, cities, um, which actually is a very simple graph, but actually uh, representing at least three dimensions, which uh, provides, let's say, the number of years of skilled workers um, affording them to work and to be able to afford um, an, a flat of 60 square meters near to the city center. And you see here the whole range starting on the top of Hong Kong and on the bottom which is a subset of the data we've used here, uh, Chicago. Also in that, uh, in that uh, graph you can see what has, the what has been the value of about 10 years ago in the white, the white spot. And you see immediately with one, one simple infographic what is the evolution and the state of affairs. So you can also see it again here that Hong Kong is probably not the best place to be uh, in these days. Um, then composition of a whole, um, another type of, of, of representing data in an infographic is here from the report um, on the future of work, um, where actually you see that the, in purple or in grey if you want, that the uh, actual um, population in Europe will more or less stagnate between now and 2060, but actually the active population will decrease quite considerably, and uh, the share of skilled workers in this active population will actually increase considerably between now and 2060. So these are projections based on demographic analysis and, and statistics uh, uh, from our researchers. Um, there are two ways of actually using infographics we have tried to implement across the board in our work. One is looking at the micro uh, perspective 
and homing in, in in a particular topic, for instance here in the publication on the future of transport, looking on the sustainability of raw materials and how they impact actually the, the promotion of e-mobility in the European Union, a very important policy perspective. And then the other way of looking at uh, infographics is actually looking at the macro level. And here, with two examples, is actually trying to summarize, synthesize in a two-page infographic, a 120-page report. So this has been quite a major challenge uh, for us, together with the scientists, to do that. But it was extremely worthwhile to do the exercise in itself, and also as a communication tool, has been very uh, beneficial. Um, a few words on the co-creation process. So one of the big advantages of this uh, project has been the collaboration with various, let's say, um, experts, uh, stakeholders, etc., uh, during the, uh, the, the project, involving um, scientists, um, internally more than 200 scientists, uh, externally more than 100, so in total 300, over a period of six months to create these, uh, these studies and these uh, publications. Obviously, working, having to work together with um, all the communicators from social media to press, etc., and also then with the uh, graphic designers to look at the visualization, which actually the interface between graphic design and scientists has been one of the major challenges and also one of the big benefits and as, as a learning organization to actually promote that further in the, in the future. Okay, communication, obviously we have taken also there a holistic approach and looked at it um, from a, in a coherent way to develop um, communication material which would be fit for purpose for the different media, uh, going from posters for the events, uh, banners, uh, GIFs for the uh, social media, um, etc. Um, here is an example of um, a typical but more traditional type of uh, graphical display um, but very, very important uh, topic, which is uh, related to uh, the uh, population growth worldwide um, and specifically in Africa, uh, based on three parameters, which is actually the education level of, um, of girls, of uh, female population. And you see the big differences between, let's say, uh, the status quo in current uh, development programs for educational programs in Africa, um, then one which is actually doing nothing at all, uh, which uh, actually then promotes a very much steep rise in uh, population in Africa and with a big impact on, on the world. And then, let's say, an accelerated education program, uh, obviously promoted and funded by the EU and other countries to actually make sure that it uh, gets uh, down again. And then this was also correlated then with the fertility rate, um, let's say, um, in, in, in Africa. Um, if you translate that to an infographic, actually the, the, the picture, which is very complex, becomes very clear to understand where you see the different scenarios uh, the, being depicted. And then a subset of this has been used also then for the social media uh, communication. Okay, so um, just to finish on this, uh, what's next uh, for the JRC? Um, it's very important that um, we understand that the, 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 the model, the traditional model, let's say the deficit model of communication is probably reaching its limits um, if we do more of the same but better, okay? And therefore we will have to work together with social scientists, with cognitive scientists to make sure that we get a better understanding of human behavior uh, in terms of informing people and informing policy making and to make sure that we also include emotions and uh, values in our narratives in the future. And obviously we have to be very careful as this uh, simple uh, scenario shows here of the G7 in Canada in 2018 where you see the same picture but differently framed from different press offices giving a completely different um, perspective. So that means that actually framing is not neutral and has to be done very carefully to make sure that the, the message is passed in a very, very reliable way. So thank you very much for your attention. And if you want more information, there you can find the, uh, the, the website. Thank you so much. Uh, you can remain here. I know we're, we're slightly over time, but.
uh, we, we won't let you escape without one or two questions. If we have quick hands up, quick questions. Oh, there's a very quick hand right there in the center. The microphone is coming towards you. And if I could kindly ask you to stand up so that everyone can see you as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. Is it open? Do you hear to me? Very interesting stuff, uh, sir. Okay, thank you very much. I'm Athanas Tavrakoudin, coming from Greece, from University of Ioana, and I have a very hard philosophical question about, from your talk, okay? <laughs> you know, I'm Greek. <laughs> <laughs> do, do you mention that your intention is to bring scientific ed evidence to the public about analysis of the data, etc., okay? And probably this is the word that the Joint um, Research Center what it does. But do you, have, uh, do you believe that people believe in science? The general public believes in science? Uh, yeah, the, actually that's a very relevant and uh, actual question. Um, we think that indeed um, science and evidence in general is in a kind of a crisis, if I may say, due to various reasons which we can discuss behind a beer or a coffee. Um, but clearly, um, we can try to do our best in actually try to make sure that at least when we communicate to our policymakers that the facts and the data and the trends we provide them are based on sound data sources. Make sure that these data sources then are properly analyzed, synthesized and then communicated, communicated to them in a reasonable, acceptable and understandable way. This is our main objective with this exercise here. The other, the other problem we are facing actually is that in particular in the EU and European Commission in particular institutions would have to invest much more in, in actually engaging with the citizens and make sure that the benefits of European policies based on sound scientific evidence are better communicated to them so that, I mean, we can try to actually improve their understanding of the issue and understand also how proper policy making can be actually implemented to the benefit of them, okay? That's a huge challenge and actually the new commission with Ursula von der Leyen has made a clear statement that values, democracy, engagement with citizens is going to be one of the main priorities for the future. So we are going to work on that also from the communication perspective as a big challenge in the future, All right? But your point is taken definitely Understood. Very interesting question indeed, actually. I'm sure one that can be followed up later. Any other questions? I can't see any hands rising rapidly, which will... Is there one question anywhere? Did I miss something? Wonderful. That keeps us slightly more to time. Thank you so much. Your, your talk was fascinating. I know some of the slides we couldn't see for too long, so if you want to see any of the talks, all of them will be put online afterwards, and you can source them just after the conference. Thank you so much once again, Mark. Thank you. Now we welcome to the stage Shaquin Vieira Gonzalez, who uh, already is a second generation uh, graphics editor. His father was one too. He's extremely proud to come from Galicia, a place he left 18 years ago, from which he says there is a notable concentration of data viz people. So I'm sure he'll tell us why that might be. Perhaps it's the food. We'll come to that. Uh, most of his professional life, he was at the New York Times. And from there, apparently, you were called all sorts of things like Chucky and X-Man and various things, yes. but wonder, wonderful Spanish spelling. Last office job was at The Guardian, where he was uh, head of the visuals team, but he left because he wanted to spend more time with his son. So we're very much looking forward to your talk on data vision. We're very happy you're here because apparently your friends say if you weren't here, you'd be serving us food, your, your other passion. Thank you so much, Joaquin. Um. In 2016, while at The Guardian, uh, one of my colleagues from the visual desk, who happened to be from Spain, told me that uh, one of the politicians was using uh, charts during the electoral debate. And I was like super thrilled. I was like, yeah, we've done it. Uh, Database has uh, broken the pie chart ceiling. We've gone mainstream. And then by his look, I realized that maybe I should have all my horses in the uh, excitement. 
Y al final las recetas liberales que lo que hacen es generar más oportunidades, menos fiscalidad, menos burocracia, más flexibilidad, hace que se cree empleo y que con ese empleo se financie la política social, que es lo que esta legislatura no se ha tocado. Ha crecido la política social, tanto mentir al final se topa, no con un meme, con la realidad. Tanto mentir al final se topa, no con un meme. Um, there are many things wrong with this uh, chart. The first one, which I'll call the overworked intern uh, mistake, is that the visuals and the numbers don't match. <laughs> they fixed that mistake when they posted the same argument on a tweet later on. And I don't know if that made things better, because most of the replies were about a very basic charting tool, uh, uh, rule, is that the, the base of a bar chart should always start at um, zero. Why? The way we read this is by comparing the height, and uh, the difference between the first and the last one is not the six times uh, as you see in, in there. As an example, the chart on the left uh, was one of the replies. It added an extra layer of nuance uh, they adjusted the amounts for, for inflation. And it reminded me of a classic example from a vintage 90s ad from Chevy. The difference is that this one is advertisement and the other one is public discourse. And public discourse is meant to be um, honest and ethical, or at least should be. If a visualization is meant to inform the public, at least should be honest. <laughs> Many people uh, misuse graphics, charts, data visualization, however you want to uh, refer to it. Anyone dare to date or knows who this quote is uh, from? Yeah, <laughs> just kidding. Uh, this is by Willer Brinton uh, from, <laughs> from Graphic Methods for, uh, for Presenting uh, Facts and it's now over 100 years old. The thing is data visualization can be deceiving and can be manipulated. And especially at this moment when creating uh, beautiful, awe-inspiring uh, visualizations is increasingly uh, easier. I'm always suspicious when a chart is aesthetically bad, but that's just uh, professional conditioning. Uh, most of us uh, here would be suspicious um, as well. But how do we prevent it um, consistently? How do, no matter how the chart looks and no matter the, the context? Well, we can uh, be aware of uh, and prevent it and even confront it if we understand the process and know how uh, and where the pitfalls are in, in the life cycle of a data visualization. From the moment someone collects the data, to the moment someone reads the visualization or the visual narrative. So who's collected this uh, data set? Uh, what gets counted? What gets excluded from it? Uh, why does this person or this company or this whatever the entity uh, is fall in this category? Jacob Harris, a former colleague from the New York Times, uh, wrote a wonderful piece about the, the wave of uh, PR data. Has this data been normalized? Are the calculations to compare things uh, consistent? Don't worry, I'll share the slides. No need to uh, take picture, pictures of each slide. Uh, if we're highlighting uh, different views of the data um, and filtering it, what is the criteria to do uh, this filtering? How are we representing those those numbers uh, or the categories in the visualization? Are we using the appropriate visual uh, encodings to, to do so? Are the most prominent visual features the most significant features of the, of the data, those peaks and valleys, the things that pop uh, are, th are really the, the significant points in the, in the data? And are we creating spurious correlations? Are we implying something when we connect the words with the, with the visuals in the story. This is a great example, um, bordering on classic already, 
of a misleading chart. This is implying that the US president, uh, that impeaching the US president is suppressing the will of the vast majority of Americans who voted for him. The problem is <laughs> the data uh, and the visual don't mean that. And unless you survey Americans, uh, it's a misleading statement. This maps in which we shade admin regions uh, based on the data, we call them core uh, maps, have this really common uh, issue, is that the areas that are bigger carry more visual uh, weight, although the numbers uh, within them might be um, smaller. Um, and this is simply, this visual is simply a map of counties that voted uh, Republican in, in the majority. That's it. A more um, how do we create a more uh, honest visual? We can do um, this alternative display by um, Karim Duib. There's some issues with it um, as well, but it tries to address the population uh, misunderstanding, uh, misinterpretation. And it's also a very um, soothing kind of map to, to look at this loop that he uh, created. Spain uh, just uh, held an election two days ago, and this is what, the, on the other side of the, of the spectrum, this is what some of my, uh, my friends were sharing on, on social media uh, about the race of a far-right um, uh, party in, in Spain. And they were saying that, uh, Galicia and the Basque Country and Navarra and Catalonia were resisting the wave of the far right uh, party. This is a slightly different uh, shading of it. And what you can see there is that actually in those two regions or three regions, the Basque Country, Navarra and uh, Catalonia, there's somebody else other than that far right um, um, party. They are the, those are the, where the independentist movement uh, is, is stronger. And they were trying to say uh, that my people were also resisting this. The problem is that when you look at this, it's actually a stronghold from the other right-wing party in, in Spain. So they were, they were drawing conclusions from that map that were in there. The map only means what the map means, nothing else. Everything you add on top of it is uh, misleading. If we use more than one data set, if we put data in context of uh, something else, we need to be aware of the result. I do not recommend you look at this website, uh, at work, Tyler uh, Vigan's uh, website because you'll go down uh, the rabbit hole and get lost. It's absolutely, absolutely delightful, and uh, the humorous selection of correlations is, is just uh, wonderful. He turned it into, into a uh, book. Sometimes uh, the correlations you present um, are not just as, as spurious, they're just um, something else. This is an example from The Economist, and it's another gem. Um, it's a story uh, last year about China's digital Silk Road and how the richer provinces of China tend to have a higher rate of internet users. Uh, what do we think that this map is showing? Anybody? Remember, this is supposed to be putting two data sets in, in context to each other. The map is not visualizing the most important uh, part of the, of the correlation. It's just showing the, uh, the richer uh, provinces. Kaiser Fang from Junk Charts, uh, I recommend this website uh, as well, drafted a possible uh, way to fix this. And uh, it's, a, it's a draft, so I guess it's, it was, it's, just, it's not a finished work. Um, but I'm, I say, if you're trying to show correlation, I don't understand why you keep uh, Geography. So I did this quick, uh, quick draft. I think here you see the correlation easier. 
or you can break it into two maps um, instead of in, in just one map. But really, why? Um, we also need to be aware of charts that present the obvious as a surprise or common phenomenon as a singular issue. And we're creatives, right? Uh, Simon Scar at the South China Morning Post posted uh, this wonderful uh, full page visualization of the death toll in Iraq. It looked like dripping blood, and whether or not you agree with, uh, with the visual metaphor, it was a powerful um, visual. Reuters in 2014 did some, something similar, and I am being very generous when I say something similar. Um, what does it look like it implies? Anybody? In reality, gun deaths went up after Florida enacted the stand your ground uh, law. The graphic on the left uh, uses an area chart and it's pointing down to the, to the valley, uh, to the peak right before the, the valley unlike the other one, which is pointing down, there's some design decisions that make you misread this graphic. In the same 100-year-old book, right after the quote I showed you at the beginning, uh, the author says this, and we're lucky that that is fixed now. But with all we have, well, by the way, there's like uh, an Easter egg of uh, cookbooks there <laughs> at the top. Um, with what we've learned, how can we make the first chart we saw here more honest? Anybody from Eurostat? <laughs> Love to you guys. So we can go, we can go to, um, to Eurostat and look for data that, is, uh, that can be compared between, uh, between countries and within uh, the same country and look at exactly the same data, uh, but um, but instead of going up, it goes down. Well, we can also change the time frame of this and look at a wider time frame to get more context. <laughs> My slide is getting frustrated with me. Um, and then when we look at uh, Spain compared to the rest of the big motors, uh, economic motors engines of, of uh, Europe, we see what the problem uh, is. The problem, uh, I am, I'm making a, a mistake that I said we shouldn't, we shouldn't do. I'm leaving that peak there uh, without an, any sort of explanation, but we can also normalize the, uh, the data and look at it as it relates to the rest of the European Union. Anyway, wondering about the reasons uh, somebody has chosen the data for, uh, for the argument and why they've chosen the data frame or the, the visual representation. What is the annotation implying? And it's something that we need to be aware of. And all this trouble can be easily fixed if we're more transparent and in our methodology and release the data that is visualize. And that paired with confronting unethical um, database and increasing data and graphic literacy, which I think is something that should be accessible to every citizen, we uh, could be off to a good start. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hope is a short question, so we can get coffee. <laughs> a short question. Okay. Um, you talk about graphical literacy. Yep. And how do you think we can increase the amount of data, uh, gra graphical literacy in Europe? Ooh, that's a yeah, that's a short <laughs> question. So, um, did everybody hear the question? How do we increase data literacy in uh, data and graphic literacy in in Europe? I think there's there's many things. Uh, 
that we can do. But I think we should bring uh, graphic literacy as a fundamental skill in schools. So in primary and in secondary schools, uh, we should teach uh, kids how to draw and read and interpret uh, charts as a normal uh, skill for uh, for a for communication because we t we teach people how to uh, to write uh, essays but we don't uh, teach them how to uh, use visuals to create arguments and I think that's a fundamental uh, skill. We also need to uh, increase data literacy in like this sort of audience. Um, and it's very important in public administrations because it's just not there yet. At least my experience in, um, in it, it's not there yet. I think we have time for one more short question. There's a hand right at the back here. Um, hello, Hakim. Um, yeah, uh, a oh. short question. You, you've proven the, the power of uh, data viz. Uh, what's your position towards um, establishing kind of of, of ethics for data scientists, just like the Hippocrat uh, oaths for physicians. Ooh, that's a very uh, interesting proposal. I mean, there's there's some uh, like projects that uh, that sort of uh, try to to address that, but I think it's something that I mean. <laughs> If, if somebody from a, uh, from a foundation is uh, interested in, in putting that sort of out there and get people to, to sign uh, up for that oath or that ethics uh, code, that would be uh, fantastic. On, on, uh, on, visual, on visual journalism, there was an, at, uh, an attempt on, on visual explanations. There was an attempt a few years ago um, to, to do that that was somewhat unsuccessful. Uh, but I think it would be uh, it would be a terrific uh, idea. Were you, were you um, asking uh, for like who can like lead that? I mean, anybody here can uh, can take the the lead on on that. I think that's a that's a lovely question mark to end on. Thank you yeah. so much, Shaquin. Thank you very Thank much you. for the the wonderful talk. Thank, Thank you. you. Well, we've had a few questions about the meaning of science and ethical questions and Hippocratic Oaths for Data Viz, which you can all now discuss over a coffee break, along with enjoying the posters. It's a roughly just under 30-minute coffee break, but just a couple of um, things to talk about. Uh, at 11.45, the five parallel thematic sessions start, so you can access your phone or the brochure to see which room you'll be in, and maybe if you're in D or E, just check upstairs where they are. Um, e is just a us, D is just around the corner and a little bit further away, but you have a very funky bar just outside. Um, for those of you who are the visual thinkers, the speakers, the poster exhibitors, uh, the publications office would like to have a family photo. So if you could all, and of course the members of the publications office and and the moderators of all of the events. So that's basically almost everybody. <laughs> um, so before you have your coffee, if you could walk around to the foyer, um, which is near the entrance that some of you might have tried to get into, um, is the, the front entrance. That's where they're going to take a, a very large group photo. Um, other than that, uh, for those of you watching online or via the stream, don't worry, you can go and have your coffee. <laughs> if you're watching online, um, we will have this room, which will be streamed online, but all of the talks will be available online after the event. Enjoy your coffee. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. <laughs> sorry, sorry, so much. sorry. sorry.
hello, hello, on.
Hello, everybody. We're going to have a, a much uh, more fun session, I think, now, a lot more intimate. So please do, I mean, you can have the entire back section if you wish, or you can move forward as, as you wish. So uh, obviously plenty of space, and um, and we hope there'll be plenty of time for discussion as well. So we're, we're now in, in a, a section where we've got four great speeches ahead, and it's going to be all about uh, understanding policy. First up, we're going to hear from Annie White, on her own, unfortunately, because her partner, the, there was a visa issue. So you're taking the reins all by yourself. So please welcome to the stage Annie White from Harvard's Growth Lab to give the talk, Communicating Complex Economic Topics for Policymakers. Annie is the Senior Software Product Manager at Harvard's Growth Lab in Cambridge, Massachusetts. She oversees its portfolio of digital tools and also the software development team. Annie, the floor is yours. Thank you. Okay, good. Good morning, everybody. Um, so yes, I am from the Harvard Growth Lab in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Um, and today I'm going to talk about communicating complex to uh, economic topics for policymakers specifically. So um, what I'm going to focus on today is who we are at the Growth Lab. I'll tell you a little bit about what we do. Um, we build a number of software tools at the Growth Lab. Today I'm going to focus on our flagship tool, which is the Atlas of Economic Complexity. Um, with particular attention to uh, a feature we just launched called Atlas Country Profiles, which was a huge design process for us. Um, I'll show you how the Atlas works, who's using it, and then speak about the design process we use to get it to where it is. Um, so for a bit of background, the Growth Lab is located at the Harvard Kennedy School of Government in Cambridge. Um, and the lab has three main components to it. So the first one is sort of pure academic research. The second component is applied research. We go out into the field, we bring back our findings um, and sort of work with the applied research team or the um, academic research team. And then the third component is a software development team, um, which, is, which makes the lab quite unique. And together across these three areas, we try to focus on this question, why do some regions grow and others do not? Um, and to do this, we try to understand the dynamics of growth and translate those insights into f more effective um, policy-making decisions and tools. Um, we have a strong belief at the Growth Lab that our findings should be shared as broadly as possible. Um, and one good way to do this is by developing software tools. Um, we try to make our tools as engaging as possible, as accessible as possible, and ultimately free as well. And that just means that they're able to get um, into the hands of more people. So today I'm going to show you the Atlas of Economic Complexity. I'm going to do that right now. We'll just sneak into a new tab here. So this is the Atlas of Economic Complexity on its explore side. There's sort of two ways to get into the Atlas. One is through sort of a choose your own adventure, explore sort of way, and the other is through a narrative component called country profiles. What you see right now is the explore side of the Atlas up here. The explore side allows you to choose any country in the world and over 6,000 different products. Um, from a menu down here. And what that means is that you're able to see the dynamics of a country's exports, its imports, its products that it expo exports and imports, and its partners as well across six different visualizations. So it's really like a choose your own adventure. You can imagine there's 250 countries, 6,000 products, six visualizations. You can imagine all the permutations a user can get out of that. But we also have country profiles. And country profiles is a much more linear way of experiencing a country. We actually wanted to tell you a story that has a beginning, a middle, and an end. And so this was a tool where we said, okay, let's bring you through each sort of element of a country, including its exports, its imports, and the complexity of these things. And the tool actually has a predictive quality to it, so that by the time you get down to the tool, we take you to a place where we can actually predict the kind of policy you should be creating in your country, and what sort of export story that has for you. 
So uh, just to come back then um, to speak a little bit about the design process behind the atlas. Um, actually, before I do that, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about the data as well. So if you're curious about where the data comes from for a tool like this, um, it essentially comes from three sources. The biggest one is UN Com Trade. So we get all of our raw trade data on goods from the UN Com Trade. We apply an in-house cleaning process to it and then update it annually in the atlas. We also use services data from the World Bank and then um, quantitative metrics like GDP and population from there as well. Um, overall, the Atlas um, has a really nice reach. I think this is partly what happens when the tool is free and sort of designed very accessibly. Um, so we had our one millionth user this year, um, millions of page views, and we actually have active users in almost every country in the world. So when you come from a place that's trying to understand growth, that kind of scope is very encouraging. Um, it's used by people all over the world, policymakers, academics, journalists. It's also a huge teaching tool at Harvard, a teaching and a research tool. And so you can imagine um, when you're trying to reach this many different kinds of people with one singular tool, um, the design process is very challenging because we have so many kinds of users. And so today I'm gonna talk a little bit about what's unique about our design process. So I showed you two ways to kind of engage with the Atlas. The one is this explore side that's very user driven. So we say to a user, you get to choose whatever you want. Choose the country, choose the product, choose the visualization. Um, and then there's the country profile side of it that's very linear. The beginning's at the beginning and the end is at the end. Um, and so there's, there's sort of design philosophies that we change depending on what approach we're looking at. So for the author-driven approach, we say for a country profile, the data visualization's always front and center. We try to maintain that rule no matter what we're building. But a huge piece of the page is actually the narrative, or the, the telling the story of the country. Whereas for something that's more user-driven, the user chooses exactly what they want to see. The visualization is still, still front and center, but we actually have these builder qualities. So instead of telling you a story, we give you options and buttons to kind of construct what you want to see. So overall, this takes us through sort of three main um, elements of a design process. The most important part of our process is information design. Um, the second part is going into user experience and user interface, and then of course testing. Um, we we uh, subject our work to lots and lots of testing to make sure that we're sort of catching the voice of all the varying, varying kinds of users that we have. So what does that process look like? Well, it's not exactly like a typical design process where we start asking people, what do you want? And sort of gather those requirements. Instead for us, it's really driven by the data that's available and the story we're trying to pull from that data. So with us, we always start um, with saying what data is available and then we work with our research fellows to say what kind of conclusions are you drawing from this data? So before we get to any feature development, before we get into sort of any storyboarding and color selection, it's what are the conclusions. Um, after months and years of research, our internal research fellows usually can, can tell us quite plainly the story that they're trying to tell. Um, and then for us, we have to understand the research theory behind all of this. So what are the methodologies that brought us to these conclusions? So all of these three steps have to happen before we even get to understanding what would even be the appropriate data visualization to choose. Um, there's a huge challenge in the work we do, which is just validating the data representation type we're going to use. So you've seen some of the visualizations we use. This is a scatter plot uh, from our country profiles that we ended up using. And it was very hard to arrive on this visualization because when it worked for a country like Uganda, so we plotted Uganda's exports um, across its complexity and its potential for growth, and then we tried it for 119 other countries and their data just doesn't fit within um, the axes that we laid out. And so we had to really struggle with, given all the kinds of countries we wanna cover, some rich, some poor, um, all kinds of countries, does one single data visualization work for all of them? 
And so we often have dreams of using beautiful data viz, and when we apply it to all the countries we have to cover, we have to scrap it because it just doesn't, it's not representative for everybody. Um, I speak a lot about how hard it is to work with so many varying types of stakeholders in our work. Um, and if you can imagine, they all come with extremely different opinions. Um, and so you can imagine in a multidisciplinary lab where we work with economists, policy experts, mathematicians, computer scientists, software developers, um, it's almost impossible to find consensus. And so in our design process, what we try to do is to give the illusion of options when it's very, very um, constrained, actually. And so, for example, we have a geo map in the explore section, and color is very important on the geo map. It shows the um, density of trade flow around the world. And so rather than say to people, how should we show this? We say, what of the six color options do you like? And so it sure looks like a lot of options, um, but actually it makes the designer's life very, very, it makes her life much easier because we give people um, very constrained options. Um, another challenge with the kind of work we're doing is we actually go into the world of making recommendations, and usually recommendations along policy lines. And the methodology behind doing this is complicated. And so we always make sure that when we show something like this policy-related visualization, so this is in country profiles, it's at the end of a country story, and we say, based on what you know today, we think we can tell you something about what you, what you can produce in the future and the one of four policy approaches you should take to do that. And so each quadrant that you see in this visualization is a type of um, policy approach. Well, behind that is a decision-making tree that helps, us, helps the user understand how we got to that. So it's actually like a visualization embedded in a visualization. Is we say, look, we think you should go into this policy approach and we, we guess that your very next question is why. And so we have to provide you with a data viz to show why the data viz shows what it does. Um, we do a lot of user testing in our group. So just because we think we've reached a solution, um, that's not always the case. And so we do things like benchmarking. So do things get better over time? Does understanding across uh, our users get better over time? We do surveys um, with people. And then we also do workshops. This is a picture you're seeing here um, of a workshop we did with country profiles where we ask people to sort of line up information in a storyboard that made sense. It's a hugely iterative process for us. So we start with sort of just regular sketches, um, move into black and white wire framing, and sort of move along and build out and build out between each iteration. There's tons of user testing, um, and each round of user testing informs our next iteration. Only once we've done all of those iterations do we move into a working prototype. So this is a really nice stage to get to, get to because finally you can actually show people how their ideas would behave. Um, we still haven't coded a line of work yet. It's still all um, sort of um, uh, static working design, uh, design work. And then once we have a wireframe in production, we can move it into development. And so this is a little timeline um, of what development looks like for us. So we go through lots of research discovery. As I said, it always starts with what's the data trying to tell us um, and what are the conclusions we're drawing at the lab. We go into a huge design process. It can often take months. Um, and only then, once we've arrived at um, uh, a wireframe that we all agree on, do we start coding. We follow the agile development process in the lab, sprint after sprint after sprint, and then we usually launch an iteration, and we just repeat it over and over again. And that's all for me today. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Now, have we any questions? I'm sure there must be questions here in this room for Annie. Any questions? Yes, we have oh, three, three hands up. So wherever the mic lands first, please keep your hands raised. Uh, oh, another one there as well. Great. Uh, hello, I'm from the European Parliament. Uh, and I have a question. 
it's, it's very interesting presentation. I'm impressed. And you use several uh, info sources for your database to create the data visualization. How do you manage these sources in terms of how you get data through APIs? And what is your strategy? If these sources changes, how will you adjust your software to support these changes? It's a good question, and it's one that we're vulnerable to for sure. So we use public data sources for the Atlas. Uh, UN Comtrade trade data is public. Um, the world development indicators, the same. And then services data, um, the, the version of the services data we use is public as well. So that's three sources right there. And then we have data sources internally that we use, but it's mostly generated through um, our own research, so that's a little less vulnerable. Um, the one thing I'll say is with trade data, we apply a cleaning method in-house that essentially renders the data a whole new data set. And so as long as we always have access to trade data, the Atlas can sort of keep going. But it is the case that we had to think really hard when we started the tool, what's the most stable source of data we could get? Um, we think UN Comtrade is, is the best choice there, but it's true, if you're using public data sources, you're at risk of it changing. Um, we get asked by countries all the time, can you include sort of a custom data set from our country, which would make the analysis much richer? And while we would love to do that, it's vulnerable to exactly what you're saying, which is now we have to chase all of these unique data sets. So by keeping our data sources r a rather small list, there's two, um, and sort of s stable, reliable institutions, I think we protect ourselves as well as we can. Another question. Yeah, hi. Two, but one's very, very fast to answer. The first, uh, the first question is, how large is your team? And the second question, uh, you mentioned something about uh, that uh, you have a decision tree behind the, uh, I think it's the author-driven uh, presentation, which results in policy recommendations, and you need to explain how. The thing is, there's people think of data as very neutral and objective and scientific, and policy recommendations are by inherently political. How do you bridge that gap, and how do you transparently explain the assumptions behind your decision tree, which may not be data driven? Or yeah. Maybe they so are. the first question: uh, How big is our team? So the the I'm assuming you're talking about the software development team. Yeah, so the, I think the growth lab is at, at about 50 people right now, and that includes everyone, the economists, uh, computer scientists, researchers, and so on. Uh, and our software development team is four people. So it's quite a small team. Um, in terms of, so you're asking about how are we sort of transparent about things like, things that are a little bit less fact-driven, like policy recommendations. Um, I, I think, what, what always underpins what we do is decades worth of research and methodology. Um, and so we try to connect that as much as possible. I mean, the, we can only ask so much of the data viz to sort of unearth that. Um, but if you use the Atlas, you'll see that we're always trying to connect it back to the research. So if you're someone that comes here and says, what do you mean by this thing complexity? How do you measure it? How, how do you know it's bulletproof? There are so many different sources throughout that you can sort of dig deeper. So, you know, the easiest way is to go to the glossary and just find quick definitions and all the formulas we use to define these things. But it's all supported by published research. And those, that work is uh, freely available to the users as well. So I think we can only ask so much of the Atlas in terms of what we reveal before we just burden the user. Um, but we tried to say, if you want to dig deeper, there's loads of academic research that, that backs this up. Thank you so much, Annie. I'm just trying to keep to time here in front of me, but I assume you're around for the rest of the day. Yes. So people can catch you if they want to talk to you personally. Thank you very Thank you. much once more for that talk. Thank you. We now welcome to the stage two people for a joint talk from the ETH in Zurich. Please welcome Joanna Slay and Manuel Schneider, two bioethics researchers currently working at the Health Ethics and Policy Lab in the ETH. Joanna is a visual and media anthropologist, and Manuel has actually a background in physics, so the floor is yours. 
Hello. Is it on? Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, yeah. So we will be presenting to you today um, a project we have been working on for the last year. And it's a project experimenting with visualizing ethics frameworks. So to begin uh, the story of our project, um, I start with a statement that complexity can be a feature. It can be a feature of policy documents. So to illustrate this point, I referred to a New York Times article, some of you might have seen it, and they investigated the understandability and <laughs> comprehensibility of um, privacy policies. And lo and behold, they found that they were an incomprehensible disaster. Ah, oh, sorry. Um, what they found was not only that they required a college degree to understand, but that Facebook's privacy policy, for instance, was only more, um, Immanuel Kant's critique of pure reason was only more complex. So this is the standard that we're expecting users to, to engage with. So there is an issue here. When we have such a wide diversity of stakeholders and users, how are we expecting everyone to have a college degree and to engage with this context? So one approach is visualization, the theme of today's conference. And there are many reasons for this. I mean, for those who work in the visual fields, you, there, are, there are many other reasons. Um, my two favorites are dual coding theory and visual argument um, that kind of highlight how visuals um, can lead to more efficient ways for information retrieval. Just think of trying to find your way in the tube map in London. It's way easier with a map. Um, there's dual coding theory, which also talks about how information is processed um, and stored differently, so you're, you're balancing the weight, um, the effort one takes. And one field that really draws upon these is knowledge visualization. So knowledge visualization goes one step further than data visualization, one step further than information visualization, and it looks at the whole process of knowledge transfer. From sender receiver, there's different contexts, and what happens when these things change? What's hap what happens when you combine different visualization approaches together? So we thought this was pretty cool, and we said, okay, what happens if we apply this to an ethics framework? So one particular kind of uh, documents we are interested in in our research um, are policy documents or policy uh, or guidelines or ethics frameworks with respect to data sharing in medicine and healthcare. So what we took is we took the ethics framework from the Swiss Personalized Health Network um, for responsible data processing and data sharing and thought, well, let's see what we can do with that. So this document is like uh, most traditional documents, just a PDF, it's available online, it's already quite good, but still it's a, it's a PDF, there are no links inside the PDF even, um, you can download it, but otherwise it's, it's still a document. So this document has a diverse audiences. Um, it's not just the researchers, but it's also the participants that participate in the study, uh, we have the institutions where the research is conducted, where the data is collected, and also we have the general public. Because in the end, if people don't trust in what we do, people will not give our data uh, for, for research, their data for research. Um, so we thought we need to translate this document, which is really just in a, in a linear form, all the information is there in one specific form, and prepare it for, for the audiences uh, this document actually wants to address. So. Our aim was we want people to engage actually in these ethics frameworks and not just researchers that have to because they're part of this um, Swiss Personalized Health Network, uh, but also like the general public and, and the data subjects. We want to communicate, of course, the content of this document, but we also want to educate all the audiences about the, the process um, that is really complex when it comes to uh, this whole um, data gathering, data processing, data sharing, and so on. And um, last but not least, we really want to make this document accessible to everyone. So we developed a method, which is basically we take this document, we analyze the content of this document, which is not like structured data, we don't have uh, quantitative data, it's all text. So we need to analyze actually the content, we need to translate it in something that we can use for the visualization. Then we test different visualizations, we evaluate the visualizations and finally we develop an interactive visualization which should ideally convey the same content that is present in the document. 
So more specifically, um, we went into the document, we did uh, open coding to identify what kind of knowledge is actually there in this document. Um, we then grouped this code into themes, into sub-themes actually uh, first. So basically if we have, for example, the revoke of uh, revoking consent or withdrawing of consent, this is very similar, so we put it into the same sub-theme. Um, and then we went further and we took like, okay, uh, withdrawal of consent and for the use of data is actually all a part of this consent process. So we had another, add another uh, layer, which is the themes layer. So that we really get out of this text um, structured data. So we know now which part of the document link um, to each other. But furthermore, we could also identify stakeholders also through inductive content analysis and the re relationships between stakeholders, between the themes, the sub-themes. And last but not least, the document originally was organized by four ethical principles. So of course, we could also include these principles then into this uh, distillation of, of knowledge, basically. So in the next step, uh, we tried out different visualizations. Uh, we ended up with these four candidates, <laughs> which is uh, an alluvial diagram, just graphics, maybe that's enough, concept maps, and a system map. But to know which of these visualizations was the best one actually for the content, we then asked experts to evaluate these visualizations to really see which of these visualizations draws attention at first but also which of these visualizations gives the context necessary to see why this is relevant. So why is the content in the visualization relevant um, for, for all the members in the audience actually? Uh, but also it should give an overview of the whole document, of the whole information there, not just a specific view. But of course also it should convey enough detail <laughs> that people get actually what they need to do out of the visualization. And last but not least, it should actually give options to act. So not like maybe a document where you read and end up, okay, so now what? So this visualization should really uh, actually offer options to, to go and apply the knowledge learned through the visual visualization in practice. But of course there were shortcomings because a visualization is just one picture basically. Uh, it can convey a lot of information, but it's hard to translate the whole document into one visualization. So what we did is we did rapid prototyping, we used rapid prototyping to actually develop this visualization into an interactive visualization. So we added features. So we did uh, quite a few uh, um, iterations through this rapid prototyping process where we added features in a web tool. And then we tested again what we developed. Uh, we went back, it's quite similar to what we've heard before <laughs> in the presentation before. Uh, and in the end, we actually ended up with a website where you can go and interact with this interactive visualization that now hopefully conveys all the information present in the original document. So we'll just give you a quick demo of how it works. Um, so first I need you to imagine that you're a health researcher. We're going to take that perspective. And you're doing research with Fitbit data. So the first thing I do when I'm on the website is I, I decide, okay, what perspective am I taking? I'm taking the re researcher perspective. So I click the button. And then I see 11 different chapters which kind of will guide me around the map. So the first one, okay, what data and samples? And then I see, okay, I need to define what, what am I actually using in my research? And then there's some definitions here. Okay, health related, okay, data not conventionally associated with medical research. That's Fitbit data, definitely. Um, for a definition, just to be sure, I click on the node, which I don't think you can read, um, <laughs> but health data, and then here I get a definition. Okay, perfect. Now step two, what laws should I be focused on? Or what laws should I be aware of? I go to the next chapter. And so in this way, I can explore the map either going by the, the chapters at the top or by deciding to explore autonomously through the node connections. Um, there are other features of this tool that I won't go into, such as Zoom, such as um, highlighting the ethical principles themselves. Um, but we invite you to also use the tool and explore it yourself and give us feedback. So basically um, what we have now, what we've seen now uh, in the end, is we had this document that was pu purely text and we managed to put it uh, into an interactive uh, graph. Uh, it was possible to um, see, for example, everything that relates to data 
through the map and not we have to scan through the whole document ourselves to see what's actually there. Um, but we could connect parts of the information within this tool, uh, give it from the researcher's pers perspective, but maybe also from the uh, participant, the institution, and so So we can really start to tailor content. Um, but, I mean, what's beyond this SPHN framework? So the framework you've seen is particular to Switzerland, maybe not that interesting for you, but the methodology um, we can apply actually to all kind of documents. So basically, every text document we can go and distill the, the knowledge within the document into uh, a knowledge graph first, and then really go through the process to end up with an interactive visualization. So basically there is a broad range of applications for, for this method. What we have here is just the beginning, it's still a prototype, um, so it's, it's not done yet, it's not perfect yet, uh, and that's why we also build now this transformation tool actually, so we build a tool to uh, implement this process so that everyone can go uh, upload the document, go through the process, and end up with a <laughs> visualization that fits the document. Um, and we also want to do, we, we did, of course, some user testing through, uh, well, during the rapid prototyping, but also um, in the end, but we really want to do an evaluation study as well, so really to see how does this new kind of presentation of this content compare to the original document and see how the knowledge transfer um, well, if it's really supported by, by what we do here, to also get some scientific evidence to back this up. So, as John already said, if you want to try it out, it's online. Um, feel free to go there. <laughs> it's not really smartphone optimized. <laughs> so maybe do it later with your computer, but uh, thank you. I'd be happy to take questions. Thank you both so much. Ah, we have a question right here, Benjamin. Uh, any other questions? Keep your hands raised so we know where to go to next. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, excellent work. Uh, my question is the expert review. I was wondering, did you do the expert review using um, domain experts or visualization experts and how the expert review was conducted? So we did both. <laughs> um, we had the, the domain experts, um, the people who had originally written the document, we brought it back to them and said, okay, which of these visualization um, approaches actually conveys what you had originally intended with the document? Um, and their review was basically that as much detail as possible, they were really afraid of um, simplifying the document and losing detail. Um, and then we did another round of expert review with more um, with four experts with experience in copy editing, with user experience, um, with design and UX design. So we did a dual approach. I think there might be one more question from the lady who asked before. Yeah. If anyone else would like to afterwards, okay, just send it across. <laughs> uh, thank you so much for the presentation. Uh, I'm still from the parliament. And uh, my question is about, uh, so it's, it's very interesting approach. So do you apply this approach or plan to apply to other ethical documents or to any other kind of documents? If there is, probably you know better, if there is something already in the m on the market, and what is your uh, feature comparing to other tools? What is the difference? And what is uh, the future of this project? Thank you. So yes, we're definitely uh, going to apply this methodology to, to other documents. Um, of course, we are mostly focusing on, on health and medicine related stuff since we're doing bioethics. Um, but there's tons of documents <laughs> in our area. So um, yes, we're going to try to see if this fits also other kind of documents. Um, so also the methods, um, although it's kind of general, of course, like uh, the domain experts uh, are very specific to that kind of document. But we think um, we can pretty good generalize um, this methodology, but we definitely want to try that um, on other documents. So in our field, it's not that common actually to have interactive uh, tools to convey ethics frameworks uh, or uh, yeah, to communicate uh, policy documents. Um, so there's not much competition specifically to our case. Um, but one thing that definitely makes us kind of unique is that we really go uh, back to the original documents. It's not just about visualization, it's really about um, how can we produce a tool that helps researchers uh, really apply, for example, the, the guidelines in the document. But also to help people understand what's happening. 
Um, so it's not just a visualization of content. Uh, it's really uh, supposed to be a support tool. Um, and so we very, uh, so we pay a lot of attention that really it's, it's complete and it should support as much uh, the audience as possible. Um, so yeah, kind of we're trying to tailor every document to every use case. So this is definitely unique in our field there. Yeah. I think we have another question on the same row. Hello, uh, Bogdan Miku from Eurostat. Have you uh, considered building a tool to be used by the producer of this kind of documents so that their output is something, uh, uh, an interactive and uh, knowledge structured one like the one you produced? Yes, so the tool I mentioned in the very um, end, so this transformation tool, for, for now, um, basically it's for us to test um, if we actually can put this, this method into, implement this method into a, a tool. And this is exactly um, meant to, to be public at some point, so that everyone can go there uh, and, well, so the producers of the document can go there, uh, upload the document, and also, sim well, as simple as possible, develop this kind of interactive visualization um, to complement the document. I mean, the document is important on its own as well. Um, but of course, uh, yeah, for some use cases, the document is not enough. So yes, this is our intention in the future. We have, sorry, wanted you to follow that up? We have one more question. I should learn your name because you're quite active in the question, Marina. You're very kind, thank you very much. And my name is Matthew. Matthew, thank you, Matthew. So um, why have a document at all? Why not just go, take all the knowledge from the subject matter experts and turn it into this interactive, explorer-friendly online tool? Because nobody's going to read the document. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Documents, um, the cultural practice of, or the cultural practice of communication in policy making and in ethics, um, I think we have a long time before we move away totally from a document. Um, I think, for instance, the fact that there are so many documents already put online with no hyperlinking, um, this transition to the, the digital space, I think is going to take a while with policy documents. And I agree there, are, yeah, I agree. But it's an interest, it's a cultural shift that is beyond, yeah. There are many aspects. <laughs> don't know if that answers your question, but. Yeah, I'll just give you. you what, to, uh, to what extent can actually automatic indexation or, or machine learning help Simon. you somehow to, to go through this mass of documents? Because if I understand well, until now, it's more or less a domain expert doing that manually. So it's a, it's a process of months and revision, etc. Is there a way somehow to, I don't know, neural networks, whatever, to, to get this done quicker? Yes, so um, there's a way it's called topic modeling. Um, it's exactly we use machine learning to uh, automatically identify the topics present. Um, and this is something we were experimenting um, around. So basically we start now with doing it manually to see if the approach works at all. Uh, but parallel we already started not with this particular document but with others to use exactly topic modeling to do, is, to do it automatically. Because ideally we can just put in the document that it will spit out uh, visualization five minutes later. Um, but um, unfortunately, natural language processing is um, not there yet <laughs> to do it perfectly. Um, so yes, we're working on that one. We, oh, there's, there's so many questions. We have, we have, I will allow time for one more question. So I'm, I'm sorry, ladies, it, it's between the two of you. And I'm sure they'll be free to talk to you afterwards. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Uh, thank you, I'm sorry. <laughs> so you were, a little bit pessimistic, maybe, to put it <laughs> in a negative context. And Matthew asked, why use a document at all? But in this process, do you see researchers and economists and legal people change their minds, even if it's just a little bit? So are they pleasantly surprised? Yes, completely. I mean, um, one of the things is that we have more and more, well, we have increasingly less time. Um, so the moment that you present um, an overview or another way to engage that motivates engagement with a topic that, I mean, these documents get repeatedly updated. Um, so we always get positive feedback from um, policymakers and from people in the field um, because they, they don't see often visuals with frameworks. Um, 
I find that funny because the word framework for me is a visual and I'm like, why are there not more visuals here? <laughs> Um, but yes, I think that it has a long way to go, but it, it's going, it's moving. I mean, more and more we see visuals in these documents and we see um, frameworks too. And um, basically we are part of the health ethics and policy lab. And obviously since we can do that research, there are some policy makers that definitely believe um, in this kind of uh, <laughs> if approach. And yeah, we see positive feedback as well. And we see that people start to think about, um, well, think out of the box outside the document. Basically. Thank you both so much. Thank you for the talk, and I'm sure there are, there are plenty more questions which are, are just cropping up now, and, and you can follow it up later on with a meeting if you just uh, use the app on your phone. Next, we'd like to invite to the stage. Absolutely. Arnold, Arnold Platon, our next speaker, and you are actually originally from Romania, now living in France, and independent, which means you have a very open mind, public, private, can work with anybody. Actually, an architect by trade, working in 3D infrastructure design in France, but the, your latest mapping project was actually with Dizait. So your title of the talk is European Union Elections, the case for a harmonized treatment of European election data. Hello, my name is Arnold Platon. I'm a data visualization freelancer, and I'm here to share with you what I've learned creating the most detailed map of the European elections ever. So, when elections happen, news sites use maps to quickly show the results or show patterns in the vote. We see, for example, in the United States when there are elections, a lot of maps such as these from the New York Times, the Washington Post, and even publications from outside the, the US, such as The Guardian. They vary in style, subject matter, they can be presidential votes, congressional votes, presidential primaries, and they approach the vote in, from different angles. We see the same thing when other big democracies vote. Uh, for example, India, here on the left, the single largest vote in the, in the world, with over one billion voters. We see beautiful maps when Brazil goes to the poll. This is from Gazeta do Povo for the first um, round of the presidential elections they just had. But when elections happen in the European Union, and they are the second largest elections in the world, with over 400 million eligible voters, we often get maps like these. These one country, one color maps simplify the vote to the extreme. You get to see the whole union, but not too much detail. Alternatively, we see these kinds of maps. When a news publication only focuses on the member state they're from. So El Diario does a map of the Spanish vote, ignores the other countries, and uh, Le Monde does a cartography of the French vote, but not, it doesn't look at the, the other countries in the Union. Something is missing. A map which combines the best of both worlds. A pan-EU look, but on a detailed level. These are the only two examples of the kind. The one on the left is a personal project I did with the data from the 2014 elections. It took about six months of on and off work, while the one on the right is, the, is a collaboration I did with uh, Julius Troger and Zeit Online in June 2019 for this year's European elections. It's the first time an online newspaper published such a map of the European elections. Here it is in full screen. Apologies for cutting off Sweden and Finland. Um, what you see is almost 80,000 administrative units 
mostly municipalities. It is a historic first. But why did it take such a long time for somebody to, to create these maps? Well, the problem is that there is no harmonized data to an EU format, done either by national or EU authorities. So basically what this means is that news sites use data they are already familiar with, they use data they know as a format from parliamentary elections from their own countries, from presidential elections, and only use that and ignore the, re the rest of the union. Basically what happens is 28 member states doing 28 different things. And I encountered this a lot while doing my maps. For example, you would expect that election data be published on the new site of the, of, on the website of the voting authority of that country. Sometimes it is, sometimes it isn't. Sometimes it's pu published on an open data portal. And sometimes you get it from a private website. Uh, you would expect the data to be easily downloaded. But sometimes it isn't. And when it wasn't, I, was, I had to write a small program for each time to download, to go through the web page and download the data. And this is easy if it's a simple HTML site, but uh, today a lot, of new, a lot of websites use complicated JavaScript, which makes scraping the, the data even harder. And usually when you, when you download the data, it's an Excel file or a CSV file, which are easy to, to use. But sometimes it can be a more complicated XML file, uh, which for someone who is not familiar with can, can be quite a headache. The data also changes based on the type of voting the countries use. So most countries use list systems, although there are variations in each. Notably, for example, in Luxembourg, each person gets six votes. But on the other hand, there are countries or regions such as Ireland, Northern Ireland and Malta that use the use a so-called single transferable vote. It's a ranked system. And the problem is that with this system, you don't get municipality level data because the, the data is first aggregated and then counted. Voting abroad. This is another subject that complicates the data. Sometimes the data is assigned to the address where the voter is from, usually when it's postal voting. Sometimes it's a separate category, voting abroad. And sometimes when it's, for example, voting in embassies, it gets added to the, na to the capital of the country, it, so it skews the data from the nation's capital. And even if the, the data is available for do download, and even if it's a simple Excel file, the, the data might not be georeferenced with the relevant municipality codes. So l municipality codes, which are called local administrative unit codes in, uh, by Eurostat, uh, help attach the data to the, to the map's shape file. But if this code is missing and you only have, for example, the name of the, of the municipality, you can run into a lot of problems. For example, if there are spelling differences, if there are accents missing, or... Uh, and for example, if it's municipalities in bilingual areas, so you might have one data set where you have the national name of the municipality and another data set where you have the local regional name of the municipality. So something, something needs to happen, something needs to change because it's too, it's too complicated to have 28 member states doing 28 different things. So I, w this is what I think could be done about it because something should be done about it. So, one possibility would be a top-down policy. So it's a hard policy of mandating that, sh that each member state publish a version of the data that, is, that follows a, s a s predetermined format. The advantage is that everybody does the same thing. The disadvantage is that 28 member states need to agree what that format is, so it might take some time. The second is what I call the bridge. So nations publish their own version of the data as before. 
Uh, and the new institution, let's say Eurostat, publishes a harmonized version, thus bridging the gap between the member states and the third parties that want to use the data. So the advantage is that this happens centrally, but Eurostat needs to keep up with each country's changes. And the third one is just publishing a simple nation-by-nation -nation guide. So Eurostat just details how, how to access and process the, harm, uh, process the data. This is obviously the most cost-effective solution, and it has minimal intervention from the EU. But the disadvantage is, is that third parties do the harmonizing, and this can lead itself to, to variability and accuracy of the final product. So, so one solution needs to be, needs to be implemented. There, there's, this, there's need for this data. We have already been contacted by national and EU institutions for, for, uh, for the data we, ha we have harmonized. And beyond that, we are a s by voting together, we are a single political space. But although we do not see ourselves as such, because sometimes we are not represented as, as such in the media. This is where DataVis comes in. Uh, if we have access to harmonized data, we will use that data. And we will see more visualizations get made, and we will see ourselves represented more as a single European community. Thank you. Thank you so much. It was very inspiring, in fact. And Thank have you. we any questions for Arnold? Any questions at all? One question again. <laughs> I must learn your name also, along with Matthews. Thank you. Um, it's very nice, uh, and I can imagine the amount of work you did in order to get there. Yes, it was <laughs> very right. challenging. Uh, I have a question. Uh, you, you probably know about the uh, um, European Commission actions on interoperability and uh, ESA uh, project program. Mm -hmm. uh, since you were talking about possible uh, ways of further development, what do you think about this program? How do you estimate uh, their efforts and if uh, it has uh, uh, implication um, for you? Unfortunately, I'm not very, very uh, well knowledgeable about the, the interoperability uh, program. So. Would you like to tell us a little yes. bit more? They're uh, actually one of the main sponsors the for Parliament. this event. Uh, <laughs> so I'm not responsible for this project, and uh, but the Commission makes a lot of efforts to um, stimulate public institutions to make their data interoperable. Mm -hmm. And uh, so th I think this project will be ended in 2020, and there is a future of the project. And they collect the a contribution from public institutions and from experts on what can be improved and how this project can help uh, to address all these kind of problems. Okay. Thank well, you. what I what I think needs to happen first is that everybody publish that this data. There are there are member states that don't actually publish the data in a format that you can download it. You have it in a pretty site. Everybody can check out their region or their municipality, but if you want to get all the data, you cannot. So the, I think the first, first, first thing is everybody to publish it. And then to look into to a way in which the data is more or less aligned to certain, certain uh, guidelines. So defining certain concepts in the data, because you do have 28 member states who each have elections in different ways, even if they might seem similar. There are small details that when you have to harmonize the data, you have a lot of questions about what, what might be the best option. So this is, but having the data out there and having more people who are confronted with it and say, this is the problem we're getting into and having maybe a feedback mechanism to the EU, to the EU or the member states might help in, in moving this along. Whilst the microphone gets to, m oh, we have, <laughs> we have another question. So, uh, as I said, I'm from Eurostat, so I'm kind of familiar with the process behind of uh, these kind of things. Uh, I'm, 
I don't have a question. I have a couple of comments related to your bridge solution. Yes. Uh, which more or less uh, fits the way Eurostat already does the, okay. the, the things. So we basically collect the data from the member states in various formats, not always harmonized, not always in, as we, we expect them to be, but we manage to put them together. So we have plenty of experience and we could do this. But in order to do it, uh, such a project should become part of the Eurostat mandate, okay. which is not for the moment. Fair and enough. Uh, I guess we'll not allocate resources for an interesting, but not, I dare to say, not so important project. Okay. A way of uh, this becoming part of the Eurostat mandate, which I personally would like to see happening, would be, for example, to start a citizen initiative, uh, uh, how is it called, for, for the parliament to adopt a regulation making uh, publication of electoral uh, or uh, European parliamentary data. elections data part of the Eurostat mandate. So if you want, you can start it today, <laughs> I guess. <laughs> that would be interesting. But I, I want to come back to your point that maybe it's not that important. Uh, there is interest in this data, even in, in the European institutions. So the Joint Research Center, for example, one of the units there, contacted Site Online for this data. They were very interested in the 2004 and 2019 data, especially because you can see uh, changes. And what I didn't mention in the presentation, because it, it, it was a detail, that having this data then permits other kind of data sets to be attached to it and like map in a really fine detail, like social attitudes. There is what it's called the Chapel Hill Expert Survey. Uh, there was the one done with all European uh, countries in 2014 with basically all uh, relevant political parties where they, where they mapped how left, right, socially conservative, pro-EU, anti-EU, and a lot of other metrics for each, uh, for each uh, party. And then you can go into, the, into each municipality and map, based on the vote, how Eurosceptic, how left, right each municipality is. And then you can maybe do research, I don't know, I'm sure the European Union does a lot of research on various topics. So, this could be this could be used to further answer questions and no <laughs> I think one, one point which I would like to bring forward in this context is I, uh, until December last year I was running the open data portal of the of the European Commission okay. and I must say I'm surprised I didn't even know that those data don't exist I find it actually quite uh, quite outrageous that actually not in the same format from from a, from a publishing point of view and I think it's unknown on a political level that, that uh, they are not compatible. Okay. So um, I think that's something which has to be also to be signaled more uh, strongly from a, point, from a political point of view to bring those data together. At okay. least for, for me, it's something uh, to the to-do list. I want to see how it <laughs> how can be followed up. One more point here. I would like just to support the importance of this project because uh, we uh, in the parliament during the elections created a new project, What Europe Does For Me. Mm -hmm. And we tried to show for each small region, uh, depending on this um, yes. uh, cartography, what exactly Europe does. And a lot of MEPs were using this uh, website in order to show this is what Europe does yes. for, for this particular region. And the overview for the complete Europe, it only helps to promote the Europe. If yeah. you'll keep it uh, for each country separately, we will never communicate this message that we do for complete Europe. So I think the work you do is very important and the Europe has to do more of it in this direction. <laughs> Thank you. If you can make it very, very quick. Um, hi, I'm from the European Central Bank. Um, have you thought about contacting uh, national uh, governments and showing your data to them? Because I think it would be very useful to see the 
to show them the, the rise of extreme right and extreme left in Europe? I haven't thought about contacting them. I contacted the election authorities when I was first looking for the data in several countries because I either didn't find the data or it was in a format that I thought maybe they have a better format. I got some res responses from some election authorities, some others less so, but I, I tried to do it to see how hard it is if you're alone and uh, you are looking for this data. So I, I haven't gone into contact, but now seeing that there's interest, maybe, maybe the, this is something I, I, I'm going to th think about to, to promote it. Because Thank you so much for your talk. Thank it's you. really inspired a lot of people. Thank you very much. And the final talk for this session, please welcome to the stage Lorenzo Isella, a statistical physicist by background, now part of the Chief Economist Unit at the European Commission's Directorate General, Ge Directorate General for Trade, with the talk entitled European and International Trade Summary for Cabinet Briefings. Thank you. Okay, welcome to everybody, and thanks for um, listening to my presentation. I would like, before starting, to give a little bit of background of the organization I work for, for those that are not super familiar with the European Commission. I work for the Director General of Trade, which is a policy DG, which deals with everything related to trade. Perhaps our most uh, conspicuous product are the free trade agreements. The shorthand for that is FTAs, which essentially liberalize the trade flows between the European Union and third countries. This may sound abstract, but just to make an example, in a recently concluded FTA is between the European Union and South Korea. Suppose that before that you had bought a car imported for, from South Korea with a value of 20,000 euros. Finally, you would have paid around 22,000 euros due to import duties on that car because typically it's a cost which is not absorbed by the importer, but it's passed on practically entirely to the consumer. After negotiating a free trade agreement, this is all gone, so you finally only pay for the import value of the car. And I talk about that because they will play a role in, uh, in the rest of the presentation. Um, Actually, we're supposed to cover big amount of material with, which does not fit in the 10 minutes that I have. So that's why we have a section about supplementary material for those of you who are interested and can later on find uh, some um, extra explanations about what I'm going to talk. And we really are going to talk about two different products. Uh, one which is a fish, essentially you can think about a PDF, a document, which often we attach to meetings or we give to internal colleagues, which summarizes some aspects of international trade. And the other product is an infographic visualization, which is on our DG Trade website, which has a different purpose. It can be addressed to policymakers, but it, of, it is also, also often mentioned in our presentation, even to the general public, essentially to show the geolocation of companies, even small and medium enterprises, which, which benefit from uh, free trade agreements, to mm, fight against the narrative that only if you are Amazon, Google, Apple, a huge company, you can benefit from the uh, negotiated agreements of the European uh, Union. When we talk about uh, trade, typically we have uh, some recurring questions, for instance, essentially three types of questions. So trade is about how much quantities of imports and exports. Then you want to know to some detail which products are being traded. And then also you want to know what are your most important trade partners. So to make it a, a long story short, trade statistics is a lot about how much what and with whom. Trade is typically represented as import or, or exports of products. Sometimes you will talk about the sum of the two as total trade. And when we talk about trade, we also have three main categories of trade. We have trade of merchandise. That's the easiest one to understand. We sell and buy cars, fridges, computers, laptops, this kind of stuff. We have trade in services, financial services also, which go from one country or another, can be considered as trade. And then we have investments. The fact that, for instance, a Dutch company may acquire stock in the US or the other way around. It could be a, a US company which invests in Europe. So the idea is that by combining the questions about trade with the kind of 
trade that we have, so questions one, two, and three with the trade in uh, categories A, B, and C, we can essentially try to represent international trade as a matrix of uh, infographics three by three. I'll make some examples for instance. Let's say that uh, we ask the question, how much? So we pick up question one, does the U trade in merchandise? So for instance, after trying different visualizations, we discover that uh, um, a couple of time series for import and export satisfy usually our colleagues, so we can see trends over time, and we can see, for instance, that imports and exports of products in the case of the U28 are always reasonably close, in particular in recent years, so essentially the trade balance of the European Commission is zero to, allow to a very good approximation. The value of the imports is almost equivalent to the values of the exports. Another example of question that we can ask, another combination is, with whom does the U trade in services? In order to do that, uh, to answer that, we take the most recent year for which we have data, unfortunately, 2017, and we have a breakdown of the total imports and exports of trade, of, of the trading services of the European Union with its main partners. So we see, for instance, the prominent role by the United States in all of these, Switzerland, China, and so on. This is often uh, valuable information for the policymakers, for which, of course, realistically speaking, the quantitative information is important, but it's only one, let's say, of the um, elements to be taken into consideration because there is also an important, if we want, diplomatic and um, um, dimension for the free trade agreements that are, that are negotiated. To give you an idea of what uh, the fish looks like, this will be a little bit difficult to read, we focused mostly on the description of the first page, which is the one that you see on the left, which is the three by three matrix for merchandise, services, and uh, foreign investments. If you magnify it, you will see that if you are, uh, the format is uniform. So if you can read one column or one, um, one uh, row of this matrix, essentially you are capable of reading the all of it. On the second page of the, of the fish, but we're not going too much into this detail right now, we rather show some uh, the evolution of the mm, shares of trade of the European Union versus in, in time versus its main competitors, Japan, China, the United States. I'm not going too much into the details of the second part of the fish. You will find it in the supplementary information or if you have questions, it can be debated after the presentation. So this is a product which is essentially for internal purposes, for policymakers and our colleagues for meetings involving people of uh, different kind of seniority. Sometime, there is another, let's say, initiative, and this is more in terms of communication of results uh, that we do at Digitrade. It goes under the name FTA comes to town. So the free trade agreements come to town in the sense that showing how the negotiated agreements are not abstract, but they can impact a lot of even small companies close to you. So if you go on the Digitrade website, on the presentation, you can click on the links so and you will be directed there. You have an overview of the latest uh, negotiated agreements. One of the last ones is the one between EU and Japan. And um, what we can see is, for instance, an infographics of all the companies that, for instance, export or do trade with Japan. This is actually a subset of the companies that volunteer this information. And so you can see how pretty much all over Europe is covered by companies they do in trade with Japan. They could be even, for instance, in Belgium, small companies exporting chocolate to Japan, other companies exporting pottery. It's a lot, it's, um, a lot of products. You don't need, as I said, to be just Google to benefit from that. And typically, when we go, when this presentation is, or a presentation is delivered, no matter what in Europe, because you see that this is covered everywhere in Europe, you typically focus on the area of the presentation, in this case is Luxembourg, you cannot really go into excruciating detail about the geographical location of the presentation for matters of privacy, but you see that even close to you, pretty much wherever you are in Europe, there is somebody that benefits, that benefits from that. So to make a long story short and conclusion, we talk about two different products because they address which <coughs> Two audiences which may not coincide, one is more technical, the other one is more on the communication side. 
in terms of the of the fish we also use uh, open source and sustainable data typically we rely a lot on data which is provided by Eurostat so uh, we have some data sets for instance for the investments other data sets for uh, um, services and we use above all uh, COMEXT for the EU trade data the mm, script the mm, fish is produced uh, without almost manual intervention we use typically R, mm, ggplot2, which is a visualization system, and LaTeX. So we run a set of scripts to produce the fish. This ensures that it can be updated in a pain-free way, if we want. And the reason why also I'm talking here is that I have a very competent um, audience about visualization and communicating policies and so on. So we really like to have your feedback on either product. And as we say, last but not least, thanks for listening to me. Thank you so much. And to keep us to time, we have got some time for questions. Just about five minutes or so. Anybody would like to ask a question? Yes, yeah, I, I have to allow you to go first because you didn't get the chance last time. A quick question. Who is your main audience for, for these visualizations and uh, how do you check whether you actually have an impact of your own, on your audience? That's a, that's a very good question. So for the case of the, um, let's say, DigiTrade, uh, DigiTrade website, sometimes you have to rely on essentially the speaker who goes around, uh, talks about trade, for instance, or negotiated FTAs, shows it, and it's a little bit also his or her gut feeling about how this presentation was, uh, was received and so on. About, uh, uh, about the fish, uh, once again, it depends. That is to say, in some cases it is shared in advance, okay, as a um, quantitative aid to policy makers or to colleagues in general, so you know in advance if this is useful or not. In other cases, it may be attached as a last minute document to meetings, and once again, afterwards you get feedback uh, about whether you know, it was used, it was part of the meeting, etc., etc. In some cases, we really reach out after to have uh, um, to have feedback and also for us it's very important to know if for instance some of these visualizations were not clear were not uh, readable were uh, misleading and so on and so forth we have to take nowadays it looks a little bit easy when you tell the story but for instance we had a lot of debates about whether we should give the absolute volumes of trades or the share of trades for instance and this also it was a sort of hit and miss depending on the level of misunderstanding, potential for confusion when, when the fish was released. So this went already through different uh, iteration. I could say that if it is mostly, let's say, my brainchild in terms of coding, for instance, the fish, then it collected, let's say, a lot of feedback internally from my, the statistical team of my unit and from the economist of my unit and then from other people before arriving to a stabilized format. We have uh, two questions here and then one question with the lady there, so that I think that will cover it before lunch. Lisa, thank you. I'll be very brief. I'm Paul Offines. I'm the president of the Lisbon Council, and I'll be speaking a little bit later today. Lorenzo, that, that was fascinating. And you slipped in there very quietly something I hadn't seen yet today, which is microdata. Uh, there was some firm-level data that you showed that was really quite interesting. I wanted to ask you about that. Where are you getting that data from? How are you collecting it? And what, in general, are the implications for using data of that type? Uh, this is very important for a lot of reasons. I mean, we tend to look at the economy from a macro level, and quite often it doesn't tell the whole story. Uh, if you really want to tell the story, you need to build it from the bottom up. And I was, was very interested in what you were doing uh, with that in your presentation. Thank you. Yeah, unfortunately, but I I'll, uh, I'll can get in touch with you after the presentation, okay. etc. I'm not, in, I'm not in, let's say, in the machinery of the collection of this microdata. I think it comes from uh, some... Um, how can I say, some statistical collection, but it's voluntary data which is provided. So what we also Sorry. have to say yeah. is that it's what we show now is always we have to bear in mind a subsample. So the reality is that the impact for in particular small and medium enterprises in terms of numbers of companies is actually higher, certainly significantly higher than what we can see, which in any case typically impresses positively, positively the audience. It is true that probably this data, that's also why we want to discuss it, is still a little bit undermined 
it's possible that more could be done at some point, at some point with this data. Of course, we always have the problem of limited resources available because, for instance, also my unit answers does not do only that. My, my say the team I work for answers a number of other statistical statistical questions. So this is a project which goes on together with many others, but certainly point taken. We have another question. I'll allow Harold to another question. We have a question here, followed by the lady with the scarf, and then Harold. Hi, yes. Um, so, very interesting, and I was comparing it to the presentation we got earlier about the growth lab, the Harvard growth lab. So, um, I guess you have maybe from, from, from this director general uh, a lot of domain knowledge, and it seems now that your visualizations are mainly exploratory. So, have you thought about also including more, more narratives and more explanatory visualizations, for example, on this fish or on your materials? Yes, but so far, let's say that we have a sort of a, mm, at least so far, what we see is more providing, let's say, quantitative information, okay, to policymakers. It's not directly my unit which does, let's say, the policy, the policy for that. On top of that, let's say that some of these data and other data are used for different analytical products, which are notes that you can download from the website of the chief economist unit, which is, which is my unit. It's true that more probably could go from, uh, let's say, traditional reports to visualization. This is, an this is an ongoing process. But let's say there is definitely more on the analytical side, on the analysis of data, above all ex post of free trade agreements than you can see here. If you go, well, we can discuss this afterwards bilaterally. And the final question from Harold. She's actually suggested not this time. <laughs> If I may, can I go back to our first presentation, if any way, to still hear? She's something. here. Um, and again, the theme of this session, I'm, my, my name is Harold Selms from the Publications Office. The theme of this uh, session is uh, oriented towards policy makers, but I'm very curious whether your uh, Harvard Atlas of Economic Complexity, w among uh, whether you're getting increasing demand or, or you're taking initiative to explain this to the general public, because much of this information is so complex, it's already difficult for policymakers to decipher and understand, but there's so much confusion among the general public, and do you see that this could be evolved into uh, a tool, a mechanism for explaining policies to the general public? Sure. I bet everyone who spoke has the same challenge, um, but I'll speak about it, how, how we think about it. So yes, it's, it's a huge challenge that we try to address, which is this is a tool primarily for the policymaking community, but increasingly more relevant for journalists. I, actually, policymaking and academic, I would say, but we notice journalists using it more um, and, and the general population. And so we always ask ourselves, to what extent are we making this material accessible to lots of people? Um, and I think at some point, we do have to resign to the reality that the, that the subject matter requires sort of a baseline understanding of economics, current events, trade. Um, we can't, I, I don't think there's a world where it's, we can, we can make it um, accessible to absolutely everybody. So for us, it's, it's um, really about defining a core group of users and then trying our best to expand it from there. But I think we always will have to realize that there's a baseline knowledge we expect a user to have. Would you like to follow up as well, Lorenzo? Then? Yeah, I mean, I think she said it very, very clearly. Unfortunately, um, there is no royal road, let's say, to present, to present this data. Um, certainly, you know, for instance, in, in the case of this fish, et cetera, we have in mind a certain, com a certain community where people, let's say, well-versed into trade issues who may not be trade statisticians, let's say, may not have a quantitative background. So it could be, for instance, a lawyer or a negotiator and so on, and that's already a challenge, okay? So in terms of the, um, communicating these results really to the average layman, it's really tough. Probably you have to, in any case, define a little bit your audience and define and certainly restrict the message that you want, that you want to pass. Uh, 
it's a never ending it's a never ending exercise as important as it can be i'm not aware of a, really a silver bullet for that i wish there was Thank you both so much, and thank you, Lorenzo, for this talk as well. It's now lunchtime. You can probably smell it already. Um, so just think about where you're going to be for the next session, which starts at 2 o'clock. I'll be here for the whole day. <laughs> thank you very much. Enjoy your lunch, and then as uh, just refer to the booklet for which room for, for 2 p.m. sessions. Alles klar.
doing the um, sharing of the it's not possible to do your own phone in the big lines. And what, uh, what my question was in the conference where we were blocking the actual lab, and we were wondering what tool did you use? Did you connect to that at some occasion? Or did you just leave that on the floor? Yeah.
Tony, do you have your presentation on a stick or you want uh, to use your own? Really? Because yeah. I cannot see it. Okay. Ah, you uploaded it? Yeah. In this folder? Using the link that you provided in URL? Mm. On my computer, okay. Good idea. Can you already do that? Okay, it might be better to put it directly straight on the computer. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I need to ah, put sorry. There <laughs> first. And Susan, uh, your presentation is working. Everything's there. So, um, so the microphone is on. Like this. Mm -hmm. Hold the microphone really close. That yeah. the hand here looks bad. I think this is very good. Okay. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's a big one. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, not very <laughs> complex. Yeah. It's not complex. Test. Is this is this is okay. Mm -hmm. This is would be not okay. No. This is okay. But they will also yeah. make it a bit louder. So yeah, okay. Let's not try.
Welcome back, everybody. Hopefully, you had a nice lunch, a little bit of relax, and time to chat to people. We've got four exceptional speakers this afternoon as well. The theme for this mini afternoon session is new ways to present reports. And we're starting with Tony from the World Bank. Tony, please join us on the stage for a, a talk entitled Open Data, Open Code, Open Knowledge Visualizing Development Data at the World Bank. Thank you, Tony. All right, thank you, Lisa. Good afternoon, everyone. So I'm Tony Fuge. I'm a data scientist in the World Bank uh, Development Data Group. And if you're not familiar with the World Bank Development Data Group, basically, we like to say that we do data from farm to table. And when I say that, I mean it uh, literally. We do everything from data collection uh, in the field all the way through uh, data collection, um, data visualization, and data dissemination and pretty much everything in between, with a common theme that we try to lower as much as possible the cost of using data. We try to make data easier to store, easier to understand, easier to find, easier to combine, easier to use. So today, I would like to discuss with you our experience putting together the 2018 Atlas of Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, how many of you are uh, familiar with the Sustainable Development Goals, the SDGs? Yeah. Okay, a lot of you. So basically, in a nutshell, this is the United Nations uh, framework um, to measure progress towards su sustainable development. And it measures uh, sustainable development across 17 main dimensions, including reducing poverty, clean water, climate change, uh, economic growth, or uh, reducing inequalities. And so this atlas of uh, SDGs contains about 180 uh, annotated visualization across those 17 um, dimensions of the SDGs. So before coming here, I made a quick uh, Google search about report examples. And what I got back is a bunch of pages with a lot of text, 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 uh, and then a few charts here and there, and then more text. And so it's not really surprising uh, if you ask me, if you tell me report and ask me to picture what I see, I'm probably going to picture something like this, a lot of pages and a lot of text. And this is also the kind of format that we all like because it's very exciting. Uh, when I go to work and I got this type of report on my desk, I'm ready to start my day. And so what we try to do uh, with the... Um, so a few things first. Uh, a few characteristics of this kind of report is that, as I just mentioned, there is a lot of text. The text comes first and the visuals come second in support of the text. And then finally, not as uh, obvious maybe, but the, the whole production process is completely hidden. What I mean by that is that if you open the report and look at a number or look at a chart, uh, there is no easy way for you to know how that number, how that chart was produced. So what we try to do uh, is completely put that typical report process on its head. I wanted to produce something that had a lot of visuals where the visuals would come first and the text would only come in support to those visuals. We wanted all also to make that report fully reproducible, completely open that uh, production process. And you can actually access all the code that was used to produce this report on the World Bank uh, GitHub repository. Okay, so now, now let me give you uh, a bit of context about why we decided to go this way. First, I think we wanted to innovate and experiment a little bit. I'm sure uh, this is the case for many of your organizations, but at the World Bank, we have a broader reflection process about how we can better uh, communicate information, how we ca can better disseminate our data. And so there are many ways to do that. Uh, but one of these the output of that broader reflection process was this um, SDG Atlas. Another aspect is that we really want to embrace transparency and reproducibility. Uh, back in 2010, we launched our first uh, open data initiative at the World Bank, and open data is the first step, but we can do much more in making all that process open and transparent. And I think now we have many more tools, open source software, tools like GitHub that allow us to share and be transparent in a much easier way. There is another aspect that is, may not be so obvious. That, that was also a way for us to be more efficient. 
when you produce a report, you put a lot of effort in producing that report, right? And at the end, all that effort is crystallized in that final output, which is your report. And then you're pretty much done. But we're thinking, okay, if we make that report completely reproducible, then maybe we can reuse, recycle part of this code, part of those tools, to update this report maybe two years down the line, or recycle part of it to share with colleagues in other departments of the World Bank, so they can re recycle and reuse those tools to produce uh, nice visualizations for their team. And finally, I think that was a nice challenge. Uh, that was the first time that the World Bank would produce fully in-house, fully based on open source so software, fully reproducible reports. And so that got uh, everyone pretty much excited. All right, but let's go to the heart of the matter and talk a little bit about our visualization approach. So as I mentioned, we wanted less text and more visuals. And so here you can see side by side the 2017 uh, Sustainable Development Goals Atlas and the 2018 one. So as you can see, there is no break. This is, you can clearly see that there is the same um, philosophy behind the, the visualizations uh, design here. However, if you open both those reports and you compare them side by side, you'll notice that in the 2017 one, there was some big chunk of text there that have completely disappeared from the 2018 one. And the reason for that is that now all those text is directly embedded into the charts. So let me tell you a bit more about this. We wanted each chart to be completely safe contained. And for that, we relied a lot about an, on annotations, very much inspired by the work of the Financial Times uh, that does an amazing job um, with this. Let me give you a concrete example. Here you see a chart, a typical chart, uh, with a title, subtitle, it has some colors, uh, it has a legend. So you could pretty much leave that chart uh, for the reader to interpret, right? But it, it, it would take some effort. Pretty much all the information is there, but it would definitely take some effort to really understand what's going on on that chart. So this chart is about um, CO2 emissions uh, with across and within uh, countries' income groups. So high income group, rich countries, and low income group, poor countries. And so what we did with the first annotation is help the reader interpret that chart. So for example here, the width of each block represents a country's population, while the height of each block represents uh, per capita emissions. And so the total area of each bar represents the country's total emission. So here with two lines of uh, well-targeted annotations, you can have a much better sense of what's going on on that chart. And then we use targeted annotations to bring, uh, to bring up the main storyline. So here the United States has nearly doubled the emissions per capita of China, which is the largest aggregate emitter. While India, whose population is similar to that of China, has much lower emissions per capita. So you see that no need for a chunk of text below that chart, with just a self-contained chart and a few well-targeted annotations, we're able to both help the reader digest the chart, digest the information, and also uh, highlight the main storyline. Another principle that we follow across uh, the SDG Atlas is the idea that simple is beautiful. All right, there is no need to overcomplicate if you can convey the main, your main message with a simple uh, data visualization and coding. So for example, this example here is a very simple visualization, a map with some circles. And each circle uh, area is, actual, is uh, proportional to aquaculture production. And here the message is very simple. China is the largest aquaculture producer. And the message really sticks and the, visualiz the, the visualization works because you can immediately see that big red dot in the middle of China. So no need for anything more complicated than that because the message is very simple, the visualization is very simple. Okay, so now let me talk about how we organize the storytelling across this report, right? Because we don't have any text to tie, any prose to tie those charts together, to tie the story together. So we needed to be very intentional in the way we combine those different charts to build a story. So let me show you how an example of that. Here you have a high-level world view of uh, particulate matter pollu pollution, PM 2.5, that gives you country-level country aggregates. 
And so here the annotations give you a bit of background about what PM 2.5 is, why this is dangerous, how it is being measured, etc. But then the next chart will immediately zoom in at the regional level. And here you can see that if aggregate level gave you a, a certain picture, then you have much more nuance at the local, at the regional level, where you see a lot of special variation. And we used again the text to tie the different charts together. So here this chunk of text says, whereas the map above shows a national average, this map shows local condition. Next, we drill down again, and we zoom in uh, to the temporal variation. Now. So now we, we zoom in onto this specific location that was on the previous map, which is Delhi. And we show that in this specific location, Delhi, which is a very, very, has a very high level of uh, particulate matter pollution, even in this location, the level of pollutions vary a lot across time. Right? You can see that in uh, certain months of the year, January, February, November, and December, you have very high level of contaminations. While in July, August, September, and June, those levels are not so high. So in a few charts, in three charts, and a few annotations, we're able to give a very strong uh, storyline by com combining them and drilling down at different level. And I want to highlight something else uh, that is not so much about visualization, but is about data. This kind of visualization is possible is only because we have disaggregated information about this data. All right? and when you think about measuring uh, the SDGs across those 17 dimensions of sustainable development, for many, many dimensions and for many, many indicators, we don't have that level of disaggregation for many of the data. All right, so let's come back to the, this idea of reproducibility. We wanted to open the, the black box of the production process. And so I want to touch briefly about the tools that we use for that. So the first, I want to mention open data, because none of this would be possible without open data. We often take open data for granted, uh, but I want to highlight really that the importance of, of open data, and I'm glad that uh, that came up this morning um, during the plenary sessions. Our Swiss army knife for producing all of this was R. Everything, everything you've, saw, uh, you've seen here has been produ produced using R. So everything from data ingestion, from data cleaning, data management, data transformation, and visualization has been done using R and ggplot2. How many of you are familiar with R? Can I see? Okay. So for those of you not so familiar, basically R is a statistical programming software, and ggplot2 is a visualization library that you can use from R. And finally, uh, all of this was placed on the World Bank GitHub repository. Uh, GitHub. Yeah, a bit less, okay. Um, so GitHub is basically a place where you can uh, put your code, do software development in a collaborative fashion. So it's a very nice tool to, if you want to share your code, uh, share your tools with a broader community. It's also a very powerful tool if you want to do collaborative coding and collaborate with your uh, colleagues or collaborate with uh, people from outside your, organiz your organization. And this is something we use, we are using more and more at the World Bank and we're trying to fully embrace it. All right, so something went well, something didn't go so well, so I want to share a few, a few reflections, a few feedback about that, that experience. So having that 100% visual report, uh, I think that went quite well, and we're fairly happy with the, with the final product. We had really good feedback. That being said, we have that question mark about, did we go too far? Should we bring back a bit of text? Is going fully visuals the right way to go? Here I'm opening, uh, I'm, I would be very curious to, to hear about people in the room. Um, but basically, what I think in some cases, like the PM 2.5 uh, chart, that I, combination of charts that I, show, that I showed, uh, the, that combination works really well. And going fully visual works pretty well. That combination of charts is really tricky though. So it doesn't work all the time. It doesn't work for all the indicators for all the story, partially because of a lack of data for certain indicators. So maybe there should be some, something else than just uh, pure visuals. Uh, In-house publication, this is possible. Uh, we did it and we're quite proud. That being said, it's not easy. 
uh, there was a lot of friction along the way. We had to build some custom tools, do some hacking to get exactly the, the visuals and the, the format that we wanted. As always, we got 80, 85% of the way quite easily. The last 15%, mm, <laughs> that was a bit, uh, a bit more rough. But it, it is possible. Reproducibility, uh, I think everything is there. You have the code, uh, you have the data online. You have almost all of the data. A few data sets that were used cannot be shared, so it's not fully uh, open data. Um, but I think without being too technical, I think you need three components to be fully reproducible. You need the same data, the same code, and you need the same environment. I think we have the two first, same data, same code. Sharing environments is a process that is a bit more complex. Uh, so without being too technical, think of it about if you use uh, some software in an old version of Windows or on Windows versus Mac, sometimes you're going to have some, some issues. Something are going to break. This is the same here as R is being updated, as uh, you're using this code on Mac or on Windows, uh, things might not work well, uh, work as expected. So there is that aspect. But I think we, we're in a very good place, and we're going to keep pushing the boundaries in making our work uh, more easily reproducible and more transparent. Finally, the reception and impact. We had uh, 100K. 110,000 uh, download on the, the PDF version of the report. Uh, around those numbers as well in terms of visit of the, of the website. We actually had a break in our, in our analytics system between the time the report was released and now, so we don't have the, uh, the, the full numbers, but um, on the visit of the website. Um, we had 80 stars and 30 forks on GitHub, for those who know what that means. But this is, this is pretty neat that people are, are, are using it. And finally, uh, something that is really nice that we're getting a lot of feedback from colleagues that they're taking this report as inspiration for their own work and they're trying to recycle some of, some of the tools and some of the, the visual uh, philosophy uh, of the Atlas. So if you liked what you saw, uh, and I hope you did, uh, there is good news. There is a new SDG Atlas coming soon, in, uh, probably in spring to, uh, 2020. So stay tuned for that, and thank you very much. Thank you so much, Tony. Utterly perfect timing, giving us uh, maximum. Oh, and we already have hands up. We've got three hands up already. So the microphone, four hands up. Okay, that, that might be it for timing. So let, let's, if you can keep your hands raised so that Inma can see where to go to next. Uh, she can just spot you uh, and, and then walk to you. Wonderful, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, very impressive. I'm all in for data viz, otherwise I wouldn't be here. And we all uh, are probably getting bored by descriptions of tables which we don't need because we can see. If I want to be a little bit provocative, I would say uh, let's not throw out the baby with the bath use like 10 years ago when we said we all go digital, we don't need printed publications, and still today we still have a few. Um, just to put that into perspective and prop probably to trying to help yourself to answer your question, did you go too far? Uh, you presented a number of interesting uh, stats, 100,000, uh, 3,000 download stars, etc. How does it actually compare to other publications? I mean, have you checked in, or do you get more user feedback who is asking for more? Uh, content description, etc. That would help us to, to see whether you went too far or we, we are going too far. Mm. Yeah, uh, so this is actually, this is in bit, so there is a publication uh, by the World Bank that is the World uh, Development Report, which is the World Bank flagship uh, publication. And this is uh, in the low range of a uh, World Bank Development Report. So it's, it's quite popular already. Uh, could be more popular, but uh, it's, it's there already. We don't have, uh, except for the positive feedback that we receive of people trying to reuse it, uh, we, I think we haven't been intentional enough in, in gathering feedback about if people would like to see different things. Uh, uh, so we don't have that much information about that. Uh, and that's why I was curious to hear about what you think about, about this approach. Gentlemen, hi. Uh, well, my name is Emiliano Bruno. I work for the Joint Research Center. I'm an editor and, and a communication officer. So, first I would say that yes, 
it worked. Um, it's two years now I'm using your publication, trying to put this in the head of my colleague scientists, for which uh, I try to make some understandable publication. And without too much success, I have to say. And this is where you come very handy. And I want to ask you something about this, because you're a data scientist. I work with scientists continuously in the last 10 years now. And despite the fact that well, we, we have um, progressed a bit uh, communicate, communicating our output, let's say, uh, from text, 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 and not understandable explanation or graphs to this. Um, the problem I have is that when I propose something like this, most of scientists like you mm -hmm. feel like that we are devirtualizing the complexity of their uh, research, that we are making things simple where, why, when things are not simple. And I always answer them, uh, well, uh, we are producing this for our policy making makers and our policy makers that just want to know four points and not the complexity of, of, of your three years job with the data. Now, you are a scientist, so you should also be one of those saying, hey, uh, this is not good because this is devirtualizing my job, the job. So how, tell me something I can tell them from your voice as a scientist? Um, so <laughs> I think I'm going to disappoint. I, I don't think I have the answer uh, for that, except that you need to keep hammering and hammering and hammering that message. Uh, this is what happened with us. As I mentioned at the beginning, we're a, a, a group in the World Bank called the Development Data Group, and we do everything around data and with the, this idea of really shortening the path from data to insight. So making ev everything lowering the friction at every level of the data use and the data interpretation and, and transform information. So this, we've been hammering that message a lot. Um, we've been working on these issues a lot and in close co collaboration with the researchers because I think this, would have, this wouldn't have been possible without uh, all the researchers that work at the World Bank that have the, the context and the knowledge and substantive knowledge about each of those topical areas. So here we, worked, we went at the beginning of this process to them, uh, to ask them, okay, what are the issues you want to highlight? <coughs> What's happening? And then we came back with the visual, like, this, this is options that we could use for that. Um, and then that, that was the back and forth. And at the end, on this report, we had the final word. So that simplified the process a lot because we decided which visualization to use. Um, sorry, I'm, that doesn't answer your question. <laughs> Happy to talk more. Uh, after we have time for about one to two more questions. So uh, this gentleman here and the lady first, yes. Oh, well, I'm afraid my question sort of iterates on the previous one. So I was asking, thinking, could you tell us a little bit more about uh, how you produce this? So who chooses, well, you just said yeah. you do. Um, but how many scientists, how many visualizations? Okay, yeah, sure. Uh, so this is really a, a group effort, uh, and even if the, the core team of the report was quite small, uh, with five people, uh, with uh, visualization experts and, and data scientists, uh, with coding experience, uh, the, 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 the full team was much broader. First, as I said, we're building everything on top of the open data work that is already happening for years. That has been happening for years. And then every topical issues, we've been in close discussion with each, you know, so there is a, an energy uh, GP at the World Bank, a poverty GP. So with each group of experts, we went, we had discussions about, okay, yeah, <laughs> that, no, that's a, <laughs> that's a lot of work. Uh, so that was the first step. And then the visualization process, the implementation, then the, the team was, was much smaller. But there was still some iterations. And the final question from this gentleman here. Hello. Hi, thank you for the interesting presentation. I want to ask re regarding the results of your effort and work because you presented uh, 110,000 downloads and stuff and I almost want to say I wish you had a graph or some visualized data <laughs> to show uh, w compared to what you kind of did you have what was the final outcome? Did you also put extra effort into communicating, hey, look, we have now a new way of reporting things, it's more interesting, or was it just, you know, you put it out there and people saw and it, it worked, or kind of what was the process for that? 
So we, we, had, we used a, a full channel of communications around that, so blogs and Twitter channel and uh, official blog posts and, and publications. So there is also, it's not just like we put the report outside mm -hmm. and we, we wait there, there is also some, some communication around it. Um, but there is definitely some, some room for improvement there. I mean, this, this is the first step producing this, and then there is how you communi communicate about your communication product. Yeah. Uh, but and then how it compares, I think yeah. this, this was the, the first question, compared to a, one of the, the World Development uh, Report, which, which is the main flagship report from the World Bank. It, it, it's, it's in the, the low third of a World uh, Development Report, which is, which is not, not bad at all. Thank you. There is a question there, but if you don't mind, sir, just to keep to time for your next coffee break, I'm sure Tony will be around for the rest of the day and will be happy to talk to you later. Thank you very much. Thank you again to Tony for that wonderful talk. Next up, we have Adina Renner. Adina is now at Alto University in Helsinki, and she's going to present us with the talk called Beyond the PDF, creating reports that are relevant to your audience. She's lived in a few different places, including the Netherlands, South Korea even, and living in these different places, she says that it gives her good perspectives on how different governments can produce different solutions to how societies can be organized. And and also, whilst working as an interaction designer at an environmental consultancy in Zurich, she saw firsthand how many of the communication challenges are faced by governments. So with that, Adina, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, thank you for coming here. Um, so my name is Adina. Um, I'm here to talk to you about my master thesis, Beyond the PDF. Um, I, um, I hope to tell you a little bit about my process, what I've learned. Um, while creating or trying to create publications that are more relevant and useful um, to an audience. And I hope that you can take some of these things with you for your audience, your products, uh, your publications. So as I said, I'm uh, studying in Finland. And if I'm not uh, studying, I'm enjoying Finnish culture. Um, and if I'm not enjoying Finnish culture, I'm working as an information designer. So I work at the intersection of um, data, design, and code, and I really try to translate cons uh, content, often data, into um, a visualization that people understand. Um, so, in my first study year, I actually came across this report, Early Childhood Education and Care in Europe. Um, it's by Eurydice, and it looks at five um, key quality areas in early childhood education and care across Europe. And um, I, I really fell in love with this report. Um, I'm from Switzerland originally, and uh, we're notoriously bad for our bad, uh, notoriously uh, famous for our bad uh, child, uh, childhood education policies. Um, and I think this re uh, report like this has a lot of value in showing how different countries solve these policies. Um, so. Um, as an information designer, I began to wonder how can I make sure that this report reaches as, most, as many people as possible. And uh, in this process, I, this, this became my master thesis topic. And in this process, I went from this 200-page PDF to an uh, online platform that looks something like this. Um, I will go into more detail uh, of it later. Um, but you can see that there's, there's everything is still there from the report, so we didn't, I didn't um, take away any content in that sense. There's highlights, there's uh, the countries, there's the topics, um, and I added stories, so I will come to that later. So about my process, if you look at it, um, there are many things going on. Um, I I, want, I like to kind of um, differentiate between two activities, understanding and translating. So understanding is really about understanding the producers, which you see on the top. Um, understanding is about understanding the people who will use this report. They're on the bottom there. Um, and understanding is also about looking around, learning what is possible um, today in design and technology. And then translating is taking all of this um, what I have understood, and putting it into a product that people actually see and can use. 
So a simplified <laughs> view of this. Um, it's a very iterative process. Um, as you see, there are many things happening in parallel, and I think this is very important that it's not a step-by-step -step, uh, thing that you can follow and, and just do like that. Um, so I want to tell you a little bit about understanding first four learnings from this process, um, and I want to focus on the audience needs. So in order to do that, uh, to understand the audience, the target audience, I did uh, in-depth workshops with these uh, four um, user groups. They are, they are on the back cover of the report. So I really followed what, what the report was telling me to do, policymakers, researchers, parents, and journalists as well. And I used a kind of co-design approach. So we did things together, we enacted, we told, and we made together. And what I learned from this uh, process um, is, for one, that there are really different needs in terms of volume and depth. So civil servants will just uh, need all the content, but not in very much depth. Researchers will sometimes need quick content, sometimes in-depth content. Um, journalists, they want the facts and then the source, where these facts come from. And parents, they might just want a few facts. In terms of correlations, um, civil servants are very focused on their current policy focus. So they will take, they will correlate this focus to um, to different topics. Um, researchers try to read between the lines uh, and see kind of into the future um, what will happen. Um, journalists really like cause and effects, and uh, parents try to make comparisons to their own realities. Finally, in terms of uh, effect, um, we can see that civil servants talk about we as a country, while researchers see much more of a kind of construct, so they see their country as part of the EU, for example, in this report. Um, journalists want to inform the people, and parents um, see themselves and their family as kind of uh, their important unit, their world. And when we look at all these um, kind of different needs, what I think is really important to see is that over time people have different needs. So there's not just a difference between the different target audiences, but there's also a kind of continuum within one person. So a researcher might um, want to have, in the morning, they want to ha teach their students about statistical analysis, they will show a chart quickly, but um, in the afternoon, they're doing their own research. They need to go into the report and find concepts that are relevant to them. So what can we do when we, we know all these things? We want to put them into a product. Um, for that, I kind of translated these um, four learnings from the process into design principles. So for a dynamic audience, um, in the beginning, I thought, well, everyone's different, so we will need tailored products for each audience. Um, but then, because of this kind of continuum that people are on, um, I came up with this squid principle, um, where the, the product is actually in one place. It's a microsite, uh, an independent website. Um, there's <coughs> a few main entry points, not too many, and a few additional products. So we have this, the, the online platform, um, where everybody can go to one place, you can come there from the website institution or from social media in this case, and um, you find everything you need on there. So what you find in the highlights, um, this is maybe for the journalists mainly, you find a quick overview of the content. <coughs> and um, in the topics, you see the in-depth uh, quality areas. So this is kind of the traditional um, content table, table of contents. Um, countries give you a different perspective on the, uh, on the contents, on the topics. So you look at the quality dimensions from each country. And finally, in stories, you can see, for one, um, a different perspective on small parts of the of the data, so having uh, the stories that are interesting to a broader public, but also, as you see here, a behind-the-scenes video where it is actually explained how this even comes to be, this report. So what can we do in terms of volume and depth? 
Um, here I like to talk about a magazine. So a magazine that uses content and visualization to tell different stories. If we look, for example, in one of the topics, um, participation rates, a very important topic, um, we can use a structure to tell a story. So different kind of structures will tell different kind of stories. And what I applied here um, is this kind of starting with a claim. It's very typical in journalism. So starting with a claim, providing evidence, and ending with a conclusion. Um, here the evidence is the graphic, um, which I will go to in into a minute. And um, then you can also go into more details if you want to know more. Um, within the graphic, you can kind of hover over these text uh, pieces to see more detail, in more detail, why things are maybe as they are. In the stories, this might look a little bit different. There's a claim, there's the evidence again, but the graphics are much more playful. They're longer. They use um, scrolling as a way to kind of understand length for it in, th in this example. Um, in terms of correlation, um, we can think about interactivity. So now we've seen how we can we use explanation, we use uh, storytelling first, but now we can go we can allow the users, the audience to explore. So this goes from very simple things, for example, a simple hover over a word that someone might not know that leads to a glossary, um, to more complex things like filters that actually allow you to change the chart. And even kind of to a split screen view of, um, of the topic here in the countries, you can choose another uh, topic and compare them side by side. What can we do in terms of effect? Um, we can see this report as a kind of modular building system, a platform where people can see themselves in it, and they can also personalize things to a certain degree. Um, so you see maybe on top, there's this Eurodice comparative report, there's a utility navigation as well, um, and when, you, when we go further down, um, we can see what these utilities are. So there's downloads, download center, you can have a profile, you can have bookmarks, notes, highlights, so you can completely make your own copy of this report, even if it's online. And finally, um, for a, a word about the style. So instead of having a very illustrative uh, approach where you kind of see uh, Caucasian people, black people holding a baby or not holding a baby, um, I think it's very important to think of an inclusive language. Um, so having this kind of playful tangram, I don't know if you know this from your uh, childhood as well, um, we can, which can be abstract but also can go into slightly figurative um, visualizations. So, and as keeping my promise, <laughs> I'm also going to give you a small summary um, just to uh, lead Elf into a, into a discussion. So, I think even though I don't talk about this a lot, this is truly a multidisciplinary <coughs> effort. We have the analysts who have already made this report. Um, we have design, code, um, and this all comes together in a product like this, and I think this is very important. Um, then spending quality time with your audiences, um, actually spending those two hours watching them use, use the report or even just talking to them is extremely valuable, um, and there's, there's really a lot to be gained from that. Um, then this idea of having one platform that allows multiple perspectives, um, trusting the figures that they can also tell a story, um, don't complain, explain. This is a hidden compliment, compliment because the explanations are really good and um, I think that they can guide through the report really nicely um, in, in together with the graphics, in partnership with the graphics. And finally, the language, the visual language, um, being inclusive and personal and kind of keeping that in mind. Thank you very much. Please contact me <laughs> for feedback. Thank you so much, Adina. Thank you. We've got about five minutes for questions. So if we can go quickly, that would be great to keep to time. Any questions at all? Oh, yes. 
If there's a question after this question, please raise your hand now. Okay, certainly. So that Simon can see you, in fact. Yeah. Hi, so going back a little bit to the previous uh, talker, how reproducible is this? How practical is it? Yes, uh, so the idea is this is still fully in the process. I don't know if you noticed, so this is the fourth prototype. There will be a next one. Uh, kind of a final one, and the idea is also to think about at least um, how this could become an actual platform with a kind of administrative back end um, <coughs> in the sense that it would become a product that people could use for different reports. So, but it's, it's not the main focus of this thesis, but it will be kind of thought about. Yes. Another question just here. Yes, yes hello. Th thank you. Very interesting, uh, provoking presentation. I didn't quite get a feel for how much um, original work you did or whether it was just sort of cutting and pasting and re-presenting what was already there in the original report. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, that's it really. Yes, um, that's a good question. I, as I said, in general, everything is there. I think what I, what I really needed to do was um, rethink the text bits, how they were written and how they were presented. So there is a way of rethinking how you write online, how you, um, and how you, how you do the visualizations. So does that answer your question? There is quite a lot of cutting and editing in the text. Did it, did it fit this format? Um, and the graphics are completely new. Yes, yes, but um, I'm, I, I hope to work also with the editor on that because I'm not a texter, yes. <laughs> Another question here. Hi, thank you very much for that, it was really interesting. Um, my name's Damien, I work at the OECD as, as a statistical editor. Um, the famous question is usage stats. Um, how did you find your presentation of this, of this content changed uh, compared to the original printed version? Well, I didn't do any usability tests yet. Um, uh, we have uh, feedback rounds. I've done feedback rounds with uh, civil servants, and there are still some outstanding with the parents and the journalists as well. Um, in general, the feedback has been very positive. It's almost not comparable. Um, but I can't give you any statistics on that. Not yet. <laughs> Somebody mentioned that you might want to interview some people for your masters here today. Is that correct? Uh, yes, I'm always I'm always interviewing people. So <laughs> if you want anybody to approach you later, how long will you be in Luxembourg? Uh, until Thursday. So yes. if anybody would like to help her with her masters, please do get in touch with Adina, and I'm quite sure she'll be grateful for for that input. Any further questions? No, no question. Thank you so much once again, Adina, for your talk. Well, Steve Albrecht just gets set up. Let me introduce you. Welcome to the stage here from the Information Lab to give us a talk called Discover How Visual Analytics Helps the European Investment Fund Deliver Insights into the Public Funding. Steve actually started with the robotics in Germany, also lived and worked in Silicon Valley in San Francisco, of course, met his wife there and lived with her in her homeland of Venezuela for a couple of years before returning to his homeland of Luxembourg. And here was with General Electrics and for the last couple of years, since 2016, has worked with the Information Lab. And one of the anecdotes Steve told me yesterday, last night in fact, was he had to actually fly to Miami whilst he was living in Venezuela to buy a computer for his 3D animations to work because it was not possible to buy anything like that in Venezuela at the time. So Steve, once you're set up, the floor is yours. <laughs> Whilst he's just getting ready, if anybody would like to ask any further questions to Tony or Adina, please do. I'm sure they'll be... You're all fine. Okay. <laughs> oh, well.
Good, I guess I'm up and running. Hello, thank you very much uh, for the introduction. And uh, yes, trying to get my wife from beautiful sunny beaches in Venezuela to rainy Luxembourg, that was one of my biggest challenges in, in life. So, uh, <laughs> but um, okay, so uh, welcome to this uh, third session this afternoon. Um, I would like to present to you uh, how a visual analytics helped the European Investment Fund um, uh, provide uh, insight into public funding and also kind of what that how that project has helped the European Investment Fund uh, in um, in the data analytics uh, culture maybe a couple of um, a uh, couple of um, points on the information lab itself uh, we are uh, one of the largest uh, tableau and Alteryx partners in Europe uh, we're about 200 uh, man strong uh, growing we have a very diverse background in uh, in um, different industrial backgrounds and industries. Um, I believe one of the main um, uh, interesting uh, point of our uh, backgrounds is that a lot of people have like political science backgrounds, others maybe from IT, uh, finance, or I myself, I'm actually an electrical engineer. Um, the nice thing about that is that depending on the client, we bring in a certain domain expertise into visual analytics to help uh, create meaningful uh, meaningful uh, uh, graphics and uh, one thing which we all have in common is we're very passionate about data and we really like helping people make sense of data and data is everywhere data is there also for everyone to use now back 10 years ago it was not uncommon if you if you wanted to analyze data you had to go to the IT department or you had to ask somebody to build a report for you Maybe one week later you got the report, it wasn't quite exactly what you wanted, the dates were wrong, and then it had to go back, um, uh, back and forth a couple of times. Now, times have changed. Uh, software tools today, like Tableau as we use, uh, are drag and drop. They are extremely simple to use. They're easy, fun, and really powerful. And um, the big change which we have seen over the last years is that these tools now uh, can be uh, given to the hands of, um, of the business users or the users within a business who know their uh, business well. So like that, they can really analyze the data and they can create meaningful, um, meaningful analytics uh, on the spot without speaking to third party people. Now, why am I saying this? Um, this project um, has been developed together with the European Investment Fund, which is a European Union agency which uh, helps uh, provide um, a finance to SMEs. Uh, the European Investment Fund is based here in Luxembourg, here in Kirchberg, and um, they don't actually provide financing itself to the SMEs, but they work with partners. And these partners are usually private banks and, um, and funds. Um, they're commonly um, named um, inter intermediaries within the, um, within the group. Now, if you look at these uh, three KPIs, which you see on the screen, so the European Investment Fund is, so to speak, managing like 170 billion euros, and it's working with over a thousand partners to provide finance to, you know, 1.8 million SMEs. And when we started the project, with, um, with the European Investment Fund, this is this, this distribution of public funds that was at the heart on how to visualize uh, this information. So how does this uh, 170 billion euros being used through the partners in order to reach the SMEs? Now, a lot of this is about transparency. You know, this is public funding. These are big mandates coming from the European Commission. And it's about providing transparency, how this money is used, where is it being invested, and are we truly helping to grow the European economy? When we started this project, the first thing you, um, uh, you, you actually look at is that you need to make sure that whatever dashboard or whatever you, you you prepare is that the fundamental questions need to be answered. So for example, which countries and which markets are we impacting? How many jobs are we helping to create? So there was a bit of brainstorming going on. It's like, what are these fundamental questions which are really important to, uh, to, uh, to answer? And then of course, as part of that process of analyzing these questions, you may discover um, new insights which then may provide further information and new challenges. So with this at hand, 
part of the project were additional uh, challenges. For example, we're looking at 100, uh, like nearly 2 million SMEs and 4 million operations, which means that these are big data sets, which means that uh, whatever solution we implement is it needs to be fast and it needs to be scalable. The other one is the goal of um, the project was to show where the money actually flows. So it's not enough by just saying, okay, X billion went into X country. No, we really wanted to show it goes into city level and even further down to street level. We want to know and show where that public money is, uh, is really being used. So part of the project was to geocode over one million SMEs. So that means that you need a solid automation um, strategy, how to automate the geocoding of this large amounts of data. Another challenge was, well, obviously part of this project, we need to make this information publicly available. So that means that, um, uh, that, means that uh, it's going to be an online platform. Uh, that means that um, it needs to be secure, there needs to be a governance in place, it needs to be reliable, it needs to be compliant. You know, all these items which the IT department tends to take care of uh, start to, uh, starts to come in. So the solution had to be um, also secure. And last but not least, the information which we displayed had to be compatible with NUTS. Now, I did not know anything about NUTS first, so I thought maybe you don't either. So, um, today, where all the countries have postcodes and regions and districts, however, when it comes to, um, when it comes to bringing in uh, a standard way of providing statistics on an EU level, you need a common way on doing that. So, several years back, Eurostat developed something uh, called the NUTS codes, and essentially it is standardizing the way countries are being divided into different regions and sub-regions. Um, this was a really critical component to this project because within the European Commission or the European um, Union agencies, all the reporting and statistics are based on these NUTS codes. So unless the solution provided this type of insight, a lot of work may not have been very useful because you at the end cannot answer the final questions. Now, part of the process, how did that work out? Well, essentially, we got the data from the European Investment Fund. It went first to a data preparation um, process, and we used a tool called Alterix. Alterix is extremely powerful at, at uh, crunching out through millions and billions of rows. So we used Alterix to actually clean that data. So this is a simple example. Addresses are sometimes not very clean. So, um, so that's the first step, clean the data, get it structured. The second part of the process is, um, is the geocoding, which essentially means uh, we provide latitude and longitude to the addresses. And the output from that, then we import it into Tableau to create the visualization, which I would like to show you now. Okay, so this. This is the final product, it's a map. At the bottom you see the main KPIs, the main indicators of how much money has been invested, how many SMEs have received the funding, and ultimately how many jobs have been, um, have been created using this, um, this initiative. On the top you have several, several different selectors, what type of funding was used, like equity or guarantees. And um, uh, the map also provides uh, different levels of um, uh, like mouse over uh, to get uh, some already some brief insight on country level. On the right hand side, you are able to get further statistics. You can drill down into industry sectors and also get more information and more insight about how the money has been used across the EU. So now you're on EU level. So now what I'll do is I'll we'll drill down country and then into each nuts level. So we're going to take Germany as the example. Yeah, so these are now the official nuts regions within Germany. We're going to go into Niedersachsen, which is the um, uh, one of the states. We're going to go into the district of Hannover. And again, these are the official nuts 
by definition, and this is now the actual um, uh, district of Hannover. So now we're drilling down, drilling down, all the way down to street level. So these are the SMEs which have been geocoded to receive funding. And further on the right, again, you see uh, further details about um, how the money has, has been invested in, in different industry sectors. Furthermore, as this is an online tool, we can embed also uh, YouTube videos or any type of online document. So you can, you can provide a lot of different interactions together with the map. So these are all technologically um, uh, options which these solutions provide today literally out of the box. That brings me to my last slide on how the IF has benefited from this exercise. Um, I think at the end there's something for everyone. Uh, like data analysts, they are allowed to better focus on strategic problems. They, they don't waste time on preparing data. Uh, they can go in and analyze it directly. They're able to discover new insights and share them effectively. Um, executives, they are um, they're more productive because first thing in the morning they see dashboards which are updated using real-time data or at least the data from the day before. And, um, and ultimately, for all the business users, they are, they're able to also access more information uh, from dashboards which are shared within the organization to make uh, their work also uh, easier and better. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Steve. Any questions for Steve? Oh, yes, we have one right behind you, Simon. Just a question. Uh, my name is Arz, Deutsche Bundesbank. You, get, uh, you can um, provide information about uh, different firms, how much money they got. Is that allowed? Is it... Um, <laughs> of course, this uh, was the... Well, is, one it, is it... Is it it's published, isn't it? Yes, yeah, so this is... Um, so, essentially... So, the question is about data privacy, correct? Um, Sorry? No, no, I'm just pointing to Simon. You carry on. Simon, I'm just pointing to Simon where to walk next with the oh, mic. Okay, sorry. sorry. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I thought there was a camera out in the kitchen. No, no. no. I mean, yes, this is about data privacy. Essentially, the data has been uh, anonymized. That means that there is no, there's no real information connected to these dots. Now, we do show how the funding is being used, but essentially, um, there's, no, there's no name connected to these dots. These are just uh, physical uh, addresses on the map, which are correct, though. So, but you cannot backtrace you know, how much money has received through which type of funding. But it is, it is of course, a valid uh, point, and, and I'm sure that within the bank uh, there was discussion about this, and ultimately the decision was taken to, no, this is about transparency. We need to, uh, we need to uh, provide information how public funding is being used. We have another question here, the lady here. Yes, hi. Uh, Carmen Gruber from Digit, from the European Commission. Thank you for this, uh, for showing us the results of your work. Uh, I would like to know which tools you were using for the preparation of data. Well, the preparation of, the preparation of data, we used uh, predominantly Alteryx. Uh, yeah. I mean, Alteryx, uh, for those that know, is, a, is an ETL uh, tool. Um, it's uh, mainly used uh, to do data cleaning, data preparation, but it's an extremely powerful tool to also do spatial analytics or also uh, help in geocoding geo uh, processes. Just behind you, Simon. <laughs> uh, two quick questions. Um, one, how do you ensure that uh, this kind of databases are maintained? Because this is, I think, one of the frequent frustrations. People go in with high expectations, and then a year later, you can't even find the thing. And secondly, I don't want to bore you with a de technical detail, but I'm trying to access it really from a citizen's perspective. Where is my money going, so to speak? And with the nuts, we have this interesting challenge. I mean, I don't want to bore people with my home country, but if you go for nuts to Cologne, it doesn't talk about my big home, hometown. So if, how do you address actually the difference between the nuts level and the real towns and, 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 and locations? 
Well, essentially, uh, let's get the, the first the question first, uh, is uh, the, the map is updated on a regular basis. Now, um, this is not using real-time data. So if you log on tomorrow, it's going to be the same as today. But um, we, um, you know, in collaboration with the European Investment Fund, we decide, okay, let's, let's refresh the map. Here's the refresh uh, data set. Uh, let's, uh, let's now update the map. So it's not real time, it's on a regular basis. Um, uh, the other question is, um, uh, how do we make sure that the SMEs are within the NUTS codes? Well, it's a complicated topic, but essentially um, uh, the, the cities and postcodes within, within NUTS regions are clearly defined. And in theory, if, if all these information is correct, then a certain address with a certain postcode is in the correct NUTS code. So there's a lot of data validation going on behind the scenes, where again we're using Alteryx to do that data validation. Any further questions? Wonderful. Fantastic on the time. Thank you so much, Steve. Thank you, Thank you very Thank you much. And I know that... Um, if you haven't already seen it, he has this fantastic interactive map just outside diagonally opposite, so you can look at that during the next coffee break. And that will be directly after Dr. Suzanne Fick's uh, talk. She's, uh, Dr. Suzanne is uh, going to talk to us about how an annual report became an innovative magazine with infographics and visualized data. Suzanne is head of press and public relations at the German Federal Institute for Risk Assessment since 2009 and has worked at the interface of science public uh, communication for her whole career, co-authored guidelines for risk communication. So we very much look forward to your talk. Thank you, Suzanne. Thank you very much for this kind introduction. And do you hear me? Yeah. Good afternoon. Um, it's a pleasure now to talk about uh, our new scientific magazine. <laughs> Um, and how we developed from an annual report to an innovative magazine. Um, I work at the German Federal Institute for Risk Assessment and we are scientists. We give <coughs> advice to um, politics with regards to chemical product. Oh, even the micro doesn't work. Yeah, no, so I no micro. <laughs> <laughs> okay, do you hear me now? Okay, better. Okay, I work at the German Federal Institute for Risk Assessment and we give scientific advice to politics with regard to food and chemical and product safety. And at the same time, uh, we have the legal remit to inform the public. We have uh, an independent um, task for risk <coughs> communication. And sometimes there are gaps between uh, scientists and uh, the consumers. We already talked about this uh, in the morning. And someone said, are, are scientists still trusted? And there's a new Eurobarometer in food. <laughs> it's the green button, I guess. No. no. Yeah. And uh, it says, yes, um, scientists are still trusted, which is a kind of good news. Although we all are aware of this debate if we live now in a post-trust society. And, but science is sometimes complex. Um, it has uncertainties, it doesn't provide absolute truths, and um, it's sometimes not easy to understand. And this is particularly important as the flood of information increases. Um, we get a lot of information and we try to simplify. This is absolutely human. So there are some gaps between scientists and consumers, and in our institution we think it's not only important to deliver facts, but also to have a participatory dialogue to exchange with all the stakeholders. This is the first thing. And we also think it's very important to look at the perception. So what do people think? Not just deliver data visualization, but also know what are the expectations and what are the concerns of the people. So uh, we have different methods in our institution to measure risk perception. And for example, we have a consumer monitor, it's a biannual publication, and uh, we ask, for example, the following question. To what extent are you personally concerned or not about the following food safety topics? And people in Germany are first and foremost concerned about antimicrobial resistance, followed by microplastics in food, which, by the way, came up over the last years. It wasn't a topic several years ago. And also people are concerned about um, pesticide residues, concerned about glyphosate, 
and GMOs. They are not so much concerned about microbiological risks, but microbiological risks are with regard to, if you ask experts, it's a big topic. I don't know whether you remember, in Germany we had a E. coli outbreak in 2011 with more than 50 dead people. People even can't remember sometimes. And uh, so, yes, there are disparities between experts and lay people, but we can't resolve them by just providing information. And uh, so we need to keep an eye on the perceived risks. And maybe also data visualization can help because we can understand information faster, we can also communicate emotions, and also I think especially with regard to your presentation, a combination of verbal and graphic risk communication can also reduce false estimations and maybe also promote risk literate decisions. So we are all, in a way, experts in data visualization and you know, I think it's very important that we also know about the communication strategy. It's not only about visualization, but why do we do it? What messages do we have? Who do we want to target? And of course, we also can use different channels. We should understand the content. We should know how external agencies work and maybe even be able to evaluate the work. So I don't know, probably you receive a lot of annual reports from different institutions. Uh, we also published uh, an annual report and now we have like 2019, November, and sometimes you even now get annual reports with 2018 on, on the cover. So I didn't like this very much and also my target audience, the media, thinks that it's not up to date, although the content is really good. So we decided not to have this annual report with all the topics, but have a scientific magazine with a, an eye-catching cover. So these are the other covers, so it's now the fourth edition. It's about, for example, olive oil, which is uh, one of the foods that are most commonly affected by food fraud, by the way. It's about antibiotic resistance because it's a very huge topic in the German population. And it's about, for example, heat-induced contaminants, which may pose a health risk. And this, this is, for example, an infographic. Um, before, we just reported with a lot of text, and now we illustrate um, the risk perception also in infographics. For example, this is just about do you like to eat or would you like to eat insects? And in Germany, most of the people do not like to in eat insects, but you can increase the acceptance if they do not look like insects. So if they look like a burger, for example. And we also try to emotionize, we use graphics, um, for example, to also convey um, possible health risks with regard to tattoos. And uh, just not only giving text if it comes to um, health risks with regard to energy drinks, but also to provide graphs, for example, what contains um, how much caffeine, because it's a special risk for children. And <laughs> we are scientists, sometimes we like also to have an illustration, chemical formulas. And, and mostly we also use these chemical formulas only if they're potentially dangerous substances. But we are all chemistry, our whole body is chemistry. And so we try to avoid not only using chemical formulas for potential dangerous substances, and we rather try to explain what consumers can do in order to prevent um, some risks. For example, with regard to heat contaminant um, heat-induced contaminants. They can, for example, um, make french fries or um, other things not really dark brown, but just golden. So, because we know from psychological studies that if you can control your risk, you perceive it as less, less risky. This is what people think if they drive a car, for example. If they do it on your own, you think it's less risky. Or risky sports activities, for example, because you can control it. or you think you can control it. We also put our scientists in front, so we have interviews. Next issue, by the way, with a Nobel Prize winner again, so this might be interesting for you to read next time. And we also use all the graphics, not only for the magazine and online, but also in social media. For example, this is about um, new health risks um, of e-cigarettes, and um, we do not do like, oh, this is so bad for you, but we say this is the new way of smoking, but um, there might be risk involved. And especially with regard to glyphosate, um, it's not only worth communicating 
there, that there are risks or there are no risks, but it's also important to communicate what are the concerns of the consumers. And especially with regard to glyphosate, the awareness has increased a lot and um, the concerns are also very, very high. And this is our now our new BFR risk profile. So we wanted to have, based on our scientific opinion, a graph which visualizes the risk at one glance so that people know how to do with this uh, information. So this is, for example, about the excessive consumption of caffeine-containing energy drinks. And uh, uh, we have five categories, and we use standardized wording. Um, very important is the affected group. In this case, children. We use also um, graphs. And in risk assessment, it's important to know the probability of um, the health impairment, in this case, possible. Then the severity. And we also address uncertainty. So we need to know is the available data, for example, is it reliable? And we also address the controllability by the consumer. These are our graphs which we develop with our psychologists. So this is children, pregnant women, people with chronic diseases, elderly people, so probably some risk groups that might be affected. This was uh, just to show you that we had also a process. We had several evaluation phases. Another profile looked like that. And we also had, at the end, um, internal and external evaluations. This is, for example, a result of our focus groups. Most of them, especially from um, economy, they thought it's really understandable. And in summary, um, the majority of the population thinks that it's helpful. Of course, there are always ways to improve it. <laughs> and we are working now together with the Harding Center for Risk Literacy to even make this risk profile better. So the new version will come soon. And we are also visualizing our work we do in our, not only laboratories, but also in our kitchen. We will have a lot of data because we cook a lot of meals like German people would normally do. And we produce a lot of data with regard to contaminants and also, but also um, vitamins um, included in food. So this will also be coming soon. And if you'd like to subscribe, you can, of course, do it. You're very welcome. And thank you very much. And if you have further questions, let me know. Thank you so much, Suzanne, for the wonderful talk. I'm sure you've got many more subscribers already for the fascinating data. I was also surprised that you also published it all in English as well yeah, as yeah, so German. It's not only German, it's also in English. Already. Thank you. Questions? No questions. Ah, ah, we have suddenly three hands that have shot up. One lady here, somebody here, I saw a hand, and, and here. Uh, thank you. I'm Valentina Kalk from the European Investment Bank. Um, thank you for a really interesting presentation. Uh, seeing the evolution was uh, quite remarkable. Uh, what was the thought process and how did you engage third parties? Did you hire consultants? Did you do everything in-house? Did you do focus groups? I'm interested in uh, understanding the process that generated mm -hmm. these wonderful things. Mm -hmm. So there are two different processes. The first one is um, the magazine, which was the idea in, in, in our department. And the other one was the risk profile. So these are two different um, aspects. And the risk profile, this was really starting with literature research and uh, also internal focus groups. So we ask our scientists, what do you think? Especially with regard to probability, it's very difficult um, to to uh, standardize it, because if you say possible, someone understands what totally different than another scientist, and even also probable. And even it depends on the context. If I say, um, I often go to the cinema, you will understand something totally different if I say, I often go to the USA. Or it's, it is also depends on the context. So it's very, so we did this in an internal evaluation, and then also we did this external evaluation and ask our stakeholders. So policymakers, um, um, consumers as well, but also media, journalists, um, and these were then the results um, I presented here, that they are, it, it's accepted the risk profile, but there's some way, um, also some room to pr improve. Communication is also one of very important things in all forms of life. <laughs> Another question here, the lady in Denham. 
Green, uh, blue. Uh, hi, Carmen Gruber from Digit. I was just wondering, I don't know if I skipped the information uh, during your presentation. Uh, so f it was one annual report, but four magazine style uh, um, issues. How do you, how exactly does it work? Do you, uh, do you say, oh yeah, this is a good topic, so let's, let's work on a new edition, or how, how exactly does the thought process mm -hmm. go? So it was, it's now biannual, so it's two issues per year. And uh, we have in, in our communication department, we think it's important that you know the topic quite well and not only what we can do about. So we have contact persons to our department, so they are informed and we have a kind of brainstorming group in our communication department and think what it might be important for um, also the results we have from risk perception and also what our scientists think is might be important and then we propose something um, um, for our president, and then he mostly agrees, <laughs> and then we can continue. Tony. Um, yeah, so the, you had a slide at the beginning that showed the different um, risk perceptions in the population, and you talked about disconnect between what the scientific uh, community think about high risk and, and what the general population thought. And I th think we are really bad at assessing risk uh, in general. And so I was wondering, that's a very general question outside of that is, but if you have any, any research that uh, inform about what are the, the components that uh, make people assess better or not uh, the potential risk. So for example, where nobody will think twice about uh, taking their cars uh, to drive, mm -hmm. whereas the risk is much higher statistically mm -hmm. than taking a plane where a lot of people would be afraid. Uh, some of things like the microplastic, um, I guess there is a lot of graphics element to that. The plastic yes. in the sea, the yeah. turtles with the straws that yeah. that really speak to people versus other risks that are much more invisible. Um, mm -hmm. So I don't I know if this is an yeah. easy... I think there's a lot of literature also, um, but I think it's very important from a psychological point of view that um, if you deliver facts alone, it might not be useful because we tend also to believe the facts we already trust or we believe in and which fit, which fit into our values. So, uh, so, so this is very difficult. And of course, um, media still has an impact on, on, on the perception. This is what we know, for example, for pesticide residues. We did also an analysis of about media reports, for example. So media is an important uh, mediator in, in this context with regard to risk perception. And uh, so in order, if you have want to change risk perception, it's a very difficult task. I don't know whether data visualization is, might, might be one part, but n not probably the only one. Are there any further questions? With that, thank you so much, Suzanne. <laughs> I would just like to ask all four speakers to stay behind for a photograph. And uh, everybody else, you're invited to another lovely long com coffee session where you can chat to those around you. And we'll meet back in here, just to say that everybody will be meeting back in here at four o'clock. So if you want a, a good seat, come just perhaps a little early. <laughs> thank you.
Seems perfect. Super. So in the end, you get the stickers. Ah, right. Perfect. You get this microphone. Test, test. All right. Yeah, yeah. Quite close. Can you hear me? Yep. Um. So next, back. And these are black in the middle. And black means the screen is black. So for example, if you want to um, show something specific. All right. Cool. Is there any pointer or not? No, there's no, no pointer. Okay. So just test like this, and you see also like your screen here. Yeah, over there. Perfect. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's 
Uh, like this. You hear now, you can hear it now. Okay. All right.
Christian, den, den Pot Fennef aus den De Pot Fennef. Aus den Pot Fennef. Ich meine, das gemüt. Very close. Okay. Test, 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 test. Test ein, zwei.
Hello and welcome back everybody. If you could kindly take your seats, we're going to start the last session. It's lovely to see you all back in this room. Hopefully you had uh, a great late morning, early afternoon, listening to sessions. Thank you, Simon. <laughs> And, um, and for those who couldn't be in five places at once, all of the talks will be online afterwards, and many of them uh, will be web uploaded as well, the videos of them. So it's really a great pleasure to welcome the last set of speakers who are, like all of the speakers today, completely outstanding, and I think really will give you so much to think about once, once you leave today. First up, we have Benjamin. Benjamin's come from Switzerland. Benjamin Wiedekehr, he's the managing director and the founding partner at Interactive Things. He describes himself as an interaction designer focusing on data viz, of course, and interface user experience design. He's also a lecturer on these topics at two universities, the Zurich University of Arts and the University of Arts in Bern. His topic is called Visualizing Data for Exploration and Explanation and Everything in Between. Thank you. So good afternoon. Uh, everybody, uh, thanks again to the organizers for setting up this excellent event and for giving me the opportunity to speak to you this afternoon. Also, thanks to everybody who's still awake. Uh, I hope enough coffee was there. Uh, as was mentioned, my name is Benjamin. Uh, I co-founded and lead Interactive Things. Um, we're a team of designers uh, and developers with a passion for making uh, complex topics easy to understand and easy to use uh, for a wide variety of audiences. Over the past 10 years, we have worked um, with uh, governmental and non-governmental agencies and we have built uh, data platforms and publications for them. Uh, the intent is always to either uh, find, understand or, or share insights in their data sources. Reflecting upon our work, uh, I think that visualization solves three fundamental jobs. The first, we build platforms uh, to help organizations search for significant facts within their data sets uh, and to discover insights within them. One example of such a data tool is uh, a knowledge platform called Violence Info, which we developed for the World Health Organization. This platform combines close to 4,000 scientific studies spanning roughly 50 years of re research on uh, the prevalence and uh, prevention of interpersonal violence. Data visualization was not just used as an easy way for uh, the general public to engage with that data, but it was also instrumental in uh, consolidating and collecting the data sources um, for uh, such a long period of time. Second, we built products that help individuals and organizations uh, to make sense of their data. Uh, one example of such a product is a mobile application called Augment, which we designed for a Swiss healthcare startup, uh, BioVotion. In combination with a wearable device, Augment tracks and analyzes uh, vital signs continuously and non-invasively, helping patients uh, and athletes better understand how their bodies react uh, uh, based on activities throughout the day. And then third, we create publications to help communicators convey insights to others uh, in order to raise comprehension, uh, awareness, and engagement. 
One example of such a publication is uh, this data story uh, called 20 Years, 20 Titles, uh, commissioned by the Swiss radio and television organization. Uh, it's uh, a quantitative retrospective on the career of uh, our national hero, Roger Federer, um, where we construct uh, a mosaic uh, based on different lenses that we put onto his athletic performance. And in today's talk, I would like to focus on the benefits, but also the challenges uh, of two visualizations approaches to inform and engage the general public, exploratory and explanatory. The exploratory approach um, is used to serve information needs, while the explanatory approach can help you to accomplish communication goals. Exploratory visualizations are user-driven. Uh, they usually don't have a pre-described order. Uh, they have limited messaging uh, and a high degree of interactivity. This approach supports tasks such as uh, data diagnostics, pattern discovery, and uh, hypothesis formation. Explanatory approaches, on the other hand, uh, are author-driven. Uh, they typically have a clear path through the visualization. Uh, they rely heavily on messaging and interpretation, um, and they offer limited interactivity. But I believe that compelling stories can both be found in, but also told through uh, both approaches. And I would like to make a small demonstration with this comparison here. Uh, I'm using two examples from our past work. Uh, on the green background, uh, Education Inequalities, um, which is an exploratory data platform which we uh, built for the UNESCO. Um, and Unwanted, on the other hand, on pink background, is a self-initiated investigation from our team. Unwanted sheds light on the over 600,000 girls uh, estimated to be missing in India every year. The article lays the scientific foundation of this claim in the beginning, presents the quantitative research uh, through a series of data visualization, and includes qualitative anecdotes from affected people. In this manner, Unwanted provides the overarching statistical framework and tells very specific stories from a first-person perspective. Education Inequalities, on the other hand, is a, is a website about deprivation and marginalization in access to education. Um, it includes a series of indicators uh, that shed light uh, on this disparity. Uh, the first page here shows uh, the global ranking for the percentage of 7 to 16-year-olds uh, who have never been to school. In contrast to unwanted, we start with an objective global overview. We can then start to drill down into one country, in our case here, Somalia, and view the spread of different demographic characteristics, um, like gender or wealth. And this already uh, paints a more nuanced picture uh, about the access to education for the more or less deprived ends of the spectrum. Going one step further into detail by combining these characteristics, we see their cumulative impact on specific demographic groups. And so this inspection reveals uh, the very specific story that if you're born as a girl in one of the poorest households in the central south of Somalia, you only have a 1% chance of ever seeing the inside of a classroom. Although these two publications use very different approaches to present the data, I believe that the stories that we can find in them and that we can tell through them are equally evidence-based, clear, and compelling. So let's look at the benefits of these two approaches in more detail. We're going to start with explanation and discuss how we can provide guidance and reveal insights to the users. Our case study for exploration planetary visualization is the data-driven report for about the quality of life in Germany. Uh, it's a government report and it's entitled Wellbeing in Germany. Uh, it is designed to provide a qualitative and quantitative overview for citizens as well as government officials. When a user lands on the homepage, we explain the hierarchy of the indicators and dimensions of the underlying data set. We use this staggered animation to slowly build up the full scope of the report. 
This way we allow the user to ease into the, in the report without feeling overwhelmed by the amount of information that's present. Simple interaction enables the user to look around before they select uh, one uh, chapter to dive into. Once on a chapter page, the user can read through the report, which is accompanied by interactive charts and maps. Uh, the user can even place themselves in the data set by searching for the county where they're from. When the we use the user's scrolling and interaction to highlight areas of the visualization corresponding uh, to the explanations in the text that describe uh, what's shown and interpret the findings. At any point in time, the user is free and able to explore the visualization on their own terms. Besides the big hero visualization, additional charts and maps uh, present specific aspects in more detail and with a higher focus. Uh, for users with limited time and urgent needs, Wellbeing in Germany provides a summary sections of key insights at the end of each chapter. And for the more interested and advanced users, there is an indicated dashboard that uh, allows people to access the raw data uh, and download all the charts and maps as static images. So to summarize the benefits of explanatory visualization, um, the predefined structure of a narrative provides our audience with the necessary guidance to understand the full context uh, and allows us as the author to gradually reveal and highlight insights. Let's look at exploration and discuss how we can encourage inspection and validation. Our case study for exploratory visualization is a data platform about the state of the digital transformation worldwide published by the OECD called Going Digital Toolkit. Uh, it's designed to provide a benchmark for effective policy making. The dimensions included in the toolkit are access, use, innovation, jobs, trust, uh, society, and openness. Now the goal of the Going Digital Toolkit is to help countries assess their state of digital transformation and to formulate policy strategies in response. To help them do this, a user gains a global overview already on the homepage uh, and is able to roughly judge uh, how their country compares to the others. From here, uh, the user can dive into one of the dimensions and this dimension overview lists all the indicators in parallel and visualizes the status of a country along the horizontal axis. Uh, in this view, we also enable further exploration of the data, like direct comparison between, between individual countries. And then to drill down further, the user can select one individual indicators and go down to the detail view. Here the user is able to further evaluate the differences between countries. We provide time series data uh, for the exploration of trend and change over time. And whenever possible, we provide further breakdowns into sub-indicators to look at the same indicator from different lenses. Jumping ahead here. Um, lastly, we also included uh, pages of cross-cutting themes. These are topical collections of indicators from different dimensions. Uh, again, from here, the user can jump into individual indicators or look at all the indicators for the different dimensions. And you see that the visualizations are always used consistently, which makes it possible for users to navigate with ease and interact um, with the visualizations to draw conclusions um, uh, solidly. So to summarize the benefits of exploratory data visualizations, uh, the ability to independently inspect the visualization and validate the insights will empower the audience to ask questions, find answers, and draw conclusions. Theoretically, visualizations could be placed into the exploratory and explanatory dichotomy. Uh, I introduce them to you as user-driven versus author-driven visualizations. However, as we have seen through uh, our case studies, uh, many of the examples fall somewhere in between. Uh, and an important attribute of data communication uh, is its flexibility to combine both elements. We should uh, thus think of exploration and explanation as a spectrum, much rather than fixed silos. So, Exploratory elements invite users to participate, ask questions, and find their own answers. And 
explanatory elements allow, user, uh, allow us as the authors to guide the user, to steer the conversation and to define the message. So, but don't forget, uh, we don't have to limit ourselves to one or the other. There's plenty of room to experiment with combinations and hybrid approaches. I hope that my, uh, my examples have inspired you and that the principles will help you in your own work. Uh, I can't wait to see what everybody here uh, is building in the future, and please talk to me if I can be of any help. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Benjamin. Have we got any quick questions for Benjamin? Shoot your hands up very quickly. We have a question right here in the center. The microphone is coming to you first. If you just keep your hand up, uh, we can see. And if there's one more question to follow, just put your hand up so we know where to take the microphone to next. Thank you. Right. Uh, thank you for the extremely interesting presentation. I want to ask, uh, could you give an example of uh, somewhere where you would have to, where you've used both of these approaches, <clears throat> say where your website or your platform or whatever is targeting multiple aud audiences on one hand, academics and researchers who want to explore the data themselves. On the other hand, you're using uh, narratives, <coughs> narratives to present the report and uh, less interactive, maybe in guided data visualization. How, how does that work in your experience? Can these two worlds merge? Um, I do believe that yes, they, do, they can. Um, we saw an excellent example this morning from the Harvard Growth Lab where they follow exactly these two specific use cases, exploration and explanation in two different components of the same platform. Um, in the case of well-being in Germany, I think especially the indicator dashboard is more the exploration, uh, sort of like you jump directly to the indicator, you see all the facts. Um, you don't really get sort of like uh, guided through them, whereas the interactive report is this very sort of like structured narrative where you almost linearly basically follow uh, a path. Any other questions? Well, if you want to talk to Benjamin, I'm sure he'll be available this evening. And he's not too far away in Switzerland, from some of us at least. Anyhow, thank you so much once more. Next to the stage, I'd like to invite Juan Arevalo Torres, who's joining us from sunny Spain. Uh, at least it's been inside today. So Juan uses spatial data and open source software to inform decision makers and citizens in a participatory process. His work includes both private and public sector organizations, including the European Commission and the UN. Juan, we look forward very much to your talk. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lisa, for the introduction and would, for your perfect pronunciation of uh, my surname, because it's a <laughs> tricky one, in Spanish even. Um, so today I'm going to talk about the art of spatial storytelling or on how to create um, beautiful and visually attractive spatial storytelling tools that inspire actions from your users. Okay, so it's quite an ambitious presentation. Uh, a little bit about myself. Uh, I'm the managing director of Rambi. It's a small consultancy company based in the south of Spain, in, in Malaga, sunny place. And we apply different data science techniques and, and develop uh, web visualization tools for our clients. In addition to this, we are also involved in the Copernicus uh, program, and, and we work in the increasing uh, user uptake of the data and services developed by, by this program. And I would like to start with this quote that says that a picture tells a thousand words and a map tells a million. There was even a specific session today for spatial data. So that gives you an idea on the power of spatial information, and in particular of maps. And I bring here an, an example from the, the map of cholera from John Snow. And um, as you can see in the, in the map, well, this map was produced in the 19th century. At that time, cholera was thought to be spread by miasma in the air, okay? Not too related to water. But then John started to map the different cases, okay? And put them in a, in a map, the one that you see right now. And then it became clear that most of these cases were clustered around the water pump in Broad Street, okay? The red point that you see 
in the map. So with this example, um, it helps us to illustrate the power of maps and the power of spatial information in particular. But today I bring here uh, different tips okay, for spatial storytelling that you can use from tomorrow onwards, and I hope that they are also useful for, for your work, for the, the tools that you are developing. First one, it seems an obvious one, but it's learn cartography language. So even though if you know uh, cartography, it's always good to read and understand the rules of cartography, okay, before jumping into uh, different tools available that you can build beautiful, uh, attractive maps. It is important to understand the basics of cartography because maps are not always the best representation for spatial data, and that's also important. So that's why you need to know all the rules bef behind cartography in particular. So then you can jump in and start using Flores and other beautiful online services for creating attractive maps. But before jumping into those, you have to understand the symbology rules and, and so on. And there is also a story map that can be used for spatial storytelling, which is a very powerful tool as well that can be used for that purpose. Second tip is listen to your audience. Okay, This is not exclusive for spatial storytelling but it's a very important one. So it's very important to have uh, in mind your target audience, who is going to be the final user of your spatial storytelling, and involve them throughout the entire process of the development of the, of the tool. So this is an example of a, of a project in which I was recently involved in Burkina Faso, in which we decided the entire interface, all the colors, all the charts, everything was decided by the project stakeholders in, in, in Burkina Faso, with all the um, uh, authorities in Burkina involved in, the, in this particular project. So uh, the design, the colors that you see, uh, usually uh, what we do, we present different options to the stakeholders, and then they are the ones that decide how they want to visualize the data and, and, and the charts. Another tip that I bring here is, uh, um, well, instead of having just a plain storytelling tool, I think that it's important to include a call to action. Somehow to get more uh, your users involved in the story that you are developing. And, and by, I mean that um, there is something called collaborative storytelling. And I, I bring here an example on how this can be done. Uh, this is from the Prado Retiro Park in Madrid and they are trying to apply to become one of the World Heritage Sites from, from UNESCO. And part of the application is a story map, okay? And this, in this story map, users can actually upload pictures and tell stories that happen in the park to complement the, 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 the story no? that is already available online. So it's a, it's a more user-friendly, engaging way to interact with your users. Next one is look from the sky. I think that there is an enormous amount of data from satellite imagery coming from the Copernicus program, but not only. Uh, images also coming from UAVs, such as drones and so on. But their use in uh, spatial storytelling is very limited. Okay, um, So I think that there is an enormous opportunity with this uh, type of data and information. There are some tools that they are trying to improve this situation so you can access the data in a more uh, user-friendly way. This is just an example of those. This is the Earth Observation Browser that gives access to all the Copernicus uh, data in a more user-friendly way. You can create your own indicators and you can easily navigate through the, through the map and analyze all the images. And you can do this also these type of things. You can create these time animated um, images this is a lake not too far from my hometown in, in Malaga. And you can actually see how the water levels are changing over the year. This is the second largest uh, colony of flamingos in, in Europe. So as you can imagine, the water levels are crucial in that area. So you can tell many stories by uh, navigating and analyzing the satellite imagery that are available for free for anyone to use and to include in their storytelling. This is another example that we did for a forest fire in Spain again. And we combine earth observation data with wind speed and direction, okay, in a very user-friendly way. So users that they have their piece of land in that specific area could check the damage and assess the damage 
of, of their uh, piece of land by using this type of tool. So there is an enormous amount of data, and I think that there is an, an, a huge opportunity for us to, to, to make use of, of, of it. Next tip is be multilingual. Again, this is related to the target audience. So if you really want to, to reach them, you have to speak the local language. And I often see that spatial storytelling, uh, storytelling tools are often available only in English. That's good, but we need more. We need also the languages that local um, stakeholders use. This is an example of a tool that we developed last year for UNESCO. And we translated the entire interface. All the contents are available in four different languages, including uh, English, French, Spanish, and Arabic. And that was key to engage with the Moroccan and the Spanish authority, e authorities in, in this project. Next one is build interactive map prototypes. Um, I think, it's, as I said, from the very beginning, it's important to engage with your users. So now there are many different tools that you can use to produce uh, interactive mockups or screenshots of how your application is going to look like from the very beginning, before actually developing the tool itself. So in that sense, you can get, collect feedback immediately from the poten your potential users. So we use different tools in our company. We use Figma. Uh, we use InVision. There are many others. But as I said, um, maps are not always the best representation for spatial data. So please consider also including multimedia and charts to your map. This is just an example from zipmap.org that has a video explaining uh, the, with a very nice narrative the, the, the outcomes of, the, of this visualization. It takes you also to the hotspots areas in the, in the tool. This is a chart that we developed for the European Commission uh, in which you can actually see the trends of a particular indicator across regions and across countries. You can actually zoom in in the chart, uh, click on and, off, on and off on the different layers to understand and analyze the, the data. Um, another tip is make use of vector tiles. So for web mapping applications, vector tiles are uh, packages of geographical data that are op optimized for uh, data transfer on over the web. So they have many different advantages as, as compared to raster tiles um, because of the size, but also because they are becoming the facto mobile standard. So if you are considering developing a spatial storytelling tool, I think this is the technology that you should go for. Um, a good data visualization, and in particular a spatial storytelling tool, comes only from a great team. So you need at least a good graphic designer. You need a data scientist or cartographer, so with a good background in, in, in GIS, and as a good copywriter, of course. So at the, at the end of the day, you need a multidisciplinary team to be able to accomplish this type of, of projects. And last but not least, uh, I think that here in this room, we have the skills, we have the capacity to really make things uh, different and to make people aware of, many, of the many challenges that we are facing by using data and getting insights from this, from this data. So I invite everyone to, to, to really make the difference. So this is just a recap of, of my presentation of the tips that I bring here today, uh, which are learn cartography language, listen to your audience, call to action, look from the sky, be multilingual, build interactive map prototypes, add multimedia and charts to your map, make use of vector tiles, team up for a great, great uh, spatial data visualization, and let's make the difference. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Juan. Have we got any questions? I'm looking for the hands to shoot up. Nothing at the moment. No questions at all about spatial data viz. Not that are springing to mind right now. Um, I actually, one thing we spoke about before was um, the current limitations or the technical barriers that you have to face in your work. All right. I think it's an interesting question because. As I said, not mu much of the data that is being produced, especially Earth observation data and uh, other data coming from, from satellites, is not used because of the technical barriers, not the knowledge that you need to use the, these type of uh, data sources. 
So this process is now easier with this type of tools that I just presented with the Earth Observation Browser. But I think there is a still a long way to go in order to make this information accessible to data journalists, to other people that have no experience in remote sensing in particular on how to use those type of uh, images. Thank you, Juan. Any other questions for Juan? We have one just here. If you could keep your hand up so that Inmai knows where to take the microphone. Thank you. Thank you for a, a very interesting talk. My name is Darren McGarry from the European Commission Joint Research Centre. You mentioned in your talk about using different tools. Um, but very often in governmental organisations, sometimes the tools that have to be used are dictated beforehand. W would you agree that this is sometimes the wrong approach and that the tools that we use should be, should be, uh, uh, we, we should be guided by the messages, the type of messages and the interaction that we want to have with our stakeholders? I think that the tool shouldn't be a limitation for, 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 for the work, but I think that uh, public administration should be a little bit more flexible in the way that they, well, I, I understand that if the public administration is paying for a specific license for a software, they have to make use of it. But in some cases, I think that it makes sense to develop something ad hoc and even using open source software and tools. And at the end of the day, it's public money, so you should uh, make use of, of the resources in a, in a wise uh, way, no? And having all these tools in open source, I think that is, is really the way to go. And at the end of the day, in this particular domain, I think that there are, there are enough open source tools that can really tackle and, and, and solve all the, 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 the problems, no? In terms of data visualization. Thank you very much, Juan. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Next up, we have Caroline Goulard, who's come f this morning from Paris, in fact, and unfortunately has to leave us quite soon as well. Caroline studied journalism, media, and new technologies, and started her career, actually, as a data reporter, but didn't like the atmosphere in the French newsrooms. You found it individualistic and resistant to new technologies. And so she actually created DataVise at the end of her studies with two fellow students, and they're still your colleagues and co-founders today. Uh, you said that you feel you can mix your love of data viz with a journalistic eye. You work with large companies, public services and NGOs. And to quote you, I look for information inside the data. I try to find the right way to make it understandable to empower people thanks to this information. Caroline. Hello. Hello, everyone. Um, very happy to be with you today. Okay. So, um, I'm going to talk about Make the Invisible Visible. So, why this title? Um, often, when I have to present what we do at DataVise, I say that we are specialized in human data interactions because this is how we call what we do. We are working on data visualization and all the different kind of design that helps people understand data. So for you in this room, if I say that we are doing data visualization, you will probably uh, understand what we are doing. But outside this room, this is sometimes a bit complicated for people to understand. So I like to tell people that uh, I'm, I'm making the invisible visible, because this is impressive. And also because this is a, a definition of a job that I really like because it connects me to the founding fathers of uh, computing. This idea that computers are not only giant calculators, but interface and tools that will help humans better understand their world, tools that will uh, feed humans with insight to make them more able, more capable uh, to solve problems. And this is exactly the idea uh, I, I, I love with data visualization. It's the idea that data visualization are tools to end to augment humans. So this is the idea of uh, human augmentation, intelligence augmentation, thanks to interface, thanks to data visualization tools. So thanks to this interface, we uh, can't, as humans, we, we can understand some very complex data system that would otherwise re will remain invisible for us, not understandable for us. So let's talk about uh, the type of data visualization that really makes us able to see 
something we would not have been able to see otherwise, because that's not always the case with data visualization projects. Um, really often, data visualization is used to highlight something or to educate or to raise attention, but it's, uh, it's, it's quite rare at the end when a data visualization really produce some new information. When a data visualization create something that you will not have been able to see with just the figures or just a, a simple chart. So let's try to classify this type of data visualization. So first there are project data visualization that make us able to see something that is, is not visible, something that is out of reach of our field of perception. So for example, um, in the project I will show you, there are projects we created at Datavise and other projects uh, I like, because I like to share projects I, 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 I like. And uh, this one is a, a project uh, of um, um, uh, visualizing in uh, augmented reality the Wi-Fi signal and the radio signal around us. So the idea is that you have your iPad application and you see the signals uh, Wi-Fi signals around you, something that you would not have been able to see otherwise. So it makes you aware that there are lots of uh, signals around you. At Datavise, so this one is a project we created, uh, it's a project about uh, Bitcoin and blockchain. So the idea is that this is some, these digital transactions, they are quite uh, hard to understand because you, you don't have a mental image of them. So the idea is to visualize uh, the blockchain to make people better aware of how it works. So this was a, an interesting project we created at Database. So this was the first kind of data visualization that makes um, the invisible visible. There is another kind that makes visible by aggregation, by accumulation. The idea is that sometimes some phenomena are too tiny, too micro to be visible by the naked eye, and so you, you are only able to see them when you see them by uh, aggre uh, aggregated, accumulated. So for example, uh, if you go on Airbnb platform, you will see the different listing, the different uh, offers, but you don't really realize the amount of offers that are available in the city because you only see few of them. So this project created by Murray Cox, uh, it's called Inside Airbnb, and it's the aggregation of all the Airbnb statistics on a city. So you have several cities, and this makes you uh, aware of how many, uh, uh, how many different um, uh, annons there is on Airbnb. Uh, you, you can see according to the different neighbors and the price and those kind of things. So you, you can discover something you won't have been able to see other way just by accumulation. Another uh, interesting uh, uh, movement is the quantified self movement. The quantified self movement is the idea that you are collecting data on yourself to better understand how you behave. And uh, for example, the Apple Health application makes you able to collect data on your uh, sport activities and also on your what you eat, uh, how many times you sleep. And this way you are able to see some patterns that you would not have been able to see otherwise. So for example, you can see that uh, you have better sport performance if you go running in the afternoon or on the morning, or I don't know. So the idea is to take a step back by looking at your, stat your own uh, statistics. Another kind of data visualization that makes visible the invisible is data visualization that sees some, uh, that shows some um, uh, patterns by special arrangements, uh, by giving a physical form to data. And the example behind uh, has been created by Autodesk, and it's a visualization of their managerial organization a long time. So this idea is, is just um, the link between people inside the organization. So uh, each node is a person, and the, the link are the hierarchical relation between them, and you see along the time the evolution of the structure of the organization. This is something that cannot be seen other way. Uh, this is here, it's the actual positioning in space that makes the trend visible. And at Datavise, we also have played with this kind of um, relation and and um, uh, spatialization of this of the information with the Metropolitan Project. So here the idea is to visualize the Paris metro network, but instead of presenting it in a geographic reference uh, system, we uh, show the, sta the stations 
in a temporal reference system. So this way, um, if you click on a station, on the first uh, circle you have the, the other station that can be reached in less than 10 minutes and after that in less than 20 minutes and so on. And it really uh, shows you a different image of the city. Uh, this image better reflects the accessibility of the city. So here we create information thanks to specialization. And just to finish with uh, this um, typology of data visualization, uh, we can finish with this uh, idea that some data visualization just reveal something that was not expected to be visible. And here we have the Strava case. So Strava is the, the activity tracking application and they posted an online map containing all the recorded tracks of millions of users, so anonymized, all over the world. And a young uh, passionate about cartography discovered that you can see in this uh, map some human activities in sensitive areas close to a uh, war zone in the Middle East. So it was uh, uh, the soldiers that were using Strava application to collect their own personal data when they are running. But uh, with this map that uh, is sharing all the data collected on Strava anonymized, you can see where those soldiers were running, even if you don't see which soldier it was. But it can trace the geographical delimitation of uh, military bases, so it's, uh, it can jeopardize some military operations, so it has been uh, quite, a, quite a sensible thing. So, at the end, what can be learned from this attempt to categorize data visualization that turn the invisible into visible? What we can see is that most part of this pro project, they um, visualize a certain type of data, which uh, are data that are disaggregated, atomic, uh, data that have been collected at the finest scale, very large number of, uh, of points. And in reality, those data, there are mm, quite often anonymized personal data. So whether it's data that have been voluntarily collected by users, such as uh, for Strava, or uh, collected as a consequence of users' online activity, like Airbnb, for example. So the conclusion is our ability to make the invisible visible uh, is our ability to visualize very massive data set of anonymized personal data. And this is quite interesting that personal data uh, can have a collective dimension, this idea that when we visualize those anonymized personal data, we can create information, we can make visible something that were invisible because it can also be like a proactive citizen action, something uh, that you will voluntarily assume. Uh, I will collect data and share with other citizens to enrich the collective knowledge. For example, I can, sh I can share my health data with, with the Cancer Research Institute. So there are some very interesting projects. Um, I just uh, put one here, which is Data Canvas. So it's um, a project of a do-it-yourself do sensor network to measure pollution, dust, light, sound, tem temperature, lots of things. So the idea is that when you are contributing on the project Data Canvas, you deploy your own sensor uh, at your local level, so in different cities, different continents. They open the data. There is a platform. You can upload your data, download the data of other sensors. And after that, you can visualize the data. And so this example uh, is really interesting for me because in this case, the collective personal data helps document, it help document the city. And cities are becoming very super complex ecosystem at the moment. That's why we're talking about smart cities. Uh, we are using data to uh, improve the way we manage the infrastructure, the networks. And this is where collective personal data can become very interesting because um, we have the data collected by the city, by uh, the sensors, uh, the infrastructures. We have data collected by um, uh, private companies, for example, when they operate networks. And we have data collected by citizens and shared by citizens. And this can bring uh, cities from smart cities to cognitive cities. What are cognitive cities? What we call cognitive cities, it's learning cities, cities that uh, are using machine learning and that are able to capitalize on, pat on past experience to improve their governments. So it's the idea that thanks to the personal collective data uh, people are sharing, cities will be better able to adapt to a very complex environment. So at the end, uh, you have seen how we move from um, the idea to make the invisible visible 
to the idea of cognitive theories thanks to the type of data that I used for that. And uh, probably uh, a job as a data visualization designers and developers will evolve to be better able to help people collect this collective personal data to protect their, uh, their um, privacy with this data and then to visualize this data. Thank you. Thank you so much, Caroline. Have we got any questions for Caroline? Ah, oh, yes, but, but Simon. <laughs> <laughs> Any further questions just so we know where the, the microphone should go afterwards? Uh, so, Simon Steuer, Publications Office. I get the idea to make visualizations look nice and cool and everything, but when do we reach a point where it's too fancy, too cool, and we actually lose the information? Yeah, that's always a difficult balance. Um, there is a debate. And it always depends on who you are talking to. Because sometimes you can uh, see that doing too much data visualization, too much shiny things, it, um, it uh, prevents you from focus on the right information. But sometimes it really helps people to get interested in a subject. And this is something you can really see uh, when doing user research and user testing. And when you are doing user research search and you see people that uh, would otherwise won't give any attention to a subject and now they feel they can be um, able to understand that. So the idea is really that this beauty sentiment, the beauty feeling, it helps people have the feeling that they are able to understand that because it, it appeals to something that is not uh, their um, uh, they, they don't feel they have to, to, to be smart, they just feel they have to, okay, have a look. And uh, it's, it's, sometimes it works. <laughs> Any further questions? One, the, yes, there's one here and there's one over there as well, the other side. Um, hello, Caroline. Um, by making the invisible visible, are you not afraid that, that sometime you will actually reveal data that should not be revealed? Um, I think the, the Strava example was quite frightening. So uh, where is the, the limit? What, what do you think? Yeah, the limit is, um, is uh, having your own headache. He and uh, of course, if you see that something you are visualizing and sharing can jeopardize some uh, other's security, you have to deal with that problem and uh, decide by uh, discussing with uh, other people uh, what you have to do. But um, this is a broader problem that data visualization is. Each time you are looking for information, each time you are uh, trying to find some new information, you have the risk to find something that can jeopardize some other security. That's not really new. But in, just to follow up on that, when it came to the Strava, who was, who was responsible? Should it have been someone at Strava? I mean, it, the, that kind of leads to the question that somebody needs to be put in place to be responsible for the ethics. In this case, um, I, I'm not sure Strava was aware before uh, this person... And Which is the point leading to the question, who, who should be responsible? Yeah. Um, probably um, in the, the soldiers need to be aware that using Strava is, use, is they are sharing their data even anonymously, but on Strava you can um, you can choose if you are sharing your data anonymously or not. So I'm not saying that it was the soldiers' fault because maybe they are not uh, enough aware about uh, the, the dangers. But I'm saying we are all responsible for bringing a world where people are more aware about what's the implication of sharing data, of using this kind of um, quantified self or, or tracking activities data. And the problem nowadays is that people are at the same time using lots of applications uh, where they share data and at the same time uh, really frightened about uh, their privacy, about what, uh, what they're doing with my data and so on. And the, 
they are, the problem is that they are not really aware about how these services work and uh, we need to, we have a responsibility to better explain, to, to create applications that are more transparent, that, um, that explain clearly to people what, uh, what has been doing with their data and so on. So as a designer, we have this responsibility to create better applications that uh, make people better aware of this uh, data phenomenon. I think we have one more question this side. Uh, hi, um, uh, Alex Chandler. I work for the National Health Service in Scotland, uh, in the UK. We have a lot of patient level data, um, so the absolute smallest you can get. When we aggregate up, we find, do we, do we make what we're trying to make the visible? We make the invisible. Um, so the other way around, in, in terms of where our small populations are in the Highlands and the Islands of Orkney and Shetland, that we hide that by trying to aggregate up to the big cities in Glasgow and Edinburgh. Yes, and there is, here again, there is a balance between um, visualizing too small um, size of uh, populations and taking the risk to uh, endanger the privacy and uh, revealing something that can be interested if you don't aggregate the data. So, yeah, <laughs> you have to take your own responsibility and uh, put the safety of uh, privacy and safety of uh, uh, the anonymity, the, um, the, yeah, the anonymization of data first. Any last questions for Caroline? Well, with that, thank you so much, Caroline. I know you have to leave for Paris quite soon. Thank you. Thank you once more. And I'm sure if you want to get in touch with Caroline, you can contact her through DataVise. It really was a very impressive talk. Up next, we have a trio of physicists. Just give me a few minutes to introduce them because it will take me some time and it's 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 really worth staying for, for what they have to talk about. Uh, just, just try to wake up the brains a little bit because we're going to go from the tiniest particles to outer space with, with you three. Just to firstly introduce you, Bartolome von Haller, both you and Jeremy are from CERN, um, the Center for Scientific Research, uh, which is rather close by as well. So thank you so much for, for jumping over to us here in Luxembourg. Bartolome, I asked you to tell me a little bit about yourself and, and you told me one of your oldest childhood memories is asking yourself the question, what would happen if I hoovered myself? And, and you went on to hoover yourself and you found out you, you did not aspirate, you're still here, so that's great. And then you built uh, the very first website about bars in your city when you were about 17. Which city was this? Geneva, okay, <laughs> with a friend. So you didn't move far then, but <laughs> No, not at all. <laughs> with a friend, and in the process of building this bar website in Geneva, the first one ever, you got free drinks and managed to get advertising as well. But now your time is a little bit more pressed. Despite working at CERN, you also have two little girls. Jeremy, Jeremy Nigella is also um, a researcher at CERN, and I asked Jeremy um, to tell me a little bit about himself. And I know the web was created at CERN, but almost instantaneously I got an essay back, which I've encouraged you to upload in the presenter notes at the end, because it, it was so fascinating. But I've tried to just condense this essay a, a small bit. Um, you, you said that, uh, well, I mean, the curiosity shows the nature of the physicist. You said, what does it mean to see or hear? What is perception? What we see is connected to photons, to nuclear fusion in the stars, our sun. Different elements produce different colors. And then where and how did our stars begin? So that this is not how most people answer the question, what does it mean to see or hear? But it's definitely what a physicist might think, or at least a, a, a young one, when you were thinking about these questions when you were younger. And so the physics or the science mind is very much like a date of his mind in that changing the perceptions allows us to make different judgments and observations. Um, you also go on to say how when you were young, the film The Matrix, even though you didn't quite understand and you asked your father to 
sort of explain, you could probably explain it better to him now, perhaps. I don't know whether he's a physicist. Dali's paintings and thoughts about the fourth dimension, which moves on to 10 or 11 dimensions with string theory, Rubik's hypercube, hypercube and, um, and you love sitting at the forefront of knowledge at CERN, you know, from just having to think very, very hard with the very difficult work, it's, it's outweighed by a laureate for lunch. And, and finally, I'd like to welcome you, Oliver James, coming to us this morning from the UK. Uh, Oliver James is the chief scientist with DNEG. Um, you combine your background in physics also with photography and computing to the visual effects world of television. He's worked on some incredibly famous movies, which include Harry Potter and the Order of the Phoenix, The Matrix Reloaded, perhaps you can have a conversation later, <laughs> and, and you've also worked on James Bond, Quantum of Silence, I mean, it, it's Quantum of Solace, not Silence, um, just to name but a few. And um, now you're with DNEG. Um, you've, uh, DNEG is a company which has won four of the last five Oscars for visual effects, including what we will see more of later, which is Interstellar. So we're going to hear from all three of them now. So please, it's a fantastic end to the day. Thank you so much for coming to Luxembourg, and we really look forward to hearing you. Thank you. <coughs> Do you hear me? Yes. <laughs> That's good. Okay. So, uh, thank you for the introduction. And really, it is a pleasure for us to be here today to talk about visualizing the cosmos. We will start with the visualization of its tiniest components. However, before we can speak in a meaningful way of the visualization at CERN, I need to introduce a number of concepts and topics. And this is what I will do in part one. I will take care of this long introduction, not too long, uh, don't, don't be afraid. And I will set the scene for Jeremy to talk about the visualization itself at CERN. And then in part three, Oliver will discuss the other uh, side of the spectrum with very massive objects visualization. Let's start with CERN. CERN is the world's largest physics laboratory. It is located in Geneva, in Switzerland, and it was founded in 54 by 12 countries to revive physics and science in Europe after the war, and also to promote peace through science. Today, we have 23 countries who are full member, and the organization has become a worldwide organization. It has been assigned four missions. Research, of course, but you know, often we don't even have the tools to carry out our research. So we have to develop and invent new technologies. Fortunately, most of the time we are able to, to give back these technologies to society, as was the case for the web uh, 30 years ago now, uh, what we commonly call the internet. Also, touch screens were invented at CERN as a mean to control the accelerator in the 70s already. We also contribute to other fields by developing, for example, the PET scan or the hadron therapy to detect and treat cancer. These byproducts of our research are really important because our research itself will not impact our life, your life, before dozens of years. But this hopefully does impact your life. The third mission is collaboration. It's not only a mission, it's also the necessary mean for us to have the experience and the knowledge to achieve our research goals. And finally, education is the fourth mission. And first of all, we, it's because our projects will span over decades. So we need to make sure that the next generation of physicists engineers is ready to continue our work and to run high energy physics experiments. But also, and maybe even more importantly, many of these young scientists, they go back to their country at some point, and they bring back the knowledge and the experience they have acquired at CERN, and not only in academia, but more pro prominently in the private sector. To carry out those four missions, we are 3,500 fellows and staff, uh, serving the more than 14,000 so-called users, professors, PhD students, scientists from other institutes who are working with our infrastructure remotely or on-site. All these people, those 
thousands of people work together to answer questions, fundamental questions about our universe. How did universe look like at the origin? What is dark matter? Why is there almost no antimatter? And many, many more questions. At CERN, what we do is fundamental research. So even though we develop some technologies along the way, the ultimate goal is to answer such fundamental questions. And to answer them, there are different ways. For example, to understand how the universe looked like at the origin, we need to reproduce these conditions. To understand antimatter, we need to produce it and look at it. And for many other questions, we have theories, we have models, but they assume new particles exist. So we have to produce them, observe them. And in the end, for all these ways, what we actually need are high energy particle collisions. How do we do that? Well, we need a tool. We need a very large tool. This is the world's largest particle accelerator, and as a matter of fact, it's the world's largest tool. It is called the Large Hadron Collider, the LHC. 100 meters below the ground, in a 27 kilometer long tunnel, particles are accelerated close to the speed of light, and they collide in four points where particle detectors will record the collisions. Those detectors are called ALICE, ATLAS, LHCB, and CMS. We started operating this enormous device 10 years ago. It operates, it runs at a temperature that is close to the lowest possible temperature, minus 271 degrees. This is colder than outer space. And actually, the vacuum inside the pipes is more empty than outer space. We need a lot of energy to run this device, and we consume about the same amount of electricity as the whole city of Geneva, but we think it's worth it. <laughs> <laughs> and um, this tool can uh, accelerate different type of particles, the protons and some heavy ions. Now, some of you might remember what a proton or a heavy ion is. For the others, uh, let's remember what is matter. Matter is everything around us. It is the floor, the furniture, but also the air we are breathing. You are made of matter. And matter is made of molecules, which are groups of atoms. Here we have a molecule which is made of six atoms. And this is an atom. It is made of a nucleus with electrons orbiting around it. If one or more of these electrons is missing, then we have got an ion. Now, if we zoom on the nucleus, we see that there are actually two components, like many protons, many uh, sorry, many protons and many neutrons, green and red. And if we zoom on one of those, we see they are themselves made of three quarks. Okay. Now, we have six types of quarks. You follow me, right? <laughs> so we have six types of quarks in addition to the six other fundamental particles. Most of them are not stable. They exist for a fraction of time. Only the three I highlighted are stable. And everything around you are made of those three quarks, tiny, tiny, tiny things. In addition to that, and finally, we have a number of forces governing those particles. The mediators of those forces are called bosons. Now, you don't know what it is, but maybe you have heard of the Higgs boson that we discovered not long ago at CERN. It is the big H, I'm not sure I can point it, but the big H is Higgs. So in the end, what we call the standard model describes a number of fundamental particles interacting via a number of forces. Everything is made of just of that. We can explain everything almost with that. That's all for physics. Okay, now we go back to our accelerator. No, I I'm kidding, there, are, there is more actually. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so we have collisions between two particles that are going very fast. First of all, many of you have probably seen this equation already. This is a famous equation from Einstein, E equal mc square. What it means for you is that energy can be transformed into matter and vice versa. When two particles collide, 
all their energy, all their speed is transformed into matter. They go almost at the speed of light, so they have a lot of energy. And this is why, when they collide, we have many new fresh particles created and scattering in all directions. They are not pieces of the original two particles. They are new particles, ex nihilo. Some of them are positively charged, and some of them are negatively charged, and you see that they bend in the opposite direction. In addition, some of them are also unstable. We have seen that many particles are unstable, and they decay into other particles. There are a few rules for that. In general, I mean, the, the energy must always remain the same, globally, and the charge must also be preserved. This is why, if we look at the green one, it goes straight, it means it's neutral, and then it decays into a positive and a negative particle. This is to preserve the charge. Now, we want to record those collisions and their properties. So what we do is we build a detector, or many detectors, around the collision points. And then, when a particle will progress through the detectors, it will leave some traces, electronic impulses that carry information about them and that we call hits. So what we see first is this type of pictures with many hits. And we will first compute the location and quantity of energy I for each of those hits and translate them in, in a way that computers can understand. Then we have specialized programs that will connect the hits together and assign them to the tracks. So those are the reconstructed trajectories. Now here, all you have to understand is that it's, it's like those games for the kids where you connect the dots. The difference is that we have up to a million points. We have no numbers to help us and many, many images on top of each other. <laughs> That's really difficult. Believe me, it's really difficult. So we also proceed with particle identification at this stage. So we try to, to know what particles we are dealing with because this is the only way to correctly, properly draw those tracks, including some pieces that are actually missing in the detector. So at this stage, we finally have the high-level properties of the collision and the particles. We have to filter, transport, process this data, record it. To give you an idea of the scale of this task, let's have a look at how we operate the accelerator throughout the years. We always run three years in a row. Day, nights, holidays, we almost never stop. And then we break for two years to upgrade the detector, to maintain the accelerator, do the software, and so on. And then we restart for three years. Now, if we focus on one year, we know we have 365 days in a year. And in a day, I tell you, we have 1,440 minutes. Now, in one minute, we have 60 seconds. It means that in a year, we have more than 3 million seconds. And each of those 3 million seconds, we have 600 million collisions. That's a tremendous amount of data to record. And the reality is we don't. We don't record all of that. Most of it we filter out because it doesn't really present an interest. In the end, we keep between 1,000 and 100,000 colli uh, collisions per second. That's a lot of data. Take ALICE. The ALICE experiment will produce 4 terabytes per second. That's like one large hard drive every second all the time. It doesn't stop. Three years. And then we have a large farm and we immediately start processing it and we bring it down to about 90 gigabytes per second. That's 23 DVDs every second. Okay, still a lot. Now, if we look at Atlas experiment at the bottom, you see that they are producing the equivalent of 25 hard drives every second. But they are able to bring it down to one DVD. All in all, in the 10 past years, we have produced 200 petabytes of data that we have stored. And that's the equivalent of 50 million DVDs. If we were to stack them on top of each other, that would be a, a stack as high as one and a half times the circumference of the Earth. That's a lot, a lot of data. And yet we have to make sense of it. And one way to do so is via visualization. And now, Jeremy will say more about that. Thank you. Okay. 
So one of the definitions says that visualization is any technique for creating images, diagrams, and animations to communicate a message. And I want to emphasize that visualization is all about conveying a message. But it is also a tool that is very popular among scientists and physicists. Mm -hmm. In this part of the talk, I will try to explain you different uses of visualizations at CERN. But before that, let me start with a basic visualization. This, of course, is a map of average temperature. It brings a very simple message, namely that temperature close to the equator is high and it decreases when we move toward poles. This may seem obvious to everyone in this room now, but it was not always the case. And part of the reason why this is obvious is because everyone has seen such maps somewhere. It's beautiful, it relates to things that we already know, which is the shape of the continents, and therefore it sticks in memory. And this makes it a very good visualization. Moving on to the second example, let's jump to 17th century, when people believed that the moon, just like all other celestial objects, are perfect spheres made of quintessence. The Earth was in a completely different category. It was a special point in the universe. And then Galileo made an observation through a telescope when he noticed that actually the moon has craters and valleys and mountains, just like Earth. He encoded all this in this single, simple picture. And at that time, this picture was conveying a very important and controversial message that maybe Earth is not so special after all. And actually, this costed Galileo a house arrest. Next example is a visualization from the high-energy physics world, and it's connected with the Higgs boson that Bart mentioned. I could go for this long te text on the right to explain you what the Higgs boson is, but I can also use this image on the left. <coughs> so the yellow lines that you see in the center are tracks of particles, such as electrons and protons, registered in the CMS detector. Back in the uh, 60s, people already knew quite a lot about them, but they didn't really know why do they have mass. In 1964, Peter Higgs and others proposed a solution for this problem, which required to introduce a new particle, which is the Higgs boson. It was also deduced back then that the Higgs boson, among other possibilities, could decay to two Z bosons that then decay into four muons. The four red lines that you can see in this picture are four muons registered by the CMS detector. So this event display brings a very important message. Back in 2012, we have observed for the first time something that looks just like the Higgs boson. This process can be visualized at many different levels. What you see in this picture is almost a raw readout from the detector. This could be useful for detector experts to understand if the detector performs well and how particle interacts with different layers of the detector. Then we can extract higher level information from this raw readout, such as what you can see in this plot. This is very meaningful for physicists. Basically, this bump that you can see tells us that most probably there was a particle of a mass of around 125 GeV that decays to two photons. We can also so show the same phenomenon in a picture like this one from Atlas experiment, where you see these two yellow towers, which are two photons that could come from the Higgs boson decay. This one doesn't prove anything because this is just a single collision, but it's the simplest of all those three. So this is probably the one that we would use for communication purposes. So what I'm trying to say in this slide is that one should adjust the level of visualization and the information based on the target audience. Next phenomenon is the quark-gluon plasma, which is a very hot and dense state of matter that existed in the very early universe. When we collide heavy ions at LHC, we can actually reproduce this state of matter that then evolves and transforms into thousands of particles. These colorful lines that you can see in this picture are tracks of particles registered by the ALICE detector. Different colors enco encode different species. For instance, blue is an electron and green is a muon. So this picture actually also conveys an important message. LHC can de deliver high, uh, high energy 
heavy ion collisions, which help us to reproduce conditions that existed just a fraction of a second after the Big Bang, and we can register products of its evolution to studies. Just like with the Higgs boson, this process can also be uh, visualized at many different levels. What you see in this picture are hits in one of the ALICE detectors that then reconstruction algorithms connect into tracks. Such, vi such visualization could be useful for reconstruction experts to understand whether algorithms per perform well or not. Then we can use these tracks to create beautiful pictures like this one that ended up on caps and t-shirts for certain visitors. But we can also analyze those tracks and create a formal plot like this one that to physicists conveys an important message which is that all particles and antiparticles composed of free quarks interact in a very similar way. Next one is a little bit more advanced 3D visualization together with a diagram that helps to understand what you can see in the main picture. Before 2015, existence of particles composed of five quarks was only hypothetical. It was deduced that it could be produced when this lambda particle decays into a kaon and pentaquark. Then the pentaquark, which is the particle composed of five quarks, decays into two muons and a proton. What you can see in the main picture are exactly those four particles. So again, this single picture encodes an important message. In 2015, we observed a pentaquark for the first time. Okay, now let's move away from collision visualizations for a moment and focus on a question. Can a photon, which is a particle of light, bounce off another photon? So notice that this time we will talk about visualization of a process rather than the data. We could start with an oversimplified picture like this one in which, referring to your everyday life experience, I would try to convince you that this is impossible. But we can also draw a more forma formal diagram like, like this one on the right, which to physicists mean that um, we have two heavy ions, for instance, passing each other in the LHC pipe, emitting two photons that then interact through a loop of electrons and end up back as two photons which, believe me, essentially is light-by-light light scattering. <laughs> if you rotate and color this diagram a bit, actually it starts to look just like the lightsaber from the left. What is interesting here is that we can draw such diagrams to predict very unintuitive processes and then test them in the experiment. And as it turns out, this process is actually possible and it has been observed for the first time this year at the LHC. The two red towers that you can see in this picture are two photons, and as you can see, there is no other activity in the detector, which is exactly what we expect for light-by-light -light scattering. This, again, doesn't prove anything, because, it's, because this is just a single example, but we can also plot a more formal picture, like this one. And what you can see here in this histogram in, or in purple, the background is what we would expect if this process is impossible. In orange, signal, is our expectation if light by light can occur. This little black square here is the measurement from the LHC data, which as you can see, sits right on top of the orange bar, which is a proof for us that this process is possible. And there are many more examples of collision uh, visualizations that are used at CERN. They all communicate important messages, such as production of a new particle, observation of a new process, or simply saying that the detector that we've built proves to work very well. But static 2D visualizations of extremely small things are not the only visualizations that we do at CERN. Sometimes we want to visualize large objects too, and one of the most interesting things to see when coming to CERN is the Large Hadron Collider. Unfortunately, most of the time, access to the tunnel is not possible. ACVIS, or Accelerator Visualization, is a project that tries to address this issue with virtual reality. It allows our visitors to put on VR headsets and feel like they are in the tunnel, as well as to interact and read descriptions of different parts of the accelerator. 
And there also exists a more complex version of this application, which is useful for technicians and accelerator experts. This helps them to prepare in advance for intervention for, will, for which they will have very limited time by reading documentation and interacting with every screw and every cable that builds the LHC. In the last part of the talk, I would like to focus on outreach-oriented uh, outreach visualization only, like this one that ended up in news worldwide, mainly because it's colorful, it catches the eye, but also because it conveys an important message, which is that we can collide heavy ions with extreme energies and reproduce the very early universe's condition. So here I wanted to show you an artistic project of Tim Motorov, who during a prestigious prize-giving ceremony placed a spherical mirror in the center of the room. Then he scattered laser beams from this mirror, but while doing that he was actually fetching online data from the LHC collisions. Angles at which these rays scatter from the mirror actually correspond to directions of particles produced in a real collision in real time and different colors encode different energies. So as you can imagine, this provided a truly unique experience to the audience and it presents another use of visualization which is to catch people's attention and in this case make them interested in high energy physics. And the last example is another artistic project of Laura Kutarosado. Um, she also used LHC data, but this time to deform 3D shapes according to momenta of particles in a collision. It started with uh, static pictures and animations, as those that you can see in the top row. Then it was used as a background for popular science talks, and finally ended up as a 3D printed model. I believe that looking at such animation or holding such object in your hand leaves you with no choice but to contemplate and think about, about what does it mean er, and where, where does it come from. So to conclude this part, I hope that I convinced you that visualization is all about conveying a message, but it's also a very useful tool for physicists, for scientists at CERN. One of the important aspects of visualization at CERN is public engagement. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm sure many of us have been just absolutely blown away and inspired by, by this. It almost makes any other sort of data visualization seem possibly easy. <laughs> and <laughs> and <laughs> when you said uh, you, you don't have that much of a background in physics, I know you did it at Oxford, so it's a little bit like Einstein saying he wasn't very good at maths. It's because you're comparing yourself to a Nobel yeah. laureate. <laughs> <laughs> So, have we any questions? Oh, we do, we have. Here we go. I'm a little bit nervous because <laughs> perhaps what I'm going to say makes me nervous, actually. And I, I, I have to tell you that I don't know what you did with us, but you did something. <laughs> <laughs> and it's, it's a little bit strange because I work with scientists continuously. I'm an editor, I work on communication, I work with data visualization too. And I always find very difficult to convince our, my colleagues that we have to um, produce material, material that engages the public, the public that actually are paying our salaries here in the commission. Huh? Mm -hmm. And well, you just did that. You did this now, and you are a scientist. So, uh, I'm a little bit, my, my mind is a little bit blown up because <laughs> you did something that I, I, I'm not able to, to, to reproduce. Uh, thank you. And, uh, and I think that this engagement that we have to create and actually data visualization help to this, it's a moral uh, duty we have because especially now that we see that Europe is in a kind of... Uh, uh, there is something that is trying to tire apart uh, the European Union. There is these uh, uh, centrifugal forces that are uh, working with Europe. With I think that we actually have to do something, and data visualization helps. Today I, he I heard three times here some people, sorry, they are my colleagues from the Commission, but I have to say this. Three times I, I heard 
today here in this very room, someone said, mm, different people saying, hey, but don't you think that we go perhaps too fancy doing these things? Well, I, I think, and I don't know what you think about this, that uh, the, our public, our citizens today, they have a different graphic vision of the world. And when I speak about graphic, I speak about graphic design and I speak, I speak about all this. Uh, so we, yes, I think we have to produce fancy stuff that actually bring the public to us. And we are Europe, we are the commission and we have to try to keep Europe uh, the way it has been ruling the last 70 years, without, uh, 50 years at least, without any, any problem. And data visualization, I think, helps also. Fancy things. Yeah. I, I'm not quite sure whether that was a question or a statement. It was not a question, actually. <laughs> but I know uh, that you I, spent I, I want to know what you think about this. <laughs> I, since you're so good at reformulating the questions for Kip, firstly reformulate the question and then <laughs> answer. I, I think this question is more, more about the role of uh, data visualization to somehow form coherent images or coherent ideas. Um, I'm w one of the takeaways I took from, from working with Kip was the importance of understanding what the problem is you're trying to solve before trying to solve it and not because what I found I used to do is sort of muddle up the whole process of solving question understanding it and coming up with a solution um, and by formally sort of separating them spending time actually understanding the problem you're trying to solve before coming up with the proposed solution I think that that's uh, it seems obvious when you mention it but you know, a lot of people don't do that. A lot of, a lot of politicians don't do that. They, they'll present you with a perceived solution and try and get um, try and get support for that without really understanding the, the problems they're trying to solve. Um, I don't get, <laughs> 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 but m maybe my colleagues from CERN have a better idea because CERN was really set up for European unity. Yes. So just on the fanciness, I think what we are dealing with is so complicated that there is a lot of margin before we are too fancy when we, we present them. Uh, <laughs> we, we could oversimplify, but this is all up. It depends on the audience. And um, I don't see it as a risk, really. I don't know what you think, Jeremy. I agree that, as I said, we should adjust the uh, level of visualization based on, uh, on the situation. Of course, in every uh, everyday technical meetings, I will not uh, show visualizations with fancy animations and so on, because at that, at that occasion, this is just a tool. But to engage people, I see nothing wrong in uh, creating an artistic installation that just makes them interested in the field without going into any details. And then maybe some of them will, uh, will read a bit more, will ask questions. So I think that uh, depending on the situation, we can be very pragmatic or very fancy. Just add one more thing to that, which is when, when we're creating images for movies, the one thing we're trying to avoid is disengaging our audience. So we can create these fantasy worlds, but we can, we can bring the audience with us, but we can lose them in an instant. So we try and make our images look as if they're taken by real cameras. So we'll model not only the, the, the lenses, we'll model all the chromatic aberrations, lens distortion, lens flare, all these are, are modeled on real lenses. Uh, so we'll take the exact copies of the ones that Chris Nolan will use um, and take experimental pictures to try and capture those properties. And I know actually um, before, a couple of weeks ago, we were talking and just with the, the you, Jeremy and uh, Bart, about how long it takes in discussion with your editorial team. Maybe you would like to talk to the audience a little bit about how long it takes before you get the visualizations yeah. <coughs> out? So it will, of course, depend on the context and the audience and what we are actually showing. But it's true that if we, in the case of physics, when we have to get the, I mean, yeah, that uh, some plots, for example, are accepted or some publications, it can take up to months. Now, for just the press uh, nice pictures in the Alice experiment, it will be several days with reviews from physicists. So this is really, it can be pretty long. On the other hand, if it's an internal meeting and we want to share things, then of course there is, there is no process, right? Any further questions? Yes, we have one here. Anyone else with a question so we know where to go to after this question? 
do you think that the uh, one uh, the visualization will be uh, uh, successful in the moment that you feel less stupid about the complexity that you have to uh, analyze before it means do you think that now a kid will understand what is a black hole a child you say yeah a child so uh, i've given this similar presentations from to schools from ages of about 10 upwards and it's actually the kids give the most interesting questions <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's no reflection on you <laughs> <laughs> Give us an example of one of those interesting children's questions. Uh, one kid asked how we know where black holes actually exist. And that, that was great because it was only a, a few weeks after the gravitational wave discovery. So I could use that as an example to show that there's, there's actually hard evidence of direct measurements from a black hole or a pair of black holes. A final question. Anywhere in the room? Ah, yes, we have one question here. So, the creating the images uh, was about one year, from start to finish. Although we had our first first images within about four days, so the rest of it was polishing. Um, I then actually worked uh, probably another six months on the paper, so producing those papers. <laughs> And I, uh, somehow my boss has just left me alone. They, they said, what's Oliver doing? And they, he's doing stuff with Kip, leave him alone. And uh, so uh, very thankful that they gave me the freedom to do that. One question here. So what next, now that you've done this? If you could work on any project, what would you like to visualize? Uh, <laughs> there are so many things. Uh, I, I think it would be fun to, to be able to access some of CERN's data and be able exactly. to exactly <laughs> be able to see if we can create tools that artists can take the amazing data that they've produced, uh, make it available to some of our world class artists, and see what they can come up with. That's what I'd really like to do. We really look forward into this <laughs> collaboration. <laughs> Well, I think that's a perfect uh, question to end the, this phenomenal talk. Uh, thank you all so much. Thank you. <laughs> For the closing remarks, we now welcome the president and co-founder of the Lisbon Council, Paul Hofheinz. Is it on now? Yeah. Thank you. I don't have a presentation. Um, I'd like to say uh, a couple of things. I have to do a lot of public speaking, and I have a couple of general rules that I try not to, vi not to violate. One of them is never speak to an audience that knows more about a topic than you do. And I'm clearly violating that today. The presentations today have been absolutely fantastic. Uh, from morning uh, right through the one we just had. And one of the other rules is never, ever, ever present after a team of scientists from CERN <laughs> <laughs> and the guy who did the visuals for The Matrix and Interstellar. So um, if I had a way of weaseling out of this at this point, I would, but I've been here all day and I am in the program. So um, I will try and pull together a few very short comments. Uh, that would maybe be the other thing I would say, uh, which is um, I'm the only thing standing between you and a drink um, and uh, so I'm not going to go on and on, and I'm certainly not going to repeat any of the things that were said here today, or at least I'll try not to. Um, I thought this was an incredibly exciting meeting, and um, even though uh, we've just had a rather dramatic reflection on time, um, I'd like to go back in time a little bit um, to essentially what we thought 20 years ago about what big data was going to mean, about what we were going to do with all of this data that we knew was coming. And it was an unbelievably exciting time. I don't know if you remember this, but fantastic books were written about it, and we were going to use all of this data to solve the great social challenges. We were going to cure cancer. Uh, we were going to make our cities much more livable, easier to go around. We were going to have definitive and affirmative action on climate change, all of them driven by what we were going to learn with the use of analytics. Now, fast forward to 2019. It's been very different. 
We've seen a lot of data out there created and in many ways weaponized, used against us, used to manipulate us, used to sell us things, used maybe in ways that we like and maybe in ways that we don't. Now, we have ways of dealing with that problem and in our own awkward way, we are dealing with it in our democracy right now. But what I was struck by today was the power and the relevance of the original vision for big data, that actually we can use data to solve the great social challenges of our time. But it's a matter of seeing it that way. It's a matter of going for them. It's a matter of reaching them. And by the way, that does involve some sharing too. We obviously need limits on it and we need controls. But at the end of the day, there's enormous value in coming together into society and building these fantastic pictures that we've, we've seen of who we are and where we're going and how our bodies work and how space works and how time works and how all of these things um, um, come together. Um, I think maybe the other thing I would want to say is that it's, when we talk about data and the data economy, it's not about sharing data, it's about sharing knowledge. And that was what I loved about the presentations today. It's because data is actually neutral. I, I think one of you just showed a picture of all of these uh, points, uh, computer uh, codes for how, where all this starts. You can't make anything out of that. It, it comes alive when we visualize it, when we present it in a way that our human minds can understand it. And what I'm trying to say is data visualization, it may sound to some people like a clever trick or a communication ploy, but there's actually much more at stake here. I mean, the work you do is fantastically valuable. Uh, what I put in my notes was essentially, I mean, there was a lot of talk going on today about machine readable formats for data, and that is very important to do the kind of work we do. But we also need human readable data. We need to be able to take these sets and translate them into knowledge. And once we've translated them into knowledge, we need to be able to share. We need to be able to share that knowledge with each other. Because frankly, no science doesn't take place in the background. I, I think you know, if, if Einstein had stayed in his room after hours at the patent office, it wouldn't have had much impact on the world. But in fact, he published a paper. And that paper changed the world. So, so don't think for a moment that what you do is about uh, only about communicating things. It's about something much bigger, much more profound. It, it, it sits right at the heart of the engine that drives our society forward. I'm, I'm struck in that context that so many of the projects we heard about today were based on sharing magazines, reports, books, uh, a best-selling film. Uh, this is what we need to be doing, is, is pooling our knowledge, because I'm sorry, the human race collectively is much smarter than any of us on our own. And the more we can do to share that knowledge, to stimulate each other, to gain stimulus from other people, the better we will be. And I guess that's maybe my third point. I promised I'd be short. Um, go forth and multiply. <laughs> You should leave here today knowing that what you do counts, knowing that what you do is matters, knowing that what you do is already affecting the shape of the world around you, just like these black holes bend light. Uh, you're doing that too. So have confidence, do more of it. And I, and I guess on that note, the only thing left for me to do is to thank our friends and our collaborators and our organizers from the EU Publication Office uh, and the whole team that brought us together here today, because this has been an absolutely fantastic uh, conference, um, and I can see no one's rushed out for a drink, so hopefully I said something uh, that, uh, that will help you understand where we've been today, too. So thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Paul. I, is my microphone on? I can't, I can't hear if I am or on or off anymore. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, I just have, I, I, I don't want to be a decrescendo to the day. I know that there's a feedback form which the organizers would be incredibly grateful if you could fill out. It has been a really, really great day. I can't improve on your words and I, I don't want to either. I just want to say a thank you to Isis Square, which were uh, a huge sponsor for this event. And if you don't know what they are, they are um, the program of the European Commission, which supports interoperability for supporting the conference. Also, the Luxembourg government for hosting us here in the convention center and and really it's just again to echo 
thank you to all of our amazing speakers for you for participating and hopefully you've gleaned a lot of information to go forth and multiply and collaborate globally uh, despite whatever is happening in the world. Um, so I, I really, from the bottom of my heart, I also, I know I shouldn't, but I really want to thank the people who organized today. It was an incredible undertaking, a huge number of speakers to organize and they did such a terrific job. So thank you to them also. Have a lovely evening. <laughs> <laughs> and the drinks await. <laughs>